And you guys are good to start whenever you'd like. Morning all, just testing my audio, is it working? Thanks. Test audio, Jerry Linder. Jerry, you are good. Uh, Madam Chair, we are just waiting for Commissioner Rogers and Commissioner Treese and committee member Molly Brown. Clerk Moss and Chuck, I'm checking in on you about when you are ready to start, and then we will be ready to roll as well. We're good on you, Mark. Well, it looks like we have Commissioner Willie. So we have three of the um, elected board of directors and it looks like we have a quorum of the community members. So why don't we get going and uh, we'll go from there. So the, I assume, does everyone have the agenda? Does anyone not have the agenda? Okay. <laughs> Last year, I realized we were together in the auditorium for the most part. Uh, this year, we're having this meeting entirely by Zoom. Uh, so as such, uh, as soon as we elect the presiding officer for the uh, uh, our board, our budget meeting today, uh, we'll need to help one another out uh, along the way to see if there are any questions or things of that nature. So the first item is introductions and then we'll have the election of our presiding officer. So uh, I'm Catherine Harrington, uh, one of the board of directors elected for Clean Water Services. So I'll turn it over to uh, Director Nafisa Fai. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair Harrington. Um, and, and should I pass it to somebody? Yes, please. I'll pass it to Commissioner Willie. Good morning, Jerry Willie, County Commissioner for uh, District 4 and also Director on Clean Water Services. And who are you passing it to, Director Willie? Um, I don't see anybody else on here, so I don't know who to pass it to. The only one I see is you. And director the slide Therese is here. Well, I'll pass it off to uh, Director Therese. Thank you, Director Willie. Uh, Pam Therese, uh, Commissioner for District 2 in Washington County and Board of Directors of Clean Water Services. And I'm going to pass it off to uh, Andy Dyke. Good morning. I'm Andy Dyke. I'm uh, representing CWAC District 4, and I will pass it off to Tony Weller. Oh, Tony's muted. Tony, you're muted still. I'm trying to unmute. It didn't. <laughs> we'll work there. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, Tony Weller. I'm a builder developer rep on CWAC, and it's good to see you all. I need to pass it off. Let me... Uh, how about Mike McKillop? I saw somewhere around there. There you are. Good morning, Mike McKillop, CWAC member representing Commissioner Rogers in District 3. And let's see if I can find somebody to pass it off to. Oh, we seem to have lost Lori Hennings. So it looks like we've gone through all of the committee members. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, 
member Hennings is rejoining here. So you have eight of your 10 members. Okay, so let's give Lori's audio a chance to connect. Hello there, Lori. Good morning, Good everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry, it took me three tries this morning. Um, are we doing introductions? Yes, we are. Uh, I'm Lori Hennings. I'm an environmental rep on CWEC. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll turn it over to our CEO for Clean Water Services, Diane Taniguchi Dennis. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. And um, I'm Diane Taniguchi Dennis, the Chief Executive Officer for Clean Water Services. And I'm going to pass it over to Nate Cullen. Good morning. This is Nate Cullen, Chief Operating Officer here at Clean Water Services. Happy to be here this morning. And I'm going to pass it off to Mark Jockers, our Chief of Staff. Thank you very much, Nate. Mark Jockers, Chief of Staff of Clean Water Services. I'm going to hand it on to our CFO, Kathy Leader. Thank you, Mark. Kathy Leader, Chief Financial Officer with Clean Water Services and also the Budget Officer for the Budget Committee. So welcome to the committee today. And finally, Jerry, can you introduce yourself as well? Thank you, Jerry Linder, General Counsel. Good morning. Good morning. So I think that's everyone who we have today. So the next item is to elect the presiding officer for our budget committee. And we've been really fortunate to have Tony Weller serve in this position previously. And uh, I'm hoping that we might be able to entertain a motion uh, to ensure that we have a community member serving as our board of directors. So what are the wishes of the full budget committee? I'd like to nominate Tony Weller, please. Is there a second? I'll second that. Second. <laughs> Thank you. We have a motion and a second to elect Tony Weller as the presiding officer. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 <laughs> yes, I'm willing to do it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously eight to zero. Thank you very much. So, Tony, and we turn it a, over to you. Well, well, thank you, Chair Harrington. It's great, it's great to see everybody. I love the color, the color in the backgrounds, and, and uh, it's a uh, it, it, it makes my computer monitor look much better. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you, everybody. And it's good to see um, virtually uh, most of you. And uh, I'm sure it, the attendees will pop in and out at the appropriate uh, time. So that'll be, uh, that'll be good to see each of the staff people that are uh, not on my main screen right now. Um, I think we uh, we start off. There's not much for me to do here other than we roll right into the program. So eventually we get done today. So Diane, I think that's you that lead off. Thank you, Tony. Um, this is our fiscal year 21-22 budget and the budget has been prepared in accordance with Oregon Budget Law ORS 294.305 through 294.565. And I wanted to see if um, Kathy Leader, our CFO, wanted to provide any additional um, background information on our budget. Thank you, Diane. The budget committee meeting is being held in compliance with Oregon local budget law. The purpose of this meeting is for the committee to receive the district's proposed budget and budget message, receive public comment, and finally deliberate and approve a budget for the district for the fiscal year 2022. The board will then preside over a public hearing in June where the public has another opportunity to comment. The board's final action will be the adoption of the district's fiscal year 2022 budget at the June board meeting. Now I'll return it back to you, Diane. Thank you. Thank you. And um, next slide, please. Good morning and uh, thank you, Tony and Kathy and a very warm welcome to our Clean Water Services Budget Committee, the public viewing our proceedings today and to our team at Clean Water Services. I especially want to acknowledge our Clean Water Services Board of Directors and the Clean Water Advisory Commission members on the Budget Committee, and to thank you for your review and your comments on our Clean Water Services proposed budget for fiscal year 2021 through 2022. I would first like to start us off with a reflection from this past year. 
our world has certainly changed in so many ways from the pandemic to the wildfires and the call for social change this past year. And sharing this experience together with our team has shown how resilient we are as people and has strengthened our commitment to serving this region 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Clean Water Services team even more deeply experienced its vital role as a regional utility, providing lifeline public services to our region so that we can meet its challenges and to continue to grow and to thrive even under adversity. We anticipate and solve the complex challenges of returning our used water and cycling our surface water back to our very slow and small and sensitive Tualatin River. In one of my meetings with Chair Harrington, I shared with her about our strategies and our challenges in meeting the needs of our growing region on such a small river. And she said something that really stuck with me that I'm hoping she's okay with me sharing with all of you today. She said that our clean water services team has to hit way high above our weight class to ensure we can do what the Tualatin River demands of us. And this has truly resonated um, throughout the teams here at Clean Water Services. Thank you, Chair, for that. And as you can see on this slide, we see ourselves as overachievers because our slow and sensitive river demands that of us. And it is with this forward thinking, with creativity and innovation that has made Clean Water Services earn the distinction of a recognized utility of the future and a leading water utility of the world with its practices in the water industry. We are very appreciative of the financial support that we received from the CARES Act to support our operations of 1.67 million under COVID and the $3.6 million of support our communities and ratepayers region-wide um, had for the economic hardships that they were experiencing with help and paying of their water bills. And the decision to forego our normal rate increase this past year is reflective of the commitment to this region in economic recovery. So thank you to our board of directors and also the, in their role as the Board of County Commissioners and the staff at Washington County. So next I would like to transition to looking forward. This budget represents the repositioning of clean water services to meet the demands in the future. We are realigning our people, our resources and our programs. So as a whole organization, we're poised to deliver on the vision, mission and strategic outcomes in an agile and nimble way through innovation and opportunities that transformative partnership springs. We are changing our structure to build a more resilient customer and partner responsive and nimble group. We've achieved a significant milestone with our 50 year golden anniversary of a utility. And that's also a reminder of our age of our infrastructure needing rehabilitation and replacement. We are focused on growing our up and coming leaders at Clean Water Services with the understanding and internal capacity to continue to integrate policy and strategy while executing with transformative partnerships and through effective and efficient implementation of our programs. This approach will continue to catalyze solutions with our regional partners that reach beyond what we could do alone as a utility. And it's going to enable us to continue to protect and restore our watershed and to support the economic health of our region. Next slide, please. This means a very deliberate business focus on defining our services that Clean Water Services provides across the region in water resource recovery, surface water management, river flow management, and watershed restoration, as well as a focus on evolving our relationships with our very largest cities that provide full services to their communities. Forest Grove, Cornelius, Hillsborough, Beaverton, Tiger, Tualatin, and Sherwood. Next slide, please. It also means a strategic business focus on differentiation of our local services that we provide for the unincorporated areas of Washington County and the cities of Gaston, North Plains, Banks, Durham, and King City. We must be nimble and we must be prepared as these areas annex and become part of our cities and as cities grow into becoming full service cities. Next slide, please. 
Our challenges ahead are mighty, and we are positioning ourselves to meet them. The increasingly complex environmental regulatory compliance requirements for the Tualatin River, we're anticipating the needs of our growing region by managing the capacity of our existing infrastructure, sequencing new expanded capacity, all while addressing our aging infrastructure that is of a, the age of replacement and renewal. All with an eye towards a more variable water future that climate change brings with the shifting of weather patterns of either too much or not enough rainfall, and even the dryness that creates these threats of wildfires. We must be good at managing our risks and our vulnerabilities while rising to the challenge. We are a region in economic recovery. And as well, we are experiencing the generational change of our workforce. Next slide, please. Our investment strategy through this next decade to meet the challenges ahead is focused on building resilience. Resilience in our workforce and our facilities, by aligning our programs and services to deliver on regional values and continuing to invest in very practical and pragmatic water solutions while optimizing our operations and maintenance with a very well sequenced and planned investment strategy in gray and green infrastructure as well as in the natural environment. Next slide, please. Our workforce is rapidly changing with the shift of the baby boomers into retirement. And this means a very intentional focus on investing time for knowledge transform, transfer in the form of our performance excellence roadmaps and documentation of practices to keep our programs grounded and oriented as we go through the generational change of losing our most long-term and valued senior leaders and staff. We are weathering each annual change as opportunities with the shift of generations with new eyes that bring new ideas and new energy to our organization. We are increasing our focus on learning, growing, and thriving so our team members can be developed and mentored to take on programs and leadership roles. In the next five to seven years, when likely all of us baby boomers are retired, Generation X and our millennials will be our new leaders with the Generation Z rapidly um, filling into our workforce as team members. Our exciting times are ahead. Next slide, please. We're continuing to build on our legacy of business process reengineering and the watershed-based approach with the Goal Share Program that began in 1997 through 2003 and continues today. We're continuing to grow our business improvements and resiliency while augmenting these with performance excellence to teach utility business principles and integrating programmatic performance auditing to focus on our continual improvement for efficiency and effectiveness. Because we know that we can have programs that are efficient and effective on the programmatic scale, but if we are not auditing the sum total of our strategic performance, we will miss opportunities for improvement. And that's our commitment to the region. Next slide, please. We are incubating our work together for the river as our strategic approach and getting it into the DNA of our organization through performance excellence. And this is transforming us. The team today will highlight their accomplishments and focus ahead in their budget presentations. And the team is truly aligning I to us to all synergizing what we accomplish as individuals to what we accomplish together in our programs as teams to the sum total of our accomplishments as a district to deliver on our vision, our mission, our values and strategies. It is an audacious but yet achievable journey for our performance excellence focus. And this is our legacy that we are building together for the future generation of leaders at Clean Water Services. Next slide, please. The team members will share with you on how they're delivering on the strategic outcomes to catalyze transformational partnerships, to integrated water resources management and resilience uh, watersheds, to organizational excellence, to contributing to the region's environmental and economic vitality, and also on research innovation and resource recovery. And they're doing this together. Next slide. We have realigned the portfolios of our district executive leadership to accomplish our outcomes. 
So these executive leadership roles include Chief Executive Officer, Chief Operating Officer, Nate Cullen, Chief of Staff, Mark Jockers, our Chief Regional Utility Relations Officer, Joe Gall, who will join us in June, and we're very excited about this, and our Chief Financial Officer, Kathy Leader, and our General Counsel, Jerry Linder. This is the team that works with me day in and day out on strategy, policy, and implementation alignment, as well as implementing the day-to-day -day business processes in their focus areas. Next slide. The portfolio of the Chief Executive Officer includes execution on the Clean Water Institute, the Clean Water Insurance Company, and incubating the clean water services areas of research and innovation, including our research, innovation, people, and labs. We call that our Ripple program, as well as our forward-thinking financial strategies and our human resources, risk, and safety. Next slide, please. The portfolio for the Chief Operating Officer is the integration of all of the operating business units for alignment and implementation. Our regulatory affairs, utility operations, water resource recovery, natural systems enhancement and stewardship, business opportunities and operations, and enterprise asset and technical services. Next slide. The portfolio for our Chief Utility Relations Officer includes integrated planning, which includes our response to climate adaptation, as well as development services, system delivery, and planning services. Next slide, please. The portfolio for the Chief of Staff includes our equity and culture work, our government and public affairs with community engagement and communication, and the board and CWAC administration. Next slide, please. And we have our CFO with our finance and accounting, as well as working with me directly on our financial strategy with the team, and our general legal counsel who has the legal programs. So it is, next slide, this sum total of our ecosystem. And beyond this ecosystem, there are all of the um, team members you're going to see today that execute in each of these areas. And in thinking and acting as a network of subject matter experts in an integrated fashion, it is a very intentional culture and mindset shift from departments to service providers as business units. It is through this ecosystem mindset and culture development that our executive leaders, our business unit directors, and our division managers will transfer knowledge while creating development opportunities for our team members to continue to learn, grow, and thrive to become the new leaders of our future. It is this intentional culture and mindset shift, mindset shift that is key for clean water services to deliver its unparalleled value for our customers and to the region by being practical and pragmatic that is solutions oriented, that is data driven on a strong foundation of science, that is forward thinking and innovative to manage our risks in the future, while honoring and respecting each other and the customers that we serve. Next slide, please. And our team would say, it is with compassion and kindness that is forthright. And this is how we work for the river together. And this is the clean water services way to meet the challenges of today and our future together. And it's here that I'd like to pause a bit to see if we have any questions. And thank you for letting me share and give you a little bit of um, a preview of what's going to um, be discussed today with our teams. Thank you, Diane. I don't see any hands up yet, and I don't know if anybody else does at this point. Any... Right. <laughs> yeah, well done. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Kathy Leader, our Chief Financial Officer, and she will present the financial summary of our proposed budget. So with that, Kathy. Thank you, Diane. First, I'm going to talk about current year revenues. This slide shows current revenues by type for the revised fiscal year 21 budget and the proposed fiscal year 22 budget. The proposed budget for fiscal year 22 includes current year revenues of $189 million. Service charges make up 84% of the total revenues, and when combined with the second largest revenue source of system development charges, totals 175 million, or 92% of the total current revenues. 
The remaining 14 million or 8% of the current revenues includes miscellaneous fees, contributions from developers for construction projects, grants, Build America bond subsidies, and interest earning on our cash investments. Proposed current year revenues increased by 5.7 million as compared to the prior year. This increase reflects a $9.1 million increase in service charges with the proposed center of sewer and stormwater management rate increases and a $2.4 million reduction in system development charges with the potential continued slowdown of development activity within the system service area and until economic recovery occurs and typical development occurs again. Next slide, please. The 188.9 million in um, current revenues proposed are used to cover 95.9 million in operating costs, 93.6 million for capital investments, and 21.7 million for debt service on principal and interest payments. Next slide, please. The proposed budget includes a 4.5% increase to the regional and local sanitary sewer rate and a 5.4% increase to the regional and local storm water management rate. This increase will add an estimated $2.75 per month to the typical residential customers combined bill. The proposed budget also includes an increase in the sanitary sewer and stormwater management system development charges of approximately 4.5% based on the inflationary cost of construction. The sanitary sewer SDC will increase by $285 to $6,085 per equivalent dwelling unit, and the stormwater management SDC will increase by $25 to $585 per equivalent service unit. The district will continue to assist customers facing financial hardships as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Low income water and wastewater ratepayer assistance funding was included in the December 2020 pandemic relief package and the March 2021 American Relief Rep Plan Act or ARPA. The district is working with federal and state authorities to monitor and support distribution of this ratepayer assistance funding to qualified ratepayers. Next slide, please. Uh, Kathy Laurie has her hand up. I wasn't sure she had a question on the slide. Okay. Thank you, I do. Um, just my own point of confusion. I, I'm a little confused between what Diane said about no rate increases in this slide. Thank you. Uh, so that was during fiscal year 21. We did not implement our plan rate increases in that year. Um, next slide, please. This slide shows the trajectory of sanitary sewer revenue growth pre-pandemic, the, the blue line, versus post-pandemic, the orange line. The deferral of planned rate increases in fiscal year 21 results in a loss of approximately 62 million in revenues collected over the next 10 year period. This reduction in revenue will require resequencing and deferral of capital projects. The result will be less pay as you go spending on capital projects and may require the district to issue additional debt to meet capital needs sooner than planned. The district may also need to access reserves to meet critical operational needs. Next slide. Similarly, this slide shows the trajectory of stormwater management revenue growth pre-pandemic, the blue line, versus post-pandemic, the orange line. The deferral of planned rate increases in fiscal year 21 results in a loss of approximately 3 million in revenue collections over the next 10 year period. This transition, transitioning from a 50 cent to a 5% rate increase each year has reduced the forecasted loss in revenue over the 10 year period from just over 9 million to 3 million. It should also be noted that the post pandemic rate and the annual revenue is predicted to surpass the pre pandemic forecast amounts starting in fiscal year 2029 with the transition from a fixed 50 cent increase per year to a 5% rate increase per year. Next slide, please. The district's average combined sanitary sewer and stormwater management rate charged to small cities and urban unincorporated customers is proposed at $57.77 per month. This combined rate is lower than our comparable cities, including Vancouver, Salem, McMinnville, Lake Oswego, and Portland, even though the district provides a substantially higher level of wastewater treatment than nearly all local, regional, and national providers of comparable services. Next slide, please. The 10 year annual average increase in combined sanitary sewer and stormwater management rates is 3.43%. 
This trending reflects the district's adopted policy of reasonable rate increases on a regular or annual basis to promote predictability for the customer and revenue stability for the district. The proposed 4.66% increase in the combined rate in fiscal year 2022 reflects the impact of deferring rate increases in fiscal year 21 due to the pandemic. Rate growth is vital to the long-term financial health of the district and its ability to invest in infrastructure, ensure long-term water supply security, and meet increasingly stringent federal and state water pollution control needs. Next slide, please. This slide shows the combined sanitary sewer and stormwater management rate charged by jurisdiction in our service area in fiscal year, fiscal year 21, so the current year. Beginning in fiscal year 2009, Clean Water Services established a regional rate for services benefiting the entire region and a separate local rate for unincorporated Washington County and the small city customers, which the district bills directly. The seven large cities charge and remit the regional rate to clean water services, and it can establish their own local rate to meet local operating needs. The blue area of the bars represents the regional combined monthly rate of $40.70 charged by clean water services to all customers to support services that benefit the entire service area. The green area of the bars represents the local portion charged by each jurisdiction to maintain local systems. For clean water services, this combined local rate of $14.50 is charged to small city and urban un unincorporated customers. In most cases, the local rate charged by clean water services has been consistently higher than the local rates charged by clean water services and the variance has grown um, higher in recent years. The yellow solid line represents volume of customer counts by jurisdiction. Clean water services has been able to maintain lower rates for local services due to the size of our service area and customer base. Next slide, please. Laurie, did you have a question on that previous slide? Thank you. I'm just curious as to why Cornelius is, is higher. Is it because it's such a small city? Yes, that's correct. The, um, some of the, as you see the line of customer billings going down, you see the local rate going up because they just need that additional money to spread over their service base. Yes. As shown here, Clean Water Services bills for just under 65,000 customers in the small cities and urban unincorporated areas. This is approximately 42% of customers in Washington County. This is true for population also. The urban unincorporated and small cities account for almost 45% of the population. The seven large incorporated cities have a smaller customer base to spread costs of operation over, have increased their local rates to meet their individual local operating needs. Next slide. Next, I'm gonna talk about current year expenditures. This slide shows current expenditures by type for the revised fiscal 21 budget and the proposed fiscal year 22 budget. The proposed fiscal year 22 budget includes current year expenditures of 211 million. Operating costs, including personal services and material services, total just under 89 million or 43% of the fiscal year 22 expenditures. Capital investment costs total 93.6 million or 44% of the budget Debt principal and interest payments account for 21.7 million or 10% of budgeted expenditures. Other fund outlays of 7 million or 3% of the budgeted expenditures include utility bad debt expense, franchise fees paid to the small cities and pass through of right away and local rates to large incorporated cities with industrial customers within our city limits. Other outlays once again includes 450,000 to fund a future utility assistance program. Proposed current expenditures increased by 10 million as compared to the prior. This increase reflects just uh, under, uh, just over $2 million increase in labor costs, just under a $2 million increase in internal services and a $6 million increase in capital investments in the year. Next slide. As just noted, proposed operating costs for fiscal year 22 are just under 89 million, which is a 4.8% increase over the prior year. Staff from the individual service groups will be presenting details regarding planned operating costs and capital investments in fiscal year 22. In general, labor costs increased by 2.3 million or 4.3%. This is mainly due to the addition of five FT new FTE and the conversion of 12 long-term temporary staff to regular full-time. 
material and services increased by 1.7 million or 5.7%. The main drivers for this cost increase relate to an increase in property and new cyber insurance of a million dollars and an increase in software licensing of 365,000. Next slide. The district was aware of the fiscal impact this pandemic could have on revenue collections, including customer delinquencies, re reduced customer demand, and the deferral of planned rate increases in fiscal year 2021. The district expects that impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic will continue during fiscal year 2022. However, we anticipate economic improvement and growth as the percentage of population vaccinated increases and the local economy opens. As financial stewards of ratepayer funds, the district has proactively reduced travel and training and will continue to prioritize and sequence capital investments and hiring for current vacancies and new positions in fiscal year 22. Next slide. This slide shows five years of the district's current financial forecast, including estimated ending for fiscal year 21, the proposed budget for fiscal year 22, and projections for fiscal years 2023 through 2025. The layered bars represent expenditures by fiscal year. Projected operating expenditures for outer years include a 7% increase annually for labor ads and increases in wages and benefits. Materials and service costs include an increase of 3% per year. And capital costs are based on the district's district's current five-year improvement plan. The orange solid line represents current revenue by year. Projected revenues include an annual five to five and a half percent increase in sanitary sewer rates and a five percent increase in stormwater management rates. The dotted blue line represents the district's forecasted cash reserves at year end based on results of operations and shows a planned use of reserves to fund capital projects. The current financial forecast includes a $100 million bond issuance in fiscal year 2028 to help fund sanitary sewer capital projects. However, forecast's capital requirements could be impacted by increased development that will require the district to accelerate construction of infrastructure to meet system demands and will be adjusted accordingly. The numbers at the top of each bar are the forecasted debt coverage ratios by year based on annual results of operations and range from 4.44 to 6.54 times debt service compared to the minimum required under current bond covenants of 1.2 times debt service. This forecast reflects the district's policy to main debt, maintain debt coverage ratios above the minimum required by the existing bond covenants to maintain a high bond rating and lower costs to issue debt. The proposed budget and current financial forecast maintain strong financial metrics to fund future capital projects at the lowest cost and maintain adequate cash reserves to provide operating contingencies to navigate the next pandemic or crisis, provide rate stability, fund workforce investments for resilience, fund the investment in capital infrastructure replacement, renewal and expansion, and fund risk losses, including planning for subduction zone earthquake recovery. A comprehensive review of the district's rates and charges has not occurred since 2008. Later in this presentation, we will introduce the district's new financial strategy and performance management program. Kim Baylor, our util utility financial strategist, will discuss our next steps to secure the district's financial future, including the development of an updated long-term financial plan, cost of service study and cost allocation plan, and future rate development strategies for the district. Next slide, please. That concludes the financial overview. I'm available for any questions the committee might have. I keep thinking hitting my muted mic button will unmute me and it doesn't. So there we go. <laughs> I'll, I'll get the groove of this. Kathy, thank you. Um, before we get into the questions, I did want to acknowledge that Roy joined us earlier and didn't get a chance to introduce himself. And I see you, Roy, hello. Uh, if you want to just take a moment and say hi to everybody so that we, we know your mic is working. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Roy Rogers, and I represent District 3, which is the Southern, well, District, I don't know if you're still there, Tony. Are you still in District 3? Um, yes. <laughs> I know you moved out of Tualatin, so I didn't know exactly where are you. I, mean, I, I think Sherwood's sure still in your area, right? So there it we are. still is, yeah. Anyway, uh, hello to everyone. <laughs> Great, thank you, Roy. Um, Kathy, I had a question with with 
the lo looking forward, and maybe you're going to cover this later, but the idea that interest rates are likely to go up, is there any reason to accelerate the bond purchasing or, or is it just so far out there, it doesn't make any sense to do it too soon? You know, at this point, we're, we're holding with the forecast that we have and we, we see issuing debt as we need it for projects. And so as we look to sequence and roll out projects, um, we'll uh, assess debt up needs at that point. We are actually in the process of going into a refunding on our 2011 B bonds. So we will see some um, rate relief on those in the near future. Um, but yeah, we um, at this point, we have it in the forecast. And we're also coordinating this very closely with our update to the financial plan. Um, that's going to happen in this next year. So, you know, we might be bumped up sooner, but it, it might be pushed out later. We will see. And Diane, I don't, it looks like you want to add on to that. Yes. And also there's some um, great federal uh, programs that are being initiated potentially. Uh, the WIFIA program, um, there's work um, with the um, Bureau of Reclamation's um, Title um, 10 plans. So we're really monitoring what's going on out there prior to uh, going to the bond market. But you raise a really great question. And I know Commissioner Rogers also um, always raises that question to so really time these bond issuances to take advantage of low interest and um, the ability to um, build capital pro uh, projects in the region. So thank you, Tony. But we're, we're taking a look at all of that. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. Uh, Mike McKillop. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on the uh, reorganization of the uh, duties inside the, the district there, is that only going to be internal or is that going to affect all the external relationships that employees have with cities and customers and uh, industries? If I'm on the outside, am I going to see any difference as a result of this change? I think from the outside, what you're going to see is the loss of Nora, right? Nora was a really... <laughs> great uh, connector. And what you're going to see in, um, see is um, a team um, that has the same connections and the same relationships that are really going to be amplified under Joe Gall's program. Um, so you'll see that. You'll get more detail, Mike. And um, But I, I thank you for that question. It's an important one. Um, so you're going to hear from Damon and Andy Braun and Carol Murdoch um, to, to give more um, um, feelings of that we're going to continue with the excellent relationships we have. I did want to acknowledge Molly Brown. Um, she joined us also. Um, uh, Chair Weller, I didn't know if you wanted to, to let Molly also introduce herself to everybody. Please. Hi, Molly. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, I'm District 2 representative from the Advisory Commission. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, I was late. <laughs> well, you're here now. That's what matters, right? So um, do we have any public that have, I don't see any hands raised on the attendee list. So, I don't, so this is our public comment period. So I'm just trying to um, see if we have. So Chair Weller, uh, Mark Jockers here. We had asked the public to um, sign up in advance to, if they wanted to join us here today, but also provided a call-in number. We did not have anybody sign up. I'm looking to Clerk Moss to see whether or not we've had anybody call in or. We have not had anyone contact us to speak. Thank you very much. All right, well, that would set us up for the break but that's a little early unless people are dying to get away since we just got everybody here <laughs> uh, would we be better off to at least start the next group and we may insert the break between those chair i think that would be a, a good idea if that's if that's the committee's uh, preference i think that would work well does that work for everybody you can nod i can see most of your videos on <laughs> All right, let's 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 move on to the next group, and uh, and we'll insert the break at the appropriate time there. 
Great. Uh, this is Diane Taniguchi Dennis again. I'm going to do the lead into um, our program budget presentation. So the team at Clean Water Services has this very deep passion for public service, for One Water, and for the environment. And our business unit directors and their programmatic leaders would like to share with you um, their programs and their services and both a reflection of what's been accomplished as well as what they would like to do this next year. So next slide, please. The investments in our programs, we had our um, existing uh, five business units, which are business services, regulatory affairs, utility operations and services, our water resource recovery and services, and our natural systems enhancement and stewardship services. You're also going to hear about our two newest business units, which is enterprise asset and technical services and our regional utility services business units. Next slide, please. And each business unit will also share with you their drivers and trends that they see as it relates to growth, our regulations and asset management. Next slide, please. The teams will also share with you how they're leveraging their investments in gray and green infrastructure along with natural systems when they consider infrastructure repair and replacement to protect the watershed and to restore the watershed in their service optimization and system um, expansion choices as well as their eye towards resource recovery. Next slide, please. This dollar bill is a great representation and a visualization of how our programmatic investments are across all of our business units. So we have water resources recovery at uh, 31 cents. We have our utility operations and services at 15 cents on the dollar. Our business services is at 26 cents. Regulatory affairs is at eight cents. Natural systems is at eight cents and our regional utilities business unit is at six cents and our enterprise asset management um, business unit is at six cents. So it's a good sense of how we are um, investing our money. Next slide. At Clean Water Services, it's not just about programs and services, but it's also about the people and how we inspire um, our teams. So the journey we are on at Clean Water Services is really this deep commitment to people and public service. We're very intentional in our creation of a culture and mindset based on dignity, respect, acknowledgement of each person's value and inclusion so that we can truly learn, grow and thrive together as one Clean Water Services. And I'm very proud of this team and what they have accomplished over this past year. They were really truly the dream team to go through a pandemic, wildfires and social change with. And I do know from the team members that we are a better organization from this experience together because of their actions to be thoughtful and kind and compassionate with one another. They're creative and they're innovative, and I'm hoping that that will come through in their presentation with you. And they're intense problem solvers, and they love working together with the partners. And they've learned that we are definitely stronger together with this deep dedication for service and to public health and the environment. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to turn our conversation over to Nate Cullen, our Chief Operating Officer, so he can share with you on how our mission and vision is strategically being implemented and aligned by the business unit. So with that, Nate, I'm going to transfer this conversation over to you. Okay, thank you much, Diane. The district has always had a great long-term vision and we've been really great at executing on it. And we pride ourselves on that. And we wanna continue that into the future. So our new structure that you've, you're talking about, Diane, earlier, will do this. Even as we grow, even as our world becomes more complex. And the reason is because it recognizes that to be successful, there are different levels of decision-making. We really are looking at policy decisions, the big picture, the strategies on how to, to put those into effect, and then the day-to-day the -day implementation of that. So all groups, 
every group that Diane mentioned does all three, um, but the, there's some that do more than others. There's some that really focus on policy and strategy, and those are the ones that are reporting to the CEO. The ones that are more focused on strategy and implementation, those are the groups that are reporting to the chief operating officer. So that's kind of how we've divided this up. The idea to be able to really divide up the focus because we need to be really looking forward and we need to be paying attention to day to day. And there's different groups that really focus on those two main areas. So what we're gonna do is the next portion of the presentation will have the operating groups present. And if we do have time, I'll do a time check. If we do, I'd like to introduce uh, Bob Baumgartner, who's the Director of Regulatory Affairs, and he is up first, if there is time. Thank you, Nate. Let's go ahead with Bob's. Thank you. There we go. Thank you for the introduction, Nate. Uh, I am Bob Baumgartner with Regulatory Affairs. Would like you to notice that uh, everybody in the Regulatory Affairs Department is smiling as we go through this presentation. Uh, we are largely a service uh, group and we provide services to uh, pretty much everybody within the district or all the other direct implementation programs. Uh, through our environmental services. We also have a direct implementation program. Uh, and I will touch on some of the key aspects of how we are providing that support and how we are really looking towards the future in our programs. With that, can we go to the next slide, please? First, to touch a little bit on the budget, personal services have increased this year as we have uh, added uh, resources, added people into the regulatory affairs budget. You will notice though that we are seeing a slight decrease in the material and services component of our budget, which I find is uh, really remarkable. Uh, I did want to point out that this uh, component of our budget includes our laboratory and I brought a prop with me today, there we go. Little things like this have increased greatly in price. Our services or our supplies for the laboratory have increased by about 25%, 26% over the last year, simply due to COVID. This little filter I saw is used in the uh, hospital industry to filter water, blood, and other equipment, and we're competing with them, and that's gone up to $50 a filter. So although we have seen a significant increase in our uh, costs and services, we have also seen a decrease. That decrease has come about because we over the last several years have internalized much of what we used to hire out for professional services contracts. An example of that would be the work we do with the United States Geological Survey, uh, where they had a number of continuous monitors that they maintained. For us, we have now internalized much of that work and control that ourselves. Uh, at a much more cost-effective strategy. The other thing I'll note is our program is somewhat cyclical and every five years or so, we have to go through a new permitting exercise. In the past, that cost us several hundreds of thousands of dollars in consulting fees. Because we have such a strong program and people with so much experience uh, from the regulatory agencies working with us, we have been able to internalize that and get a better product uh, without having to look for consultants. With that, the next slide, please. We have really three sub-programs in our services, the compliance services, which really focuses on the increasing regulations that Diane has talked about uh, and how we convert those increasing regulations, more strict requirements into our permit conditions. Uh, we have two components of that. We focus on making sure that we can continue to comply with those regulations. I'm going to take a quick break here because I forgot to note, if you wanted to follow along, please turn to page 197 of your budget book. And 
Sorry about that. I didn't see my note early enough. Um, but with that, this is an example. We provide over 24,000 analytical samples to demonstrate compliance with about 36,000 actual results that uh, we conduct out of a, uh, to demonstrate compliance with our permit. But more importantly, what we are doing is looking to the future, trying to understand what the district's needs are from the various direct implementation groups. And then we work with the regulating agencies to try to craft a path forward for that so that we are getting ahead of it, guiding that regulation, having influence before it comes to bear so that we can control our fate in our future. The environmental services program over the last year has put a lot of effort into uh, updating our program. For the members of the board, I want to thank you for approving our new ordinance, which really sets the basis for us going into the future uh, with an environmental regulation program to work with our industries and ensure that we can continue to protect our plants, continue to achieve and protect the infrastructure associated with our collection system, as well as prepare ourselves for some of the changes we see, especially related to beneficially reusing water and beneficially reusing some of the biosolids or other products out of our plants. And as I noted earlier, our laboratory services uh, provides a wide range of analytical support, both for compliance, uh, but as our plants become much more complex, uh, we are finding the need to provide almost direct services to our uh, treatment systems, our water reclamation systems, so that they can get almost instantaneous results back uh, and be able to operate those plants very effectively and efficiently. And as I noted, we have taken over uh, lots of the continuous monitoring, both at the plants and in the ambient stream and river environment to be able to be very responsive. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so our drivers, as Diane noted, we are very heavily regulated. Uh, the, I'll touch on a couple of the criteria in the next slides, but a lot of regulations getting much more strict over time. Uh, and we work to influence those. Joy and her program work a lot to make sure that we have the capacity to grow, uh, especially as it relates to the wide range of industrial facilities we have discharging to us. I wanted to talk just real quickly in this uh, instance on the reuse plans. We have submitted reuse plans to DEQ. They form the basis of what we see in the future will be working with the DEQ and EPA to change the administrative process, the regulatory strategy to increase opportunities for reuse, not only at our facilities, but across the state and even across the West. And with that, can we move to the next slide, please? So I wanted to touch just a little bit on the laboratory services. Uh, and I wanted to touch a little bit as an example on the bioavailable aluminum. <clears throat> One of the aspects that you will hear about uh, from a couple of people is our efforts to change the regulations that drive our nutrient control at the plants. We spend a lot of uh, money controlling uh, phosphorus discharges and we want to move that to a biological process. Uh, one of the constraints we have is when we treat for the nutrients, we use alum. Uh, alum is basically aluminum that we use to precipitate the nutrients. Uh, what EPA has found is that the aluminum uh, can be very toxic to fish and aquatic life. Uh, the aluminum goes through the gills of the fish. It also causes precipitates on the gills of the fish, which can cause them to suffer anoxia and then die. The Oregon State University has developed methods to test that toxicity we have taken what they have done through those bioassays and developed their method or expanded their method and developed and proved their method can work in ambient rivers, uh, in the plants, in the streams, so that we can really separate out that aluminum which is toxic from that which is not. Uh, the big benefit for that is no matter what comes out of this regulation, 
we will be able to demonstrate compliance. Uh, the biological available aluminum that we developed, uh, method that we developed, we proposed to EPA. EPA did accept it in the criteria that they developed for Oregon. Uh, and the big advantage of that is that no matter what happens now in the future with that standard or with our efforts for biological phosphorus removal, we have a path forward through the regulations and we have lots of flexibility to develop uh, a cost-effective strategy that actually I think will uh, improve conditions in the river and be much more cost-effective for us. Similarly, the PHAs, the polyhydroxyl alkanates, uh, a byproduct of the type of bacteria we want to grow so that we can remove the phosphorus. We are developing methods so that we can measure that and then being able to measure it, the plants can actually uh, manage for it. And there are several others in here that I won't go into, but the big uh, point or the point I wanted to make about the laboratory services is not only are we providing a robust response, day-to-day -day operations to support the plants, we have really shifted a lot of our resources to thinking about the future and how is our lab and how are our systems prepared for those standards that are coming up to make sure that we can measure them, make sure we can provide valuable comments to the regulating agencies on how best to implement it. I will note that right now we are teaching the uh, Oregon DEQ laboratory, how to do the biological methods so they can apply that uh, statewide and EPA and others are looking to us to help uh, with a national effort to provide that information. So having national impact, which is kind of fun. <laughs> hey Bob, when yeah. you get a chance, I think Lori's got a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Lori. Hi, Lori. Hi. Hey Bob, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, thanks. Great to see your face. Um, my question is about natural systems. I love what Clean Water Services has done with Fernhill Wetlands. It benefits, you know, water quality, wildlife tremendously, and people. And um, because folks love to go there and look at the wildlife, which I do too. Um, I'm wondering, I saw, I saw that you're thinking about uh, expanding natural treatment systems. Can you expand on that a little bit for us, please? Oh, certainly. Uh, there is a lot that we have learned from the uh, natural treatment system up at Fern Hill, up at Forest Grove. And what we really would like to be able to do is take much of what we have learned there and apply it to, uh, or at least I should say, one of the options that we want to explore is to apply that same learning at the uh, Hillsborough Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to build a very similar natural treatment system. The other thing that we have just aspect of that that we have just started to work with DEQ on is how we can take our reuse water, the water that we can generate for irrigation, and use that to reclaim wetlands that are waters of the nation. That sounds like one of those things that is just so intuitive and obvious. You should just go ahead and do it but there are a huge number of arcane regulatory hurdles that we need to go through. So we've started partnering with DEQ and the Oregon Association of Clean Water Agencies uh, for a two-step process. One of them is to see how far we can advance that through a modification of the current uh, system and then what rules and regulations we will be needing to update to uh, be able to make that happen. And I expect that will be a couple year exercise. Thank you, Bob. I'm really glad to see Clean Water Services moving more in that direction. Yeah, if, if you haven't been out to Fern Hill, as Lori said, I would, I would greatly uh, encourage people to go out to that. It's a much different perspective of what a wastewater treatment plant is than uh, when I was a young person and we used to just think of uh, steel and concrete. Are there any other questions then? I don't see any hands raised, Bob. I think you can keep going. Okay, and with that, I would uh, like to turn it over to Joy Ramirez from our uh, Environmental Services Program, please. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Bob. Um, as Bob mentioned in one of his earlier slides, Environmental Services uh, worked with CWAC and internal and external stakeholders this past year 
for the successful adoption of the non-domestic waste ordinance. And I can't get the smile off my face because that is a huge thing. And it is, it is, I'm going to have to say it's awesome. And so with that non-domestic waste ordinance, you know, that really improves the foundational um, abilities that we have to go forward, to continue to provide that protection for the water resource recovery facilities and for not only current, where we're currently at, but for the future, you know, pollutants concerns that Bob had mentioned. You know, also it, it kind of triggered all these other wonderful things, you know, how we can automate our business process, how we can get through that, how we can streamline that to ensure that we're following our regulatory requirements in our federal industrial pretreatment program. And this is all in line with our roadmap of the future. And, you know, it's really neat to see this play out. And as we're looking at and moving through the steps that we need to take to get to the roadmap of the future, we are looking at working, we're working with our digital solutions to provide those automated business processes. We're working with the uh, recovery, resource recovery to find out what is, what the plants are sensitive to, what are they looking at next? How can we engage that and reach out to the, uh, the dischargers of this non-domestic waste to find out if it needs to be treated or what we need to do and understand and learn more about that. Um, local program, you know, how are we going to support that? What cost recovery options are there? And just understanding a lot of this, this is a great time in environmental services as we're expanding and learning more about the discharges that are coming to us and how we can work with the industries and the stakeholders to regulate and to ensure that we have that future protection going forward. Source tracking, you know, chasing water up a pipe is it gets to be pretty tough sometimes. And so, you know, understanding that, working with our conveyance folks on how those sewer sheds are interconnected so we can hopefully expand the inline monitoring of those systems. So again, we have that bigger picture of what's coming to us and how we can protect our plant, plants currently and in the future. You know, and it, expanded gas monitoring. You know, as all these waste streams come to us, they, they intermingle with each other. And so sometimes that can cause issues. And the district has been successful in identifying a couple of uh, those situations where that has happened and they cause odor nuisances. And you know we need to be able to be on top of that and understand that chemistry that's going into the pipes and that's coming because it's environmental services. It's not just from the start of the pipe to the end of the pipe. It's also understanding how that waste interacts with each other and being able to um, ensure that we can protect the public and the workers in those lines also. Any questions? I again don't see any hands raised. Thank you very much, Joy. Yeah, Tony, I have one. Oh, uh, there, there's Roy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I always question when you see something called automated business processes. I, I don't think I understand what you mean by that. I, I have my own own connotations, but specifically, what are you saying? So what I am saying is we have we have a lot of permits that we have to regulate in our industrial pretreatment program. And so that's a lot of tracking. With the non-domestic waste ordinance, we do have um, timelines that we need to make sure that we're following to one, make sure um, the permittees that we're following through with what we've said in our implementation manual, which is our federal pretreatment program, and to be able to track that ship so we're in compliance. Um, to be able to show that to DEQ and EPA if we were to get audit, audited. So improving that instead of just having the um, kind of the archaic paper system, which we still have, but being able to streamline that so we can communicate where we're at and what issues we're having in our internal process. That worked for you, Roy. Do you have any follow-up? Uh, no, I, I probably would title it differently because I, okay. I have a completely different concept of what a business process is you you have uh, uh, you coined that term to apply to certain uh, internal processes in which you're tracking things but that's okay I mean we all use different uh, vocabulary and so I I was thinking you were telling me you were doing something in a business fashion that was uh, uh, doing something differently but uh, I get it they I'm sure that was Bob's idea, not yours. He was well, a and I was going to say, I will gladly throw that one back to Bob and say, <laughs> Bob, if I miss that one, then I have at it and answer Roy. <laughs> no, you did. You did wonderful, Joy. <laughs> well, with that um, next slide, and I'll hand it back over to Bob. And then with compliance services, uh, 
I do hope you note, uh, I always think of this after Joy speaks, that if I see far, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And I just want to note how much uh, Joy has really made a big difference in our environmental services program and lifted it over the last couple of years. We're fortunate to have her around. With the compliance services program, we deal a lot with the EPA and DEQ, and much of what we are gonna be focused on over the next couple of years is the permit integrated planning. And I wanted to explain that a little bit. You will hear throughout the day, and I've heard already from Diane, some of the visioning for the future and where our programs want to go. As noted, we're in a heavily regulated program. We are really fortunate to have people like Raj Kapur on our program who have extensive knowledge of the regulations and the permitting program uh, who can help lead us through a process by which we are trying to really fundamentally change how we interact on those regulatory procedures. Right now, our permit gets issued uh, ostensibly once every five years. That means we have to change and redo everything every five years. We want to set ourselves on a much longer term strategy for how we develop uh, and then implement those permit conditions and how we create those regulatory pathways, such as the uh, uh, wetland restoration that Lori and I talked about just a minute ago and be able to do that in a comprehensive fashion moving forward. So what we've done is really tried to outline for DEQ what our long-term vision is, how that works in increments of steps and work with them to get some acknowledgement of that in our permit conditions so that we can move forward in a much more structured process as we deal with what are gonna be very complex issues in the future. An example of that is the phosphorus that I've touched on right now. We have developed an order that allows us to have some criteria that are gonna be easier to achieve from our discharges so that we can really see if we can make the biological processes work. What I am anticipating is through a combination of treatment, how we manage flow in the river uh, and how we manage the aluminum that I talked about earlier, that we can develop a process that allows us to not only achieve those limits, uh, but to achieve a better outcome for the river at a much less uh, environmental cost and much less of an overall ecological footprint. Similar with thermal management and developing of the uh, newer copper, mercury, and other criteria. Our goal is really to get ahead of the development of these criteria and create the pathways uh, so that we are prepared when the rules come into effect and we are not being responsive or not being reactive, uh, we are being proactive. The big issue with us with stormwater compliance strategies is that the methods we have used in the past are not gonna be the methods that really solve our problems going forward especially if we think about the potential changes of uh, rainfall patterns that are going to be that are predicted to be associated with climate change. So what we are doing is trying to create the regulatory pathway that provides the linkage between the uh, stream restoration that you'll hear from Bruce and his team with the stormwater controls that we will be working on with what used to be Nora's team. Uh, and integrate those so that we have a long-term process for creating and enhancing and maintaining the resiliency of the urban streams uh, from now into the future, even uh, anticipating those climate change impacts. And with that, uh, next slide, please. And are there any further questions? I do have one. Oh, I'm sorry. I see Catherine had her hand up. Are you saying go ahead? Okay. Bob, I, you know, I've, I've been around you for a number of years and I understand the great work that you and your, your group does. Uh, and so I, I commend you for that, but I, you're an overhead item, uh, frankly. I mean, we all in every business, we have overhead items and yours is due to regulatory requirements, but I think you have a lot of talent that can be utilized 
by other organizations and uh, other facilities. So how, how do we recapture a little bit of your costs? Because we built up this wonderful pool of talent that we're kind of hoarding internally. And I know we've got to do that for our own needs, but it seems like there's some transference of knowledge that we could capture some dollars on it. So I, that's a pretty heady question, I understand, but I, I, I like to turn uh, overhead costs into uh, bill, billing centers if possible. Is, is that possible? Um, thank you, Roy, and thanks for the compliment as well. And I do think there are some opportunities for us as we go forward. I did not talk about the work that we are doing with the perfluorinated compounds, the PFOS, as we've talked about that later uh, previously and talked about that at the board. Uh, what is clear is EPA is going to be putting a lot more emphasis on these perfluorinated compounds in the future. Uh, one option that we have thought about uh, is to expand our ability to actually do that analysis at our lab. Uh, and with Joy and her team's uh, expertise and understanding of how we can track those down, what kind of businesses uh, and industrial discharges may be associated with it, uh, we could certainly provide services in either analyzing that or helping people track down the perfluorinated compounds uh, that would come to their wastewater treatment plant or in their stormwater systems as EPA pushes that as a uh, parameter of concern. Uh, we do already do a lot of support through the Oregon Association of Clean Water Agencies for reviewing permits and helping other municipalities figure out how to uh, comply with the permit conditions they have. And that would be something that we could certainly uh, consult out if we wanted to do that. So I think there would be a number of options, Roy. Well, if I could also add something, this is Nate. Uh, it's true that in a lot of organizations, the a regulatory affairs group would be pretty much pure overhead. But I really want to compliment Bob and his group of being partners with the planning for what we're doing with our treatment facilities. They're up front negotiating with DEQ, preventing permit limits that would cause incredibly expensive uh, capital investments. And you're going to hear a project that the, the team worked on, a partnership between regulatory affairs and water resource recovery, this idea of trying to reduce the aluminum discharge to the river. A benefit of that is it also helps us not have to treat at such a high level for phosphorus removal, which has a huge operating cost savings and chemicals that we'll be presenting in the water resource recovery group. So the they have an overhead function, but we've actually integrated them into the planning and of our projects and in how we operate our facilities. And I, I just can't uh, commend them enough for how much um, the day-to-day -day benefit they provide for us. So thank you, Bob, and all your team. Thank you, Nate. That's Glad great. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't cut you off there. No, I just was thanking Nate for his compliment, and we're glad to be of service. Great. Uh, Catherine, you've been patiently waiting there. <laughs> no worries at all. And the trick will be, do I remember how to lower my hand? <laughs> so um, I, I just wanted to, um, to compliment you, Bob and Joy, in bringing this work to life for us. I'm very much a see it and hear it person. Uh, in terms of internalizing the work that you do, why what you do is important and how it provides value to our customers. There are our direct customers, but I have fully internalized how, as Mark Jockers likes to say or said when uh, I had the opportunity to listen to him speak at a WebTech conference, that all water is recycled water. Um, so I pay particular attention when I hear Bob presenting uh, and others, but especially Bob, because he introduces me to chemicals and the relationship of different chemicals and the positive aspects of certain chemicals and the 
I'll say the negative aspects of certain chemicals in a way that I haven't thought about uh, since I was in high school and college with chemistry. Uh, so, and, you know, some of the sounds of these chemicals are, is a bit intimidating. So I appreciate Bob and Joy, how you help explain what the relationship is between our use of chemicals to ensure that we're achieving our direct, um, our direct service of restoring clean and as pure as we can water to the Tualatin River because the water that flows through our plants and it back into the Tualatin River gets used by someone else. So for example, uh, to Commissioner Rogers' point, uh, I see things a little differently because of that principle of all water is recycled water. I know that exporting skills and intellectual property has a cost. We are a public service agency as a utility, and we're not just a straight line utility. We are Clean Water Services is a utility of the world and of the future. So we really need you to think about and every employee to ensure that as all water is recycled water, that we're working with those um, partner agencies here in Oregon, but also across the planet. For example, the um, the Gore-Tex coats that I wear when I'm out hiking, cross-country skiing, the water-resistant jackets that I wear bicycling or just to and from my every day-to-day -day activity, that fabric has been treated with chemicals that maybe aren't great chemicals. Um, you know, I'm still a little leery of PFOA and PFAS and all that stuff that I still don't 100% understand. Um, but that clothing may be manufactured in different countries that don't have the same level of processing that we have. So it's incumbent upon us being a utility of the future to export that knowledge and to do so uh, because if we don't, we're going to pay for it downstream. Uh, so I commend you for your work, your day-to-day -day work, but also as you engage with us as the board of directors and the budget committee, that you really help me understand the relationship of the, the chemicals, the uh, regulations and so forth. And once you put up the compliance services slide, I had to go back and do some quick searching in the budget PDF document to see, oh my goodness, was there a section I missed? And I was really pleased to see that compliance shows up in just about every business group in clean water services, because we are not successful if we don't comply uh, to all the regulations. So thank you very much. Sorry to be so long-winded, but I, I learn a lot. I value what you do. I'm very proud of all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Harrington. Are there any other questions then? I okay, think Diane's got her hand up. Diane, you're muted. I really um, appreciate the perspectives of Chair Harrington and uh, Board of Directors, um, Roy Rogers and I can share a little bit of how we're integrating um, the work that we do here at Clean Water Services as we have to, you know, hit above our, our weight class by innovating for here. And you're hearing um, the team members talk about what they're doing for uh, Clean Water Services. And clearly they articulate and they share this knowledge with our peer utilities here in Oregon, because much of what we're doing also benefits our peer utilities from a regulatory standpoint that Bob talked about for water reuse, but also the new types of um, laboratory techniques that they're creating. So we do benefit um, the, um, the state of Oregon. We also benefit um, utilities across 
across the U.S. through our sharing with the associations that the board heard about with um, National Association of Clean Water Agencies and WEF and all of the groups that we participate with. But this also translates to what um, uh, Roy has always challenged this team with is how do you turn your business model upside down so that it isn't just the services that you create for the region, but how do you create these into entrepreneurial activities? And certainly Clean Water Grow is an example, but as it relates to the laboratory, um, if we are able to do, develop unique testing um, just for clean water services, certainly we could offer testing more broadly that others could um, bring to clean water services their samples and we can charge a fee for that. And one of the initiatives for the laboratory is to be able to offer things like that. We're also being asked by the State Department because of our um, unique capabilities to partner with um, different um, cities across the world. And in this case, they're asking us to partner um, under their uh, program with um, a city, the capital city, city in Laos, Vietnam, because they have some pretty significant water um, and wastewater issues that um, the State Department is looking to um, really provide. Our support. through the Clean Water Institute, we are looking for those products and services that could translate to adding a, a broader value proposition that we can bring back um, to our ratepayers so we can turn our business model upside down. And certainly Bob's team through our um, educational portals um, will be able to, to um, capitalize on that. So um, we should probably um, move on here. There's so much we can talk about how Clean Water Services and Ripple's program, the Research Innovation People in Labs program, how that then also translates to the Clean Water Institute. But it's an exciting time uh, for us, but thank you to Joy and Bob and the entire uh, uh, team in Regulatory Affairs. We're very proud of all of you and looking forward to your new lab at the Ripple. Um, facility when, uh, when Nate and the team can uh, create that with you. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Diane and um, Bob and your and Joy. That was a great presentation. Great questions. I think this looks like an appropriate time for a break. Um, we'll, we can insert that in there. Uh, it will be generous, but let's make it 15 minutes. And uh, well, that put us yeah, we'll see how close we can get to maybe 1040-ish, 1045, no later than we'll get going again. So thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll be back shortly.
Welcome, John. Matt, we'll get started about four minutes. You can just turn your cameras off, but uh, backgrounds look good. That is a nice touch when you come back in, if you turn your video on, and <laughs> I know that, know that you're back. <laughs> Of course, only those that are back heard that, so. <laughs> How's my audio? Sounds good, Matt. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Good. Jack, can you hear me? Is that Doomer? Yep. I don't see you, though. There he is. Good All right, Rich. We need to do a sound check on Rich. Testing one, two, three. Well, we're good to go. So, Diane, thanks for the uh, treat bag. Uh, I just enjoyed one of the mints. I helped clear out the coffee. <laughs> Mark and Stephanie and the team, they really did a nice job um, putting that together for all of you. So thank you. And a shout out to Mark and the Stephanie. Yeah, yeah thank you. But uh, you owe me some chocolates. Mine were all melted by the time they got to us. Oh, no. <laughs> that, was, that was Stephanie. The delivery guy must have left him in there or something. Mm. There's still some around. <laughs> I, I have to say too that I that I appreciated the uh, the the patch there. So that was uh, so hard to believe. Fifty years. That's amazing.
we could get a budget committee picture via Zoom where we're all holding up our patches if you want. Well, I'm wearing my patch. Oh, I, I just saw that, Pam. That's a clever way to use the uh, paper clip. I wasn't sure what to do with one that big. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think it's almost scary it's so big. Well, it's weak, but oh, of course, then I cut off the torso. All right. There we go, branded. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> well, I don't have a CWS background, so. Yeah, Tony, you look like if you take a step backwards, you're gonna fall off in the canyon. Yeah, it was a, <laughs> you stand on the rim, it kind of feels that way sometimes. <laughs> Those of you that don't have your video screen on, I'm kind of using that to know when you're back. So if you can hear me, you can turn on your uh, video just for a, that way. If we can start a little earlier, we can finish a little earlier. Commissioner Willie uh, let us know earlier that he has to step out or has stepped out for another meeting. So that's why he's not here. So we're just waiting for Commissioner Rogers and Ms. Brown. That's what I see on the screen. Yeah, thank you, Kat, Chair Harrington. Well, regardless, what's at 1045, let's go ahead and Bruce and you can just start it and they'll join us. Thank you, Chair Harrington. Board of Clean Water Services and Budget Committee. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, it's been fun to, to watch this show uh, go forward. You know, the staff has been working on it for, for weeks, months, and it's just so much fun to participate in, in these types of activities. Uh, you know, I was reflecting on a couple of comments Bob made before the previous discussion, as well as Chair Harrington, you know, this notion of regulatory compliance. And, and it's so true that, you know, everything that we do at Clean Water Services is tied to ensuring, you know, clean water and that we're always in compliance. And we each have that role, you know, to, to work on compliance. It's it's interesting. My my role uh, is is changing. Uh, we're going through reorganization, as Diane talked about. I find it extremely exciting because we're positioning ourselves for the next 50 years, and I think that's so inspiring. Um, but I also want to kind of talk about uh, the department, uh, its changes, uh, talk about some of our successes uh, that we've had over the last few years. Uh, but I also want to make sure I'm talking about our partners. Uh, as all of you know, and those familiar with what was formerly the watershed group, now natural systems, um, we have kind of a unique role in implementing one set of regulatory requirements. And that in particular is the, the, the temperature requirements tied to both flow uh, restoration as well as riparian restoration. I think it's so important uh, that these regulatory drivers uh, that push our work out into the community are a catalyst for something far greater than we would have ever achieved alone as clean water services. And so often uh, I, I struggle with when I hand, and you'll see later on the, the results uh, of all this great work, uh, those results are reflective of the partnerships. You know, it's, it's us helping serve as a catalyst to bring those partnerships together but I also always want to put a shout out for, for the partners, and I'll be doing that through this presentation. 
Next slide, please. So biggest change, we went from two uh, different divisions and now there's four divisions. And that also brought a uh, shift from employees. Uh, we brought some uh, employees from Norris uh, crowd over to Natural Systems, uh, as well as a couple of new positions to, to round out the divisions. Um, once again, I, I wanna emphasize this budget reflects what we're spending to catalyze that broader outcome that we see on the landscape out there. So, you know, it's, it's often, uh, people hear me talk about doing 10 river miles of restoration a year. Uh, that isn't reflected just in our work. That's reflected in the entirety of the partners that are working very intimately together. Uh, so this budget, uh, we'll see an increase of five employees in the uh, natural services group spread across those four divisions. Next slide, please. And here they are. The, the four divisions. And well, Rich is going to talk a little bit more in depth about them. Uh, I'm excited, you know, landscape strategies. If you watch us produce the kind of results we do on the ground, we have to do very, very thoughtful planning to produce a Wapato National Wildlife Refuge to see 100 farms with uh, great restoration occurring on them, or whether we see thousands of acres being restored on metro lands or, or uh, THPRD lands. All those require very thoughtful planning and landscape strategies so that we can bring together the resources, not just our resources, but the community's resources to implement some fantastic projects. The, the other division here, project delivery, hey, they're gonna put it on the ground for us. They've done it, they continue to do it. Uh, that group is just gonna keep burning it up in terms of putting great projects on the ground. The, the, the other division there, stewardship, very important, uh, as we see, you know, with 50 years and 15 years of, of this work that uh, I've been doing and the team's been doing, we've seen 700 projects uh, completed. Uh, that, that pushes us to say, do we have the community stewardship network in place to make sure those projects are prosperous now and for future generations? Next slide, please. Nate brought this up earlier, Diane, you know, the, those things that drive our regulations, things like growth and asset management come along with it, uh, you know, are part of that story. Uh, these all influence the work I do. We need more riparian restoration to offset our thermal loads because of growth. We have assets, you know, it's interesting. Uh, my assets by and large are those of a natural system. So, and the benefits of those natural systems is they, they only appreciate in value, they don't depreciate. And, and that's, uh, you know, my own angle on asset management, but that also dictates why we should be looking at stewardship as ensuring that these assets continue to uh, increase in value over time. Uh, things like growth, whether it's growth, uh, Urban growth or growth in other areas, uh, they push us to make sure we have the biodiversity in place and the watershed resilience in place to continue to have a healthy and vibrant watershed. And then the notion of human health, you know, that goes along with that. It's not only about the water we drink, it's about the trails people walk on and the air they breathe. Next slide, please. You all have seen this slide before. You see the, the tree for all moniker, as I've mentioned many times. Uh, I have to use this and I want to use this and I want to trumpet this notion of tree for all because it's how we implement and catalyze a broader view of community and conservation needs throughout the region. And I want to continue to emphasize this because this is the place where we create space space for others to contribute, to bring resources, but to also get their needs met. And I think it's so important that we, we create that space. So when, when the, the tribes come to participate in our Wapato event and give us a blessing of a new uh, refuge, that space is there and they're a part of, of the work. Recreation, it's about drinking water but it's, and, and clean water, but it's also about making sure we have those assets that create good human health, the trails and other things. 
So I, I want to emphasize that, you know, this, this is where the space is that we're working in. And you begin to see when we work in that space, uh, outcomes that are just jaw dropping, you know, outcomes that uh, leave us in a position to uh, be the kind of community we need to be in the future for climate change and, and other places. Sustainable economies, I'll touch a little bit on that. You, you can't have 100 farms in this program and not have a vibrant community in place that helps that helps farmers be, continue to be vibrant, but also protects water quality. And then the habitat, you know, you, you all have heard me before, we're creating, and, and it's been coined a number of times, the network of, tra of, of uh, connected habitat that allows that squirrel to move from one end of the a county to the other without ever touching the ground. And, you know, that, those are the inspirations that this kind of approach brings to uh, our work. Next slide, please. I'm going to touch base on a few projects like we've done, uh, others have done. Uh, you heard me talk about, you know, the work that we're doing over at the farm. You know, it's, it's inspiring when you think about it. It's another great example of a tree for all project. You know, in this case, Metro brings the land, the partners bring the resources to create a place where we can amplify and continue to amplify uh, our needs as a community in the natural areas categories. Cool place. I encourage and I hope we can go over there again with the board. Uh, it's just a phenomenal place. And with each passing year, there's more examples of how our work is implemented uh, throughout the basin that are there. And you can walk around and see and touch and feel. So this, this facility is uh, getting closer and closer. As Diane mentioned, we're working on a number of big facilities, and this is one of them uh, that we're working on along with Ripple to, to meet our, our needs into the future. Next slide, please. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to Rich Hunter, our division manager, and he's going to drill down a little bit on the uh, natural systems divisions, the three new big divisions that we have. So Rich, Turning over to you. Thanks, Bruce. Lori, did you want to ask a question for Bruce? It's really not a question, it's a comment. Bruce, I, I just want to commend you and your staff. Your staff is amazing. And I mean, that's true for all of Clean Water Services, but you know, I work with your group most closely. They're amazing and the work they do is amazing. And I'm happy to see a little bit of FTE added, although I don't know how that pans out in terms of the, you know, reorg. But um, I want to also thank you for the landscape scale approach you and your staff take. Um, as you know, I work on that too. And thank you for your staff's time on both of our big regional work groups, the Regional Habitat Connectivity Work Group and the Oak Prairie Work Group. And, um, and particularly, I'd like to call out uh, Janelle St. Pierre and Carol Murdoch. Thank you. She's now one of uh, our team members in the new group. So we're very excited to have Janelle with us. Thanks for the kind words, Lori, and appreciate the partnership with yourself and with Metro. Um, we've been able to do some really special things together for the health of the watershed, and I appreciate that. So natural systems, and, and what are natural systems, you might ask? Well, natural systems include a range of features in our watershed, like streams, wetlands, floodplains, but also upland forests and prairies, and even street trees. But as you can see from the values of the landscape conservation approach that Bruce presented, the social and the community systems that intersect with nature are essential and equally represented in our program areas for natural systems. So this is a high level view of our services in the three new division areas. In landscape strategies, we do focus planning of integrated conservation strategies that assemble resources and partnerships in support of Tree for All to create a healthy and resilient watershed. And we do this with multiple ways, natural systems, MS4 integration, helping implement new hydro modification requirements in the stormwater regulatory environment. We do this through large landscape scale planning, subbasin, a few notches above where we are implementing projects. We're looking at integrating actions on the ground for the most cost-effective approaches. 
We're developing partnerships for long-term relationships and transformations with our community groups. And we're doing this through innovative information tech and tools that help support and guide that work. Project delivery brings together multidisciplinary partnerships that plan and execute urban and rural projects with Tree for All partners to enhance the health and resilience of the watershed. Project development is where planning turns into action and projects are um, developed um, with um, knowledge and foresight of, of the sub-basin strategies and the partnership context. And these enhancements go across ecological systems, water resources, and all of our asset system improvement areas. Stewardship Services creates the community network of Tree for All partners needed to take long-term care of natural system assets in support of a healthy and resilient watershed for future generations. The community partnerships are a critical way that we do this. Um, to help provide long-term site management and receivership in the community um, and, that, and to respond to um, concerns and needs in the natural system. Next slide, please. In order to think and act like the river would want us to, we apply long-term, large-scale, community-focused perspective into strategies that result in landscape scale change through a large portfolio of multi-objective projects. We do this scaling up through partnerships at the regional and local level, such as the regional conservation strategy shown on the right, the, the type of efforts that Lori mentioned, the regional habitat connectivity working group and Oak Prairie um, partnership, as well as development of the innovative technology and tools that support cost-effective planning and management of enhancement and restoration actions on the ground. And to tell you more about some of these projects that we're implementing, I'd like to introduce Matt Brennan, Senior Engineer of Natural Systems. Next slide. Thanks, Rich, and good morning. I wanted to just highlight uh, briefly three collaborative projects that we have ongoing in the natural systems group, both in the urban and the rural areas. The Chicken Creek Enhancement Project at the Tualatin River National Wildlife Refuge in Sherwood involves realigning a, a degraded segment of Chicken Creek as it enters the Tualatin River. This project will bring that the stream in connection with its floodplain and increase the, the stream length and also provide more of a connection between the river and the, the entire Chicken Creek watershed. This construction season will be the third and final as we connect the newly constructed channel and get Chicken Creek into its new alignment. This project includes a lot of partners providing funds and land access, including the US Fish and Wildlife Service who own and maintain the refuge itself, Ducks Unlimited, the Willamette Water Supply Project, the Soil and Water Conservation District, and Intel. We're also collaborating with the Soil and Water Conservation District for a project on Gales Creek coming up this summer, enhancing a segment of stream bank that will expand our efforts at stream corridor enhancement in the vicinity of our existing half mile lane wetland complex. This will also help the conservation district's mission in, uh, to serve their rural landowners in the county. Next slide, please. Finally, Butternut Creek is a good example of a urban project that is both an internal collaboration with our utility operations group, as well as external collaboration with the county and other partners. Last summer, we constructed a stream enhancement of reach one, we call it, a portion of the segment of Butternut Creek between 198th Avenue and 209th in Aloha. The construction of this project supported the county's road widening project and uh, meeting the commitments for stormwater management. This involved placement of large wood in both the stream and on the floodplain of a segment of Butternut Creek. But we didn't really want to limit our 
corridor enhancement to just this one project area. So we're continuing to plan for enhancements as we move downstream towards the river, looking for other partnerships that uh, could allow us to kind of expand on the, the, the cumulative benefits of this, of this work. The Soil and Water Conservation District is currently leading an effort in the connected tributary stream, working with homeowner associations on enhancement strategies that will connect to this project. And with that, I will pass it along to John Doomer, a principal engineer in natural systems for the next slide. Thank you, Matt. I'm going to highlight the toilet and joint project and our ongoing work with the United States Bureau of Reclamation. The joint project seeks to address seismic concerns at Scoggins Dam, which impounds Hag Lake and is all owned by the, the Bureau of Reclamation. The project also considers expanding storage at the facility. Options that satisfy both safety and additional supply have been developed. Cost estimates associated with these options have been found to be very high due primarily to the large potential seismic load from a Cascadia subduction zone event. As a result, the project is undergoing a realignment as we take a closer look at regional needs and the multiple purposes that added storage might support, including added fish and wildlife enhancement, hydroelectric power, climate resiliency, recreation, and potentially other benefits that we could look at. Along with investigation of additional purposes, additional stakeholders and associated funding will need to be identified, which will require continued policy and legislative work as sources of funding may include federal loans and grants. As the realignment strategy is pursued, we will also be continuing to coordinate with reclamation as they continue with their dam safety activities. One of these activities is evaluating the risk the dam poses to public safety. And finally, on a related note, we continue to study how to best use the water resources we have or may have in the future. Most recently, this has been done through a working group with representation from throughout the district with the goal of putting us in a position to be successful well into the future. Now back to Bruce Roll our Natural Systems Enhancement and Stewardship Director. Thanks, John. Next slide, please. The, the third division uh, that we're working on and you will see rolling out in the coming years is Stewardship Services. You know, I, I think about uh, great partnerships, you know, uh, we, one of the, reorganization pieces that we're working on and bringing into this group is the, the TWEC group, which county uh, commissioners are very uh, engaged in. That group will continue uh, to meet and we will uh, continue to energize and, and work uh, diligently as Clean Water Services has in the past to, to see these needs met. Uh, there's a lot of cool things out there. and, and I, But I think, you know, I really wanna make sure that we, we keep the, the emphasis on making sure that the system is working. Uh, over those 15 years and thousands of acres and hundreds, 150, almost 200 miles, when you think of the developer piece, uh, that isn't going to be shepherded and stewarded by Clean Water Services. It's going to be needing a community-based and engaged group of people uh, that understand the needs of these resources and the protection and preservation of them. So, you know, I, I look forward to uh, the coming 50 years because I... We have the assets, you know, so communities, few communities uh, have ever dreamed of having the number of assets we have and the ones that we are creating. So we're, we're poised, you know, to have the kind of community I think we all enjoy and, and appreciate. But I also am excited by uh, the needs and the desire to make sure that our community uh, is that are the stewards for these projects for future generations. So that's exciting. You know, it's fun to see as, as we use the tree for all approach that uh, stewardship becomes much easier when the 40 plus partners all have a hand in playing a part in stewarding these lands. So I'm excited, but I'm excited for that. Next slide, please. This is, this is a time for question and answer. And once again, before you uh, look at those results and say, oh, isn't clean water service is great. I want you to make sure you're looking at that logo up there and saying, isn't that partnership great? 
you know, and, and I am just thrilled that I'm in the position I'm in that I'm able to help catalyze and bring together uh, these partners out there. So it's got to be a shout out for all of them. It can't be a shout out only for clean water services. So with that, I'll open it for questions. Andy. Yeah, Bruce. Um... You, you listed a couple of projects that you've got coming up for streamside restoration. What's your capacity for future streamside restoration? How many projects do you have? What's your backlog? That type of thing. Uh, we push them out as quickly as we can. You know, the, it's fun to see the, the new funding source from the CD, that one that we emphasize. There's a good example of bringing their new resources to bear with ours. Uh, part of the reorg uh, that we've done is to help increase our capacity in delivering uh, projects throughout the, the basin. So, you know, I, it's one thing to put, you know, in the case of like uh, Chicken Creek, we went from a mile to a two and a half miles of, of stream channel. So when you ask me the capacity question, I said, I can't do 10 of those a year. <laughs> you know, and if it's 10 feet versus 50 feet, is it urban or non-urban? Uh, but I think it's a great question. I, you know, we're we're continuing to push, uh, push hard on that, both in rural and urban areas, Andy. So I don't see I don't see us letting up. You know, I think the biggest struggle we have with a lot of this uh, in water work is getting the regulatory permitting framework uh, accomplished as quickly as possible. You know, one of the the struggles we continue to have is the delay in moving an idea or other things into action on the ground. So, but we're working on that. Okay. I see another question. Uh, just to follow up oh, on, yep. uh, do you have a backlog of projects then, uh, ones that you can't reach within the next year or two? I have to talk, Matt. Where's Matt? I'm gonna have Matt, because Matt's our, our project guy delivering. Do we have a big backlog of those projects, Matt? I don't know if we have a, a, a big backlog of projects that we're worried about delivering at this point. We know that there will be projects coming up. And I think, um, you know, as our current, I think our current staffing level is adequate for the work that we're doing, but we do anticipate um, an increase in some of the urban projects and collaborative ur urban projects that are sort of a, um, combination of infrastructure and natural systems that tend to take a lot of resources to, to figure out and get implemented. So we anticipate that coming, but I wouldn't say that those are sitting there waiting for us. Great. I see another, I see a couple hands, uh, Chair Harrington and then uh, Roy. Thank you. I just have a very simple question as we go through each of these major program areas in clean water services and we get these by the number slides, are these, it's, since we're talking about this proposed year, I'm trying to discern out of these various statistics, which statistics are over the life of a program as opposed to what either was last fiscal year or what is being proposed for this fiscal year? This is cumulative. This is cumulative over the last 15 years since the Tree for All program started. And that's what this one represents. Now on average, uh, it, it fluctuates from year to year. On average, we're looking at about 10 river miles uh, of, of uh, restoration occurring a year. The, the acreage, you know, as you see, Metro bring more properties online will increase, but that represents the collective that are water that are working toward the same goals we are in in watershed health. Uh, volunteer planting hours that continues to grow as you see friends of trees move more and more uh, on on deck. You know, it, it, it fluctuates from year to year, partially uh, from. You know, you have projects like Chicken Creek and some of these huge ones or Wapato. And so uh, sometimes I find it easier to look over time than to try and uh, look at each year. Uh, what I can say is, you know, there's an average I can come up with for most of these. Am I, am I hearing that you want more annual specific numbers, Chair Harrington? So uh, I'm just observing that with each program area in the completion, we're generally left with a by the numbers. And 
I mean, it was pretty obvious on this slide to understand it was cumulative. Yeah. But so I'm just wondering for budget committee purposes, given that we're trying to focus on this proposed budget year, if if we're just seeing variance, you know, it's on a yeah. per department basis or is there some consistency? That's all, just a simple question. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Well, before I ask my question, uh, Bruce, I, I, 50 years, I didn't know you had that in you, but that's that's great. You said you're excited about the next 50, so congratulations. You're, you inspire <laughs> me. I, have a, I hope you yeah, have right. no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm done. You'll be 50 more for you. That's great. Uh, <laughs> As far as, as, and this is a tact question, and you said, what have I got to do with that? We, we really utilize that CREP, as I think I got the acronym right, that CREP program well. And we also talked about an exchange at one time uh, for uh, carbon credits, that there would be a, a national exchange, which I thought was pretty smart if we ever did that, because there isn't one out there. Uh, and we could uh, kind of be the new Wall Street of a different commodity, but... Uh, is there any legislation that you are uh, proposing or either on the federal or state level that we might uh, give folks uh, some incentive to set aside ground because there's tax credits? Uh, I'm not directly pursuing it. I think it's certainly on the look at Mark uh, Jockers to talk a little bit about our legislative agenda. You know, the, the, the notion on the, um, the carbon credits, I've been tracking that. We've been tracking it. You know, it was more, there was a push mm -hmm. on it a few years ago. Uh, it was a voluntary market, and there was a little struggle with whether that model was going to produce, you know, the kind of money we needed to do the carbon credit. I, I find it attractive. We do have a model that we're using to track uh, how much carbon is sequestered across our portfolio of projects. But I think you're, you're touching on some some new things as we begin to see uh, re-energizing of some of these issues, uh, certainly carbon, carbon credits and carbon footprint. Uh, I hope we can be developing more frameworks that give us additional credit for those things. Uh, it's an interesting thing that this is a topic that's coming up with NRCS and others. You know, they're, they're, they're supporting and wanting uh, more uh, emphasis on carbon credit, but mostly because of the no-till and keeping more carbon in the soil is healthy for the for the, the farms. I've had a number of discussions I was having previously with uh, Dean Moberg, the regional one, about that very topic. Is uh, can we get more farm incentive monies for uh, farmers that may uh, sequester more carbon? And, and so that's that's there. I don't know of any current uh, of the federal farm bill monies that specifically target uh, carbon credits related to sequestration, though. Bruce, I just just I just put a little pin in the wall for you, I, I, not today, obviously, but for the future. Yeah. I, the only reason that uh, things like uh, solar power and electrification of vehicles has happened is because of federal tax incentives, because uh, they don't pencil out unless there's some sort of tax credit. Uh, the same thing with housing. The reason we have so much housing now is the federal tax credits as well as state tax credits in regard to not only financing, uh, uh, but uh, uh, developing these, these sources of lending. So to me, and I know this isn't part of the budget meeting, but it would be interesting for future for you to take a look and say, how, how do we move the dial a little bit? The carbon credits are gonna be important and we're gonna ask businesses to uh, do certain uh, mitigation. And if we could figure the way out to encourage our legislative group, both at the federal state level, to uh, to advance some tax policy, we might be able to advance some projects as well. So I, I just I know that's way outside of what you're doing right now, but no, I appreciate those comments very much. Uh, people know I'm a scrounge when it comes to finding more money for projects, so I'm always looking for places to scrounge more money for great projects. And Com Commissioner Rogers, I, I would like to respond to that too. I think you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it's a situation where it's kind of a nexus of the, of the regulatory part, um, the business part, and the legislative piece. And we certainly see that with these other programs is there's got to be some sort of legislative nexus. We are trying to poise ourselves to take advantage of this. 
I think it's some of the work that we've looked at with the governor's climate adaptation framework and some of the input that we've tried to provide on that, that we could be there. I think you see it in other places. You may see this later in the presentation too, in terms of credits associated with the renewable natural gas, for instance, with what we're talking, we've talked to the board a little bit about those issues too. So how do we position ourselves to do that? And Bruce is exactly right. He's kind of a master of finding where this money might be. That's the way we've also been able to plug in that uh, kind of these conservation programs to the farm bill. So I, I appreciate that, that support and that is something we wanna look at. The other, the regulatory piece too is if we can get credit when we stack credits, we're getting credit already for the trees related to temperature on our discharge permit. How can we be in a situation where we can also stack credits associated with the other benefits they provide, like carbon? Great. Diane. Yes, thank you. And I, I just wanted to add that it's really we're poised in this next five to 10 years because I think this space is going to change. I mean, we have the work that the chair asked the um, CAO, Angie, and myself um, to work on collaboratively between uh, the county and ourselves to talk about the state's uh, climate adaptation framework, but also certainly through um, the current um, federal administration, there's going to be more work in the space. So the way to think about this is that we are carbon offset makers, right? We, we make carbon offset through our activities, but we do need um, folks that are the carbon market makers. And currently that is not yet organized or um, agreed upon, but certainly this is a huge space that um, not only could we offset um, clean water services um, impacts, but um, we could also look at uh, it as a countywide and, and other potential um, offsets. But um, this work um, that's been long in the making, I think is going to uh, pay some dividends here um, in the next uh, five to 10 year window. So um, hang tight with that. You're always looking at us to turn our business model on its head. And, and I do think there's going to be opportunities um, in these upcoming years. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Great, Bruce, I think that wraps, does that wrap up your program? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate All it. Right, well, we'll hand off to Nate. Okay. Thank you. And I want to thank you, Bruce. I always enjoy seeing the good work that you do, your team, and the partners do for uh, really enhancing the watershed. And I can't help but be impressed with every time I, I hear you talk about the energy and excitement you bring to it. So, so thank you for that, Bruce. And with that, you know, Utility Operations Services has had a long, good working relationship with the natural systems people, planning, designing, constructing, and maintaining these projects, both sanitary and stormwater, that meet the conveyance needs. That's kind of the, the Utility Operations Services focuses, but just as important are this natural enhancements uplift. So working to, on these integrated projects together, is, it's been something that's been done well in the past and was really one of the goals of this new organizational restructuring. So as we get into the U utility operations group, I think everybody that's been on this committee knows in the past years, it's always Nora, Nora Curtis who would present this. But we all know she's retired and uh, we're in the process of rehiring for her. That's why I'm filling in for the, this part. And now I'm going to pass it off later to uh, the division managers. But I know you can all attest. Everybody that knows Nora knows she left some real big shoes to fill here. But to her credit, and I want to credit her team, they've really stepped up. I've gotten to know them more and closer in the last five, six months since Nora's retired than I knew before, and I really appreciated it. Yet it's a great compliment to Nora that she's not forgotten by her staff. And they recall her, I, and I, this is what they do. They recall her by asking themselves, what would Nora do? And I think that's a real testimony to her. So she's not here in person, but she's still here in spirit. And I really appreciate that about her. So if we could go to the next slide. And kind of this next slide 
kind of shows part of the story. You're going to see this year's numbers have large reductions in materials and services and in the personnel. And the reason for that is that with Nora leaving, that was really a catalyst for us to think we have to, how are we going to restructure the district for the future? And part of it was to look at utility operations and services and essentially decide to split it into two. So let's go to the next slide, please. And this slide tells the story. This is overall the organizational structure of UOPS last year. And that also tells the story of how it's changed. And the light blue boxes are really the, what's changed. And the first one, development services and system planning services, that group is being created into basically a brand new business unit. It's called Regional Utility Services. And the Administrative Facilities Management Division, that is moving into another new business unit, Enterprise Asset and Technical Services. And Diane's gonna talk about both of those new business units in more detail later. I just wanted to introduce that now. But before we go on, I wanna then talk about what remains, and a lot still remains in this very important business unit. First, there's an administration group, and they that is the management. Those are the strategic thinkers, the leadership of the business unit. But there's also a very important part in there, fleet services. It's, it resides in, in this business unit because they have the largest and the biggest and most fun equipment in the district. Um, if you like big equipment, they have it. So that's why that group is there. The other two groups though are conveyance engineering and field operations. It's kind of interesting to think about the contrast between these two groups. The engineering group does the planning, design, they manage the construction, and they're doing this in, mostly in the office and they're doing it for stuff that's underground. So what they do isn't really seen that visible. Whereas field operations, that's the largest group in the district, there's 69 employees. And my guess is most people in the community, if they really associate somebody with clean water services, it's probably one of those guys because they're the ones driving these big blue rigs that say clean water services on them. I see them when I drive around, you can hardly miss them. And they do really important work. And they're out in the community and people see them. They're maintaining our, our our collection system. And they have all kinds of great tools to do that. They can put TV cameras down the, the pipes and see what's going on. They can repair what they find, they can construct. So it's a really impressive work group. And I'd like to go to the next slide and talk about the drivers for this program. And like all the programs, you know, we're, we're, we have a lot of pressures to decide how to deal with today and the future in the terms of growth, regulations, and asset management. And here, the growth is a really interesting one for uh, utility operations, because with growth, there's more flow, because people have more flow that they discharge down the drain. But for this group, it's not just that there's more, it's where it's at, because we have a gravity system that was built, the backbone of the system was built when the district was first created nearly 50 years ago. So it's reaching capacity and all this new growth is on the perimeter, at least a lot of the new growth. And that's coming from these expansions of the UGB. So we had an original system that was built for the district of 50 years ago, and now we're growing and we have to provide capacity on the perimeter. And this, this growth is something we really pay attention to because it informs and affects how we look at our asset management program. Because as I mentioned, much of this large diameter trunk system was installed back at the beginning of the district. And we typically have a rule of thumb that pipe gravity pipelines have about a 50 year life. So a lot of these systems are reaching their capacity or their, their age and need to be replaced. So what we're doing is looking at not just replacing them because 
they're worn out, we're, expect, we're increasing the diameter. We're making them bigger so we can deal with this new growth. So it's being, there's really an overlap, very strong overlap between the growth and asset management circles on this diagram. And the regulation that really is most important and drives both the design side and the operations and maintenance side of, of utility operations is worrying about sanitary sewer overflows. So that's what we're trying to keep the capacity so we don't overflow because we don't, the pipes aren't big enough. And we're also trying to maintain those sewers so they always have the capacity to be able to have the flow through. So next slide, please. And here I'd like to be able to just introduce, we're gonna do now highlights of the two divisions, conveyance engineering and field operations. And this is my opportunity to uh, introduce and really welcome the two division managers to do this next part of the presentation. Andy Braun is the division manager for the conveyance engineering group and Ryan Sandu is the division manager for field operations. They're both gonna take off they're gonna take over now and present some highlights for utility operations. But first up, it's Andy. So Andy, go ahead and take over, please. Okay, thank you, Nate, I appreciate that. Also appreciate your comments about Nora. Uh, I will reflect that uh, Ryan, Damon, and I were actually on a group text with Nora this morning, and uh, she was wishing us well. And at the same time, I said, Nora, if you get these funny feelings today, um, it's because we are all channeling you today. So, <laughs> so we appreciate the, uh, the leadership that she gave us and, and has uh, turned some of those reins over to us. So, um, as Nate mentioned, the conveyance engineering uh, mission of, of our group is really to identify our infrastructure needs and then proceed with planning, designing, and constructing those capital projects to meet the needs. And that's done at both the regional and local levels. The local levels for the small cities and the urbanized unincorporated areas. You'll find our operating budget on pages 216 to 218 of your budget book. But really, our real work is reflected in the appendix, which reflects a capital project list. And that's on pages 286 to 307. Okay, next slide, please. Today, I'd like to share two projects that really reflect both the drivers and the strategic outcomes. First project is our biggest one this year. This is truly an integrated project. It's a $12 million Cedar Mill sanitary upgrade and stormwater management project. The map is a little bit tough to see there, but you can see that this is the area just south of Jenkins Road, just south of Nike, and expanding onto Tualatin Hills Parks and Recreation District Nature Park. The drive, one, of the, one of the main drivers here is that growth that we talked about, both the growth at Nike with, with the addition of employees, as well as densification of the, uh, the watershed above it. And meeting that growth requires the, the expansion of the public infrastructure to support it. That's in both the area of sanitary sewer capacity, as well as additional public infrastructure associated with transportation improvements. And those transportation roadway projects being implemented by Washington County land use and transportation around the whole Nike Superblock. So this really leads us to a number of uh, strategic outcomes. The first one of those is our work in transform transformative partnerships. I'd like to highlight three of these. First one is with the County Land Use and Transportation Group in the kind of the co-management of stormwater. So their roadway projects are generating a lot more impervious area and increased runoff. We went into a partnership with them and through this project, again, it's not only a sanitary sewer capacity project, but it's also enhancement of the, the creek area and the associated wetlands. Second strategic partnership is with THPRD. The majority of this project is being done on within their nature park and their, their close association and 
cooperation with us is integral to the success of this project. They're one of our critical partners, and I know that's true for our natural systems group as well. The third one, and Bruce also mentioned this group, is the Tualatin Watershed Enhancement Collaborative, or TWEC. This project in this watershed is one of those numerous efforts going on in this public and private collaborative. Next slide, please. The other strategic outcome associated with this project is integrated watershed management and watershed resiliency. First is that integrated part. This is combining a hard infrastructure project that sewer upsize with the natural resources in the creek corridor and the associated wetlands. The resiliency part, the sewer capacity increase should provide capacity and resilience for the next 50 to 100 years. And finally, the restoration of the sewer disturbance area, but broader than that, it's not just in the, the trench and the disturbed area, but it's going beyond those boundaries and really enhancing Cedar Mill Creek and the adjacent wetland complex which again provides that environmental uplift and resiliency. Next slide, please. Second project that I'd like to mention is on a much smaller scale, but really demonstrates the partnership again with land use and transportation and our local infrastructure program. The Cedar Mill project was certainly done at a regional level, uh, a large diameter sewer associated with that. This project, again, in cooperation uh, with the county who provided uh, approximately half the funding of this, uh, about $500,000 to solve this, uh, this longstanding flooding problem in the area, which was both a stormwater nuisance as well as a safety problem for access to uh, some of the roadways. That, that storm sewer system is the responsibility of, of clean water services. So this is our local uh, program. We're working in the, the urbanized unincorporated area of Aloha. This is out on Blanton Street. So this project uh, is actually just wrapping up, but it involved the replacement and upgrade of the uh, storm sewer system in the area to resolve these flooding issues. Okay, next slide, please. A third effort that I want to recognize, and this isn't so much of a uh, one capital project, as much as it is an ongoing effort, and it really demonstrates the relationship that conveyance engineering, field operations, and our partners have in the whole FANO watershed. The district has worked closely with Portland's Bureau of Environmental Services over many years, working on infrastructure in this area. BES owns and maintains a large pump station uh, that under normal circumstances and with their upgrade a number of years ago, even under high flow and storm conditions, uh, pumps their sanitary flows to their treatment plants. However, it's this integration and working with the city of Portland that we really protect our, our infrastructure downstream as well as uh, the, the stream environment. So again, this isn't just about the capital projects, but it's really working with that partner in a number of different ways. There will be some capital projects that will be forthcoming in this area, part of which is the control of inflow and infiltration into the sewer system to preserve capacity. And both district sewers, as well as sewers within the city of Portland flow to this area. So it's this ongoing work with that partner in both field operations, working with the operational aspects of uh, BES and their, and their uh, pump station, as well as engineering and looking and doing the planning and the uh, collaboration with BES's uh, engineering folks to work on, on the capacity control in this area. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ryan Sandu to talk more about the field operations aspects. Thanks, Andy. Uh, it's nice to see everyone today. And while Andy mentioned uh, I'm the field operations division manager, I'm gonna be talking to you today about a district-wide initiative related to communications. Um, this initiative is a part of the investment in resiliency that Diane touched on at the beginning of the presentation. 
In 2015, WACA, the Washington County Consolidated Communications Agency, notified users of changes that were coming to their radio communication system that would impact all users and members. This started the ball rolling for CWS to take a long-term look at our routine and emergency communication needs and capabilities. While WACA continues to be an important partner and radio communications provider for us, we also realized that we had options to ensure that we would have resilient emergency communications in the event of a Cascadia type event and enhanced routine radio communications. In 2018, we took a first big step to reestablish area-wide use of an 800 megahertz channel pair that the district owned and used uh, at that time on just a local site-by-site -site, uh, level. The effort required relicensing the channel pair with the FCC, which is uh, no small process, and building a high site uh, repeater, as well as coordination with the water resource recovery facilities who use the channel pair for internal plant communications. So basically staff at Durham could talk to other staff at Durham and same thing at Rock Creek, uh, but it was, it was localized communication. The main goal of this first effort was to ensure that CWS facilities could communicate with each other and other partners as well uh, without relying upon anyone else. It was a system that we owned and operated um, and we still have WACA as a backup, but we wanted to make sure that we had that uh, capability to talk from ABC, our, our administrative headquarters to field ops, field ops to the Durham treatment, uh, re water resource recovery facility, and so on. Uh, working with Lake Oswego and the city of Taggart, we built uh, our new high site on Nansen Summit, which is co-located with the Lake Oswego water reservoir and a Tigard VHF radio site that had been out of service for a number of years. The picture on the slide here uh, shows the uh, Nansen Summit with the antenna there. The, the longer um, white uh, whip style antennas are Lake Oswego's and Tigard's. Ours is a smaller black uh, kind of rectangular shape. Uh, it's about halfway up one of the masts. So with our first objective to connect district facilities via uh, radio communications met, uh, we're poised to make additional upgrades to our routine and emergency communications. Next slide, please. The pictures on this slide side show our, our equipment cabinets at Nansen. Uh, our cabinet is in the middle uh, of the top picture a little further back. Uh, the transmitter and receiver are fed by regular PGE power or shore power and also have multiple days of battery backups, which you can see in the lower picture there. Those are the red boxes. The cabinet also has fittings for a portable generator to be hooked up, but our staff would have to deploy uh, to the site to do so. So in the event of an emergency or, or a large wide scale natural disaster with power outage for multiple days or, or weeks potentially, uh, getting, up to the, getting a generator up to the site could be a high priority, but that would be something that our incident command um, team would make a, a decision on at the time and based on what other systems were still operating. So with our initial purpose in mind of creating a flexible, resilient communication system, we're looking at a number of systems and ultimately connecting them so the users don't need to worry about which system am I on and changing back and forth and having to think too much about how it all works, but rather who do I need to communicate with? So multiple platforms that we are considering and uh, including our own 800 uh, analog megahertz channels. Uh, we're also looking, uh, continuing to use WACA. Uh, possibly adding VHF capability, and also AT&T's FirstNet for our smartphone and, uh, and other uh, mobile devices. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about our 800 megahertz system and what we've done so far with that. So in the current fiscal year, we've been working with a consultant and actually have acquired additional 800 megahertz channel pair through the FCC's process, um, which will allow us to be more flexible and have more capability with channel that we own. Uh, it's a big step, and as long as we remember to, to renew our license in 10 years, which I have on my Outlook calendar, uh, CWS uh, will own those channels into the future, and as long as we uh, uh, maintain our, our license and renewal. We've also been working closely with uh, TVID, Tualatin Valley Irrigation District, to set up a second 800 megahertz high site at the Fern Ridge Reservoir, uh, which sits on a hill above the uh, Joint Water Commission treatment plant on the Tualatin River outside of Forest Grove. Our radio propagation studies conducted by a consultant indicated uh, the area would help fill in some gaps in coverage of our service area, and particularly the uh, Highway 47 um, corridor down to Gaston, um, which was really not served by our Nansen site. Um, so we have a signed IGA with TVID, and we're ready to um, uh, put that site um, into service here as soon as uh, we complete construction of it. 
Um, it's, and it's going to provide a benefit to us as well as help uh, TVID um, with some of their communication needs. So it's really a win-win uh, on a site that TVID, TVID um, um, had access and, and owned. CDBS and TVID had been long partners um, related to the dam and, and providing water to the streams um, in the, the west side of the basin. So it was a natural extension of those previous efforts and partnership uh, to, to partner on communications, um, again, with benefits to both agencies. Our communi radio communication service with, with WACA is, uh, is still important uh, and we still need to have a presence there, but maybe not quite as much as we've, we've had in the past based on, on the right sizing, the use and the number of radios. So what we're looking at doing is ensuring that each of our fixed facilities has a base station with uh, capability of communicating through WACA system. Um, and, and the, of course, the ability also to use our other radio systems as well. Um, WACA's uh, service is actually changing to a 700 uh, digital platform. Um, and that's some of the initial changes that we were became aware of in 2015 that, that prompted us to take a look at and see what did we really need to do there. One of the third platforms is a VHF uh, system, um, which we don't, we don't currently have capabilities on. But we've been talking with uh, 12th and Valley Water District, another uh, long-term partner of ours. Um, and it's in the beginning stages, but it's important for us to work on this as most of our city partners uh, and county LUT are on VHF systems. Um, our initial discussions with TVID have been pretty high level, but, but very positive. Uh, and it's something that we'll be working on in the coming year here to see if we can uh, come to an, an IGA, an agreement uh, where we could partner with them and use part of their system. And then they potentially could use part of the system that we may end up building. Uh, TVWD has recently completed significant upgrades to their VHF system. Um, and if we go down a VHF path, we would have the ability to link our 800 system uh, with, a, with the VHF system. That's the part where trying to make it where users don't have to worry about what system to use, but rather what channel to be on and who that channel is going to go to, and then trying to make it as simple as possible for them. So Multi-band radios and patching equipment uh, in equipment cabinets do all the hard work and make all that possible. One of the other pieces of our uh, system that we're looking at is AT&T's FirstNet, uh, which is basically, it's a cell service um, that actually I have on my phone right now, um, and a number of our staff do as well. Um, the FirstNet is AT&T's uh, cellular system for first responders, utilities, um, public works groups, and, and a few other uh, groups. The system was a uh, recommendation by the 9-11 Commission, uh, but has just now gone into service oh, in the last couple of years. Uh, last year, the district moved all of our district provided smartphones and mobile devices with cell service to AT&T's FirstNet. We actually saved a little bit of money. Um, and we also should have significant, and more importantly, probably, we should have significantly higher level of service in the event of a natural disaster or other event while cell service, um, cell systems are overwhelmed. Uh, so basically, it gives us priority um, service because the cell systems know that uh, we're a priority provider or priority user. Um, as of just a couple months ago, FirstNet's become available to all CWS staff members on our own private devices. Um, so I've, like I said, I have it on my phone here just for a month or two now. Um, and in the event of a disaster, I should be able to use my phone. Um, as long as there is some cell service, I should be able to use my phone to continue to communicate. Um, of course, that's not guaranteed, um, but that's the, that's the intent. Um, while we don't really expect staff to put their cell phones away and start using radios for all communications, um, all of these pieces working together uh, are intended to provide a robust and resilient system for us, um, both day to day and um, in the event of a, a, a disaster. Uh, and again, it's all really thinking about resiliency. And there are a couple of enhancements that are out there that, uh, that may make it enticing for staff to use the radio system on a day to day basis. Um, that are really related to the, the VHF system. The VHF system is a digital system, so it will work with our, um, our Cisco voiceover IP phones. So basically, I could be sitting at my desk, dial an extension, and talk to a staff member in the field investigating a, a sanitary sewer overflow or some odor or something else like that, and we need to, to communicate in order to be able to provide some information and back and forth. So that ability to basically use, use your phone as a radio and vice versa uh, is something that's on the horizon. And TVWD is actually working to implement this uh, right now. 
And the second enhancement that uh, that's coming with VHF is basically the same idea of uh, turning your desk phone into a radio, but this is with your, with your smartphone. There's an app that you can get for your phone that uh, basically turns it into a radio um, so that we could basically do the same thing. So on my phone, I could talk to staff that are in the field um, that have their radios with them and vice versa. Uh, so just one more tool, a couple more tools that, that we're looking to add to our toolbox here in the future. Uh, so we're really excited about where we are with our, our communication modernization upgrades that have been completed in the last couple of years. Uh, and for those that are just around the corner, um, we're in a good position today and we'll be in an even better position in the next year or so. Without the strong partnerships that we have, it would have been much harder to get to where we are and more expensive uh, and where we will be in the next year or so. The capabilities we have in our building will help us serve our community in the event of a major disaster and also help with our day-to-day -day operations. Next slide, please. And here's the utility operations and services by the numbers. And to Chair Harrington's question, these numbers are annual numbers. Uh, and they're FY21 numbers uh, projected towards the end of the year. Um, and that we can expect that they would be similar for FY22 um, with the exception of the manhole rehabs. Hopefully that will see a dramatic increase. That number was included to show the impacts of COVID on one of our tasks that requires crews to be very closely, um, uh, very closely spaced. Uh, 10 manholes is not a lot of rehabs. Those identify emergency or high priority rehabs. Our routine work was held off um, until, if new, until next year or once the uh, COVID rules are relaxed a little bit. Typically that number is in the hundreds, you know, 200, 250 in that neighborhood. Uh, this concludes the um, utility operations and services presentation. I think we have time for some questions. Great. Um, I see Molly has her hand up. Hi. Um, a question about all the radio uh, telephone stuff. Is that similar to, wasn't it the late 90s, early O's that, like, I think it was Nextel or something had cell phones that operated as radios also? Is it kind of getting back to that kind of thing? Hey, hey Molly, how are you doing? I think I think you're referring to uh, Nextel's push to talk system potentially. Was that uh, it? I, 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 think, I just remember a lot of construction firms used it. Yes, and I, I'm, I'm not very familiar with that other than I think a lot of people really liked it. Um, but for some reason, I think it went away. And I think the answer to your question is yes. The system that we would have um, has a lot of similarities to that push to talk where I could dial up a specific radio and it's basically like we're on a kind of on a walkie talkie to each other um, and a pr pretty, a pretty useful. And I think a good, good system. I'm not sure why that went away though. I have to look into that. Yeah. My, my guess was we, everything was going towards cellular and that was the new thing, you know? So. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Chair Harrington. I'm wondering if we can talk about pipes for a second. So uh, back on slide 70, where you talked about the Blanton Street flooding. So in man many neighborhoods in urban unincorporated Washington County, uh, or at least the more recent ones uh, higher up, um, there are stormwater catch basins, uh, where the pipes from the gutters on the streets go into sort of a neighborhood catch basin. And then with North Bethany, I remember um, Nora being out in the community uh, talking about regional stormwater handling. So I'm wondering for a project like this, uh, does the stormwater get piped into the same pipes for sewer or does it get piped and placed into a catch basin or tell us more how that was done. Sure, thank you, Chair Harrington. We have a, uh, a multifaceted system uh, which is comprised of both uh, what we call roadside piping in many of the unincorporated areas like Aloha 
which is a, a very shallow system and is actually owned by uh, Washington County still, but maintained under contract with Clean Water Services. In areas like North Bethany, it is all a completely closed conveyance system. Uh, I'll go back to a lower real quickly. That's a lot of what we had inherited when we inherited the stormwater system uh, when we took it that over in 1990. Mm -hmm. um, anything being built now is a, a full uh, system designed to our current standards, a closed conveyance system. The network of catch basins do collect that surface water, channel it into the pipe system, which then channel them to our water quality facilities. So again, uh, as you talk about kind of that regional system, um, there are multiple different types of water quality treatment facilities. We're tending more towards the very small uh, facilities or LIDA facilities, low impact development approach facilities. But then we also have uh, larger ones, which might treat a, a whole development or a whole subdivision. And then we scale up from there and actually have regional water quality uh, facilities, which treat very large areas. Uh, you may, have, may remember a couple projects that have been done up in the, the North Bethany area, uh, Bethany Creek Enhancement Project. And there are a number of, um, well, we have real-time control implemented on some of those that that collect stormwater from a whole basin and provide both quantity and quality control. So it is quite, quite a network and it differs uh, throughout our service area. Is there a place, it's not necessarily in the budget document, but up on the Clean Water Services website, maybe you could send me a link that is like Clean Water Services by the numbers. You know, I remember a, there's a map of the watershed in the budget, but then there's miles of sanitary sewer pipes, miles of surface water management pipes and pumps and water quality uh, containment areas that you manage, things like that. Certainly, we can get that information to you. We do maintain a, a pretty robust uh, geographic information system that contains all that information. We can break it down by uh, pipe size, um, location, uh, number of water quality facilities, how many of those are public, how many of those are, are private. Uh, so it is uh, quite the, the system that all has to work together uh, to achieve both the quantity and quality control. Yeah, I'm, I'm just hoping there's a, either a web page or a two, you know, two pager that highlights is a summary, not doesn't have to, you know, be everything, but is a summary of all of the asset management that you do, um, because I know there's a lot of it. So Chair Harrington, thank you for bringing that up. And yes, there is. There's something we publish and update on a regular basis called Clean Water Services in Advance. Uh, at a glance, and it's 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 a summary of all the great data that that Andy has. I've just forgotten how to find it. That's all. Ryan, I see your hand back up, or it was. Did yeah. it go away? <laughs> just one one other point I wanted to make, and I think that uh, hopefully. Uh, in the reference that Mark's referring to, it's clear there. And everything that Andy was talking about is related to storm sewer, which is completely separate from our sanitary sewer pipes. So some, some places like city of Portland has a CSO or a combined sewer system. Our system is not a, com our sewer and our storm is not combined. So that's also something that I think the average person may not be aware of that. Um, and it's something I think when on occasion, when we have, I like to try to highlight that. And, and cause I think people hear about Portland and, the uh, overflows to the river and, and the combined system. And so they probably nat would naturally assume that's the same way that ours works, but it's not. Um. Great, thank you. And for those of us that are designed storm sewer systems, we hate working in a LOA because there's no, there's no gravity available. Yeah. It is a pancake. <laughs> so it makes uh, stormwater very challenging and uh, I think everybody was happy it got passed off to you, Andy. <laughs> Tony, I'm here to make your life miserable out here in Aloha. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, yeah, it's just it's a challenge because it, it's very informal system where everywhere else had significant topography to help aid uh, things to go downhill. So um, that brings us back to Nate, I think. Hey, thank you, Tony. Happy to take over. Uh, I'll start by presenting on water resource recovery and services as I have in many years in the past, but this year is going to be in a little bit different role. Uh, unlike Nora, I haven't retired. I'm still here, but my position is changing. I'm transitioning into this chief operating operating officer role. So today, later in this presentation, I'm going to introduce you to the new leadership that has taken over for water resource recovery. If we could go to the next slide, please. And this is the budget slide. And similar to utility operations services, there are some big negative numbers here. And that's, that's a reflection of some of this reorganization that we're doing. And um, this will be addressed later by, by Diane, but the biggest part was the, the uh, well, let's go to the next slide. I'll explain it with the next slide. Because um, this the sixth slide is the org chart. Let's see. Yeah, one more slide, please. Yeah, here we go. This is the, the organizational chart. And the big change that's happening is that the technical plant services group is being uh, turned into the enterprise asset technical services um, business unit. And Diane will talk more about that. But this kind of shows the overall organizational structure of how it was and what, what remains. Before I talk about the remaining elements, I'd like to highlight and mark another anniversary that we haven't talked about. You know, it is 50 years for the, for the clean water services, but it's also 30 years since the slogan 0.1 in 91 was created. And that was something that brought me to clean water services. And 0.1 was our permit limit, 0.1 parts per million total phosphorus in our effluent. And at the time, that was a, a, a limit that was beyond the uh, ability of technology. It was at least that was the theory. But clean water services rose to the occasion back then. And what we did, we really were been pioneers at the beginning and we are still leaders in really advanced um, treatment, very high levels tertiary treatment, which is something that Kathy Leader pointed out at the very beginning that we, we have low rates and we provide the highest level of, of service. And we do it at these, these programs along the top of this org chart. We have four water resource recovery facilities. Uh, Durham and Rock Creek are the two largest ones. And then Hillsborough and Forest Grove are managed as a separate program. And then our smaller um, facilities. We have 43 pump stations. And then we have a dedicated group that really deals with our biosolids, which is our soil amendment, our reuse water program, and the Fernhill natural treatment systems. Collectively, these are our treatment program. On the bottom of this row, we have an administration group that provides the management of the program, and then treatment plant services, which is providing the, the engineering for the program, the construction management, and very importantly, there's a technology development and research group that really focuses on how to stay innovative and how to stay ahead of the curve. So with this, I'd like to go to the next slide, please. And the drivers for water resource recovery, um, the, the growth I put on here, a 15% population increase since 2010. What that means at the treatment facilities is that translates into about 1 million gallons a day of increase in flow per year since 2010, which is a pretty significant increase in, in flow and load that has to be treated. Um, and, and, we and we at the same time, we, we rely on the gravity system, but we continue to have to add new pump stations as well to convey that flow. On here, the new regulations that really cause us the uh, biggest concern are the disinfection byproducts, the copper and the aluminum. These are all, were never in the original 1974 Clean Water Act. These are all new things that have been emerging that keeps us focused on even higher levels of treatment in the future. 
And then I'd like to then talk also about the, uh, uh, in, within uh, water resource recovery, that the asset management component with the facility age being more than 40 years old, that really the first line of defense to really get the most life out of your equipment is the preventative maintenance that the maintenance technicians do. It's much better to really protect the equipment and not let it wear out and replace it. Just take care of it and, and stretch out that life as long as possible. Now the next slide, please. And this is where I wanna transition into um, the highlights of the, of the program, the business unit. And as I said, we, I'm grouping them as a treatment, which is going to be presented by Logan Olds, who's a service manager that oversees the treatment plants and, and the pump station program. And then we also have Rick Shanley, who's the services manager for treatment plant services. And those two would be presenting the rest of the program. So Logan, uh, go ahead and take over, please. Thank you, Nate. I appreciate the comments. As the board is aware, if it weren't for our resource recovery facilities, the Tualatin River, indeed our communities would look very, very different. So as a measure of that commitment to our environment, we have participated in the National Association of Clean Water Agencies Peak Performance Awards for over two decades. It's a really remarkable achievement. It is the premier award, uh, national award, known in our industry. Next slide. Over 200,000 laboratory results are recorded annually to ensure compliance. Only one of these results can fail to move a facility from platinum to gold status. That in itself is a remarkable achievement. And I'd like to give a shout out to Bob. Uh, he and his team do a fantastic job of assisting us at the resource recovery facilities. Forest Grove has achieved platinum status for 18 consecutive years. Rock Creek, has achieved platinum status for 16 consecutive years. And you can see the current status for the last five years of all of our facilities, in addition to the total volume of water treated in 2020. Now, what's really remarkable is that last year, our resource recovery facilities cleaned 15% more water than is contained in all of Hag Lake. That's pretty remarkable when you think about it. Next slide. The water we clean supports the economic vitality of agriculture, industry, and our domestic consumers. We work collaboratively with the Department of Environmental Quality to constantly reevaluate our operation to improve public health and the environment. One example of this has been alluded to previously. This collaboration is to eliminate the use of alum in the final stage of our process. Next slide. To accomplish this goal, we partnered with the United States Geological Survey. And as Nate mentioned initially, when he came to Clean Water Services, it was 0.1 and 91. What's being evaluated now is a shift to 0.5 milligrams per liter of phosphorus. And what's been really remarkable is that due to the improvements in the river health over those decades, thus far, we have seen no increase in algae as a result of this change in this limit. And as a side benefit, it has also reduced our chemical costs. Next slide. Ultimately, in collaboration with our partners, our goal is to reduce aluminum in the river, reduce our expenses, and continue to ensure our services maintain and enhance a Tualatin River that is a resource for all. Please welcome Mr. Rick Shanley, Treatment Plant Services Manager. Thanks, Logan. Um, I'm gonna start, oh, next slide, please. Great, thanks. I have a few examples. I'll talk about some of the projects that uh, we've been working on within treatment plant services, but you're gonna see a pretty repetitive theme where all of these projects involve all the other groups that you've heard from today. Certainly Logan, um, Conveyance, Regulatory Affairs. These are group efforts um, and you're gonna see that as I talk about these things. So. The first one is the East Basin Master Plan, which is a very comprehensive planning effort that we're just about to wrap up um, between the treatment and conveyance group. And I wanna point out that it may seem uh, common sense that you would do a planning effort jointly between these two departments, but that is very rare in our industry. Utilities tend to do these things in silos, um, which is 
something that we've been able to get away from. And we see a lot of benefits of that. First and foremost is we work from the same playbook when it comes to setting forth what the flows are going to be in the basins um, and how growth is going to occur and where growth is going to occur. The other key thing is, is our ability. Um, I want to highlight infiltration and inflow. We look at where we can target infiltration and inflow and compare the cost of that versus treating that. So we've been able to really right size projects for infiltration and inflow and see the benefits of what those will bring to us at the treatment plant and find the lowest cost options that work the best for us. Another key aspect of planning, of course, is we've got to get out our crystal ball and forecast the future, which is very challenging. And in, in part, that's certainly so we can accommodate growth within the area. But the other key aspect really is with those regulatory scenarios. And we've talked about a couple key wins already. When we started this plan, we thought we were going to have potentially some very significant upgrades to deal with alum. And we've actually flipped that trigger where we have lower phosphorus removal standards, hopefully, and we don't see an alum um, issue for us. So Working with regulatory affairs has been great. Um, and I think we really right size what we need to do with respect to regulatory solutions and building at the plant. All of this of course comes, oh, sorry. I wanted to touch on evaluating alternatives and I wanna just come back to something Nate said about technology development and research. That group brings us so much value in our ability to do testing, we do lab work, we do pilot studies. We don't just have to take what consultants recommend for us as upgrades and be very conservative in those improvements, which most other utilities do. And it results in deferring capital projects and really downsizing improvements. And that has a big impact on our 20 year capital improvement program. All right, now I'm ready to jump on to the next one. So the East Basin Master Plan, of course, um, the graph on the right shows overall CIP expenditures um, within the department. Um, and you can see that they've been increasing, but it's these types of planning efforts that really inform what our CIP is gonna be in the future. I wanna point out that we do just in time delivery. So our plants are always under construction. And if you think about all those platinum awards we've gotten while we're constantly in Logan's hair and his staff's hair, um, we have to do a lot of phasing. We do a lot of shutdowns. It's really a co coordinated team effort that allows that to happen. Um, and I want to give a shout out to the, the O&M team that, that make that work with my team, because um, it is very disruptive to see that. The other part of just-in-time delivery, um, we can build things uh, that take advantage of changes in technology over time. Uh, with that too, we have to equalize CIP spending. Certainly that's important for the budget, but I also want to point out there's always way more work than we can do with the team and the people we have. So we have to be realistic about how much we can build and really right size that for the staff that we have. Okay, next slide, please. So two more examples, one in the collection system. This is the North Hillsborough pump station, which really has been on the books. I think our first meeting might've been in 2017 when this came up and the city was interested in us building about a 10 MGD pump station and anxious for us to get started. Well, that's a huge pump station that would dwarf what was at the time, the size of even Intel's flow. So we were able to work with the city. Andy and I had many, many meetings as did many with the district to phase this and come up with a, a project that's right sized again for what they need today to address the industry that's coming forward. So we're actually building a 1.5 MGD pump station. We're about to get started on the construction. It's $4 million, but we have a phase two and a phase three plan that will bring us up smartly to those levels of improvement if they're able to bring in those big industries, which of course we wanna make sure that we can, can accommodate. Okay, next slide, please. The other project, um, that one's finishing up or that one's starting, this one's finishing up. This is a $30 million expansion at the Durham Water uh, Reclamation Resource Recovery Facility. And we're happy to say we're looking to start that up in May. One of the unique things about this one is it's basin configuration. It's going to have the ability to greatly improve, we hope, biological phosphorus removal. It's different than any of our other basins. It's different than pretty much any that you'll see in North America. We think it has a lot of great promise. So we're anxious to get this basin up and humming. 
in addition to what we do to build, I wanted to point out how we do our projects. Um, typically, when you do a design, it takes over a year and you have touch points with your engineering team, maybe every three to four months. What we did on this project and what we'll continue to do, we put everybody in lockdown for a week and we call it a design camp. And we bring in the operations staff, the maintenance staff, the E&I teams, everybody. And we focus just on this project and we find ways to make it easier to get access to equipment. We find ways to save money, Nate. We worked on uh, those walkways you see. We added those in because the consultants of original design have walls. I think they're over three feet thick. So we challenged them and we found a way to use those, what were just walkways to add in some more. And we saved about a million dollars in the structural cost on this project. So having that camp where you can really focus your ideas has been a great benefit for a lot of reasons. I'll wrap up by touching on COVID. This pandemic hit right in the middle of this thing. And obviously we were all pretty concerned about what that might mean. We do partnering on a frequent basis. Well, every quarter, generally. We bring in the ownership of the construction company. We are there, the engineers. We rank ourselves on how we're doing and we pride ourselves on being transparent and working as a team. And through that transparency, we have had schedule impacts, but we do not have any claims related to COVID. Um, and we were able to minimize those impacts. So it's been a real um, great way to approach construction and how we deal with our contractors. Next slide, please. So with that, and I know we're creeping into the lunch hour, I'm going to turn it over for questions um, and not go through any details on this one. Okay, Lori, I see your hand up. Hi, Rick, thank you for presenting that information. And, and, and indeed, thanks for all the presenters today. Um, you've all done a great job. Um, back several slides, you were showing the, the projected outlay and I, I missed the very beginning of your presentation. I had to um, step away, but I noticed that um, fiscal year 24 has a big drop and I just was curious about that. Yeah, thanks, Lori. That's a good question. I will say that at this point, we are showing somewhat of a drop, but we, as I mentioned, we really focus on balancing the CIP. So there are some major construction projects that are gonna occur in the next couple of years and you'll see that spike. I would anticipate that this time uh, next year, that will be more balanced out than what you see today. Um, and we are always constantly adjusting, you know, that CIP. It's, Okay, thank you. A little you. shocking how unstatic it can actually be. Nate, did you want to add anything to no, that? Yeah, or you that? Yes, please. If you could go to the next slide, please. And, and that's a great question. And if you see fiscal year 23 is even higher. So what we will try to do is to see how much of that fiscal year 23 we can defer even further. So we tend to be conservative and say we're, we're just in time. What we think is just in time today in a couple of years. When we get closer, we reevaluate it. If we can, we push it out even further. So that's what I would expect that 23, some of that cost will get in, pushed into 24 because that's our strategy. Yeah. Likewise, I didn't show 26 because it's 55 and I didn't want to scare anybody. So <laughs> we'll be working to change that one too. Um, I'd just like to say one more thing. Um, I want to thank all your staff and uh, folks for presenting three years worth of information because I was really curious about, you know, the changes in staffing during the COVID year. So that's very illustrative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other hands. Is there anybody else that has a question or are we about ready for lunch, folks? <laughs> I think everybody needs to stand up and walk around a little bit. I don't know about you, but I definitely feel the need there. So um, we are what? We are 1215, it looks like. So um, I guess we should have an hour on the schedule. Was this about 15 minutes behind? If we keep up, maybe we won't fall back any worse unless Mark is going to correct me here. <laughs> well, the one question I would ask of, of you, Chair, and the Commission is whether or not if you prefer to take 45 minutes and then we can try to get back on schedule. But that is up to the Commission on, on what their preference is. I vote for 45 minutes. <laughs> Well, why don't, we, why don't we do that then? Why don't we shoot for uh, coming back at one right on the schedule and we'll uh, see how we do, okay? Good, thank you everybody. Thank you.
Um, I probably like to test the uh, the the sound. So I see the picture now. Okay. Just want to test the the voice. Okay. How do I do that? You want to test your voice if it's working. Yeah. We can hear you so, just fine. Oh hi. Oh, they can hear you. Okay, great. Are you able to hear me? This is Mark Frank. Hi, Mark. Yes, sir. I think, okay. Thank you, Sean. Can you let me back in, Kevin? Uh, Mark, you are back in. You just got to turn on your camera. Thank you. It says you cannot start your video because the host stopped it. Oh. There you are. Thank you. Yeah. When we broke from lunch, you didn't turn it off, so I turned it off just to <laughs> protect you there. You didn't want to watch me eat lunch. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. Hey, Mark. Yes, sir. What's the deal with everybody wearing a tie to work today? You know, Mike, we've been wearing a tie every day through the entire pandemic. Just really? To, yeah. I am so proud of you guys. Actually, I think that's just so wrong. <laughs> I mostly wear jeans. <laughs> yeah, just so you know, I have shorts on. So. Oh, sure you do. I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, commissioners in that, the we are back on the YouTube. So as soon as uh, Chair Weller goes back, we can get back to the presentation. So. Commissioner Willie, Commissioner Rogers, Commissioner Fai, are you back with us? <laughs> and Chair Weller, are you back with us? Just getting there. <laughs> All right. Here too, if I can figure out how to unmute myself. And... <clears throat> 
take myself off of camera. You are good to go, Commissioner Fye. So Chair Weller, we are live back on YouTube. So back to you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And welcome back. That was quick for those of us actually stepped out <laughs> and to get back. Um, of course, what's the first item up? I've got it labeled on my agenda as EATS. So I, <laughs> E-A-T-S. <laughs> that's, that's kind of an appropriate acronym, I guess. So uh, Diane, I think that brings us back to you. Thank you, Chair Weller. Good afternoon and welcome back from lunch. Um, this next two presentations are going to be about our two newest business units and um, let's get going. So next slide, please. So now that we're in this, I guess you call it achievement of our golden anniversary of 50 years as a utility, we're at middle age and this is when things begin showing their age and they begin to wear out. So this is a critical time when utilities begin to struggle with the weight of the financial management of funding capacity projects to keep up with their growing communities and their operations and maintenance, plus the technology changes that are needed to occur because of increased regulatory requirements. So during this golden age, there's also an added weight that many utilities struggle. And it's really about adequately planning and sequencing your asset renewal programs to optimize when asset components need to be repaired and maintained versus when they need to be replaced. So in this middle age that we are in, we find ourselves also coupled with our reduced pay-as-you-go revenue that's being anticipated over the next 20 years of almost $62 million. So this presents both a challenge as well as an opportunity for the team at Clean Water Services to navigate together. The economic recovery from the pandemic will require our whole team to be innovative and in finding cost savings and to have all of our investments very well sequenced, planned and coordinated. So in order to meet this challenge, we have created a new business unit by aggregating existing team members from across the district. But in particular, in this first phase, we're aggregating the staff that has worked in water resources recovery and in utility operations with some new business focuses to develop an integrated um, enterprise-wide asset management program to navigate mm. challenges. So the enterprise-wide asset management will work with all other teams in an integrated fashion, right? Because our o &M services focus on the day-to-day -day operations and maintenance activities to keep existing equipment running. Our capital engineering programs focus on project delivery of master planning and capacity the increasing projects that are, whether they're new pipes, pumping systems, treatment technology changes or new treatment facilities. And our capital program looks at um, planning for new equipment. So the enterprise asset and technical services team will provide district-wide integration of those things that are technical services related to mechanical, electrical, and instrumentation to really leverage these technical services across the district-wide operations and maintenance activities. Automation and control systems have moved beyond just the water resource recovery facility to pump stations and into our conveyance systems and storm systems. So we really need to leverage our automation and control systems capability of this team, as well as the need to manage across the district, the maintenance and the services and the planning for renewal of all of our district-wide buildings and other facilities. So this is a very important next phase for the district and the formation of this business union for the district. I've asked Jennifer Toe, who's worked a long time in uh, water resource recovery to integrate district-wide these programs that she nurtured and fostered there that will be able to be expanded enterprise-wide. I also want to recognize the work that the other teams are working on in the area of asset management, such as field operations and the, the leadership of Ryan Sandu and Paul Ortiz and Wei Denny. They've begun to develop an asset management system for our pipeline linear systems as well as all of the other business groups, whether it's app or digital solutions, they're all looking at um, what's needed for asset renewal of their existing equipment. So in coming years, we'll also look at integrating asset management planning across the district with all of the, the business units. 
I would like to introduce Jennifer To, our services manager, to share with you the program elements and highlights for this very first phase of the creation of this new business uh, unit. So with that, I turn this over to Jennifer To and her team. Thank you, Diane. Um, I appreciate for sharing why we create the Enterprise Access and Technical Service Business Unit. It's a good timing um, because last year we celebrate our 50 years anniversary at Clean Water Services. And this is an outstanding milestone in many ways. However, it also reminds us that as we grow, our infrastructure and access are aging. So we need to be more vigilant than ever in managing our assets for reliable service to last as long as possible and to replace them just in time, which is why we create a, a new dedicated business unit to consolidate it efforts district-wide. Could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, our budget cover on page 153 to 167. Being new this year, we have no budget history, only data for FY22. However, like Anne mentioned, the numbers come from transferring costs from existing groups coming from water resource recovery and utility operation and service with no increase in number of staff. Next slide, please. Beside the admin group, um, we have four programs. The access management program, maintain access, perform condition assessment and life cycle analysis, and plans for future replacement renewal of access. The control system program, provide automation for all four water resource recovery facilities and telemetry to monitor remote pumping station and conveyance system. The technical support program provide mechanical, electrical, and instrumentation controls technical expertise in support of the operating programs. And facility program provide management of the occupied buildings and maintenance of the unoccupied process equipment buildings. Next slide, please. We have the same drivers as the other business units, growth, regulation, and access management. Growth for us, it means we keep getting new assets added to our inventories. About 300 pieces of equipment added to inventory each year. Regulation for us means we need to comply with life and safety codes. For example, NFPA 820 is the National Fire Protection Association code that we use to determine classify hazard classification for our water resource recovery facilities. And access management means replacing or renewing access before they wear out. Next slide, please. So we have four programs that we would like to share highlights. Access management, control system, technical support, and facilities. And for the next slide, I would like to introduce John Nice, Access Store Manager, to share the accomplishment that we have for the Access Management Program. John? Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so beginning in 2018, we took on a major project to migrate our computerized maintenance management system from Tabor to Lucidy. Uh, we currently have records for over 15,000 assets and attempt to cause the least amount of disruption to our operations and maintenance staff, we needed a smooth transition from the old to the new software. Rather than hiring Lucidity as a consultant to do the migration for us, we took on the migration work ourselves by utilizing our staff's skills and capabilities. This also gave us a chance to learn and set up the system in a way that works best for us and to become experts with the application in order to provide in-house support. We also saved a substantial amount of money by doing the migration internally. The core team planned the migration project from A to Z, cleaned up obsolete equipment records, standardized maintenance and work order procedures, developed standard procedures for recording maintenance data, set, set up pilot testing with selected o and user groups, provided initial training and continuing training to each and every user. With COVID, most training sessions were conducted 
through WebEx and the small groups, spending more than 400 hours. We knew the staff were ready when they said, let's rip the bandage off and do it once and for all and migrate. So on August 3rd, 2020, the entire Lucidity system went live and has been working well ever since. But for us, the project wasn't done. Post-migration, our team continues to obtain feedback from all users, prioritize improvements to implement, provide additional training as needed, uh, continue learning how this CMMS software can assist us to manage, protect, monitor, and develop good replacement plans for our existing assets accordingly. Um, the slide that you see um, represents our plan and the time it took to make the transition. Uh, it was 12 months to evaluate different software packages. We met with various users uh, around the area for input to, and ended up selecting Lucidity. Uh, six months to evaluate our data, plan the transfer and define goals for proper asset management objectives. Um, it took us 18 months for software setup, data migration, testing and training. We went live in August of 2020 and, in, and are still continuing improvements based on user input and asset management goals. And I will be handing off the next slide to Brandon Wick, who is our senior field engineer, automation and controls. Thanks, John. Um, so control systems manages the design, development and deployment of the district's automation and process data information systems. Uh, this includes uh, programmable logic controllers, uh, programming or PLC programming. PLCs are the uh, devices that monitor and operate uh, the equipment and instrumentation for all the various processes at our facilities and larger pump stations. Um, we also design and develop the supervisory control and data acquisition system known as SCADA. The SCADA system includes the interface screens, notification systems and data analysis tools that provide operations, maintenance, analysts, and management with relative actionable information to aid in decision-making. Our team strives to deploy automation solutions that provide a reliable, informative, and maintainable system to support the wide-ranging goals of the district from permit compliance to energy efficiency and innovation. Uh, one of the many focuses of our team is to, to meet these goals is the timely and efficient upgrade of our legacy systems that are outside of planned capital improvement projects. Uh, this year, one of those opportunities we'll have for continued improvement is the planned exchange of ownership of the Austera control system, HMI SCADA system, and process data system from Austera to Clean Water Services. Uh, due to the manufacturer's obsolescence of the Austera control system and the proprietary software currently in use, we have been planning a project to convert the system to our modern standard platform in a cost-effective way and bring the programming for the process up to current district standards by October of this year. Once completed, the system will be maintainable into the future, provide substantial increased access and visibility of the process for staff and enable future modification to facilitate process improvement. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about control systems. And with that, I'll hand it back to Jennifer. Thank you, Brandon. Um, so I'd like to talk about the technical support uh, program. Um, I would like to share the example project for this program. Uh, Durham backwash pumping modifications project. Excuse me, Jennifer. Lori has her hand up and it sounds like you're gonna start a new section. So maybe Oh. Is your question is your question appropriate now, Lori, or can you wait? Yes, thank you. And th sorry, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt your presentation. Oh, not at um, all. I was wondering about the new software. It sounds expensive and lovely, and whether there's uh, will be um, opportunities for other groups within Clean Water Services to use that in the future, or is it just really specific to what you're doing? Okay, um, I would like to take this. Actually, the district already use a. Uh, LUCD for a few of, they already use that software already. So when we do the evaluation, fill up with one of our um, existing client that we consult with and beside talking with other um, uh, utility that we um, in the evaluation itself. So yes, it's become going to be district-wide uses amongst, among us, yes. Thanks. Uh, 
All right, do you have any more questions? That's all I see, Jennifer, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, for the technical support, um, I would like to share the uh, the project at Durham Backwash Pumping Modifications. Uh, Durham has effluent filters that wastewater flow through by gravity to filter out fine solids. When they get too dirty, the backwash pump reverse the flow to the filters and wash the solid back to the plant. Early 1993, when the pump was installed, the technology was limited. The design used control valves to throttling the flow with large 4160 volt motors. This design work, but is subject to water hammer when the valve get out of adjustment. We decided we can do better. Can you go next slide, please? Rather than replace the entire system, we determined the pump was still in good condition and be used. The best way to prevent water hammer was to install variable frequency drives, VFDs, to precisely control the speed, the backwards flow ramps up and down. However, the 4160 volt VFD are expensive to purchase and maintain. So our innovation was to convert the motor to 480 volts with fast standard equipment. And these backward pumps are critical for meeting permit. So the conversion had to be done with minimum downtime and close coordination with operations. The planning and design were done in-house. The motors and VFD were pre-purchased a contract did install the installation and our programmer um, provide the much improved control loop. The work is complete and the backwards con control is now smooth and effective. And you can see from this slide here, the motors shown in this slide here is a lot smaller, much, much smaller than the picture. If you can go back to the other uh, previous slide, a lot larger motor that we have here. So this is a great collaboration in-house project that uh, our, our in-house engineer staff working together with o and staff to complete this work. Can you go next slide, please? And next one. So with that, I would like to introduce Mark Frank, building a facility service manager to share the accomplishment for the facility program. Mark. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, during this past year's pandemic and wildfires, it's been a very busy time for the uh, facilities team. I'm proud to say the team was on site every day, maintaining the district's facilities in operational condition. Uh, today, I'm going to describe just a few of the COVID-related measures the team accomplished during this time. Um, at the ABC facility, we implemented glass uh, cubicle stackers, which extended the existing uh, height of the cubicle walls and those were put in place to uh, increase the physical barrier between employees' workspaces, while at the same time allowing light to flow through the work area. Uh, the team also implemented a number of numerous uh, physical distancing measures. Uh, these included uh, hand sanitization stations, plexiglass shields at publicly accessible areas like reception desks and permits counters. Uh, we've deployed signage and decals throughout the facilities as a reminder to staff to maintain distances. The team also led the district-wide uh, effort for personal protective equipment. Uh, the PPE team uh, procured, distributed, and in the case of the CW, CWS wipes and hand sanitizers, actually manufactured those items. And this PPE was critical in allowing district employees to fulfill their job responsibilities. Next slide, please. Out at the Ripple facility, uh, we leveraged available floor space and repurposed existing furniture to create a physical distancing, works, physical distancing workspace for 20, uh, 20 person UOPS construction crew. Uh, this effort also include, included a secure parking area for their construction equipment. And then since the Ripple facility did not have an existing locker room with showers, uh, this team designed, procured, and installed a mobile shower trailer that's located on the south end of the building now. Also at Ripple, leveraged available floor space to construct a new laboratory for the molecular biology lab. Uh, this is a lab used by Dr. Williamson's team to sample wastewater for the COVID RNA. And then lastly, uh, we installed higher, level, higher levels of filtration throughout all of the HVAC systems 
typically going from a MERV 8 all the way up to a MERV 13 to 15 uh, level of filter, which uh, purify, purifies our air even more. And that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to hand back off to Jennifer. Thank you, Mark. So do you have any questions for us? I don't see any raised hands. I don't know if there's somebody else. Maybe they can. Oh, there we go. Catherine, I'm at your Harrington. So um, I remember, I think it was last year or it could be two years ago when we were hearing about new uh, DIY sensors that were being uh, constructed and utilized by clean water services. Does the uh, maintenance or the tracking of those sensors fall under this team or a different team, I, and I'm not quite sure that they even count as an asset uh, because of the cost basis. So, Diane, what am I forgetting? Yeah, so the DIY sensor program, you're going to hear more about it from uh, Dr. Ting Lu. Um, it's currently in research and innovation still. So the moment that it translates from innovation and then it's something that's part of our day-to-day -day operations, then it would begin translating over to Jennifer Toe and the team's work. So we've got both ends, right? The, the uh, innovation and research and then the translation to day-to-day um, -day operations. But thank you for that question. Great. Well, thank you. And, and I want to thank you, Jennifer, John, Brandon, and Mark. Uh, I, I really appreciated the different uh, examples that you gave us and uh, helped bring to life the, the practical work that you do uh, all throughout the course of the year so that Clean Water Services is a successful 24 by 7 agency. So job well done. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. to be proud of. We appreciate it. I also wanted to add that the work that this team did to transfer our data systems from Tabware to the Lucidy system has been an amazing uh, transformation. This is a critical regulatory um, compliance component because we have to be able to justify to DEQ in the event of an equipment failure that it was somehow beyond our control. And the um, records and the work that, um, that the operations and maintenance folks do, as well as John Nice's ability to, um, to really systemize it across all of the facilities has just been amazing and wonderful. And with Jennifer being able to uh, bring that um, team together to um, make this happen for the district. So it's one of those things I uh, can sleep well at night that we have um, this system um, now up and running to fruition. So thank you, Jennifer, and, and to your entire team. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate it. Well, Diane, it looks like you're leading off the next section as well. Yes. So the second newest business unit is our regional utilities services group. And Joe Gall will be starting with us and full time in June. He's already uh, getting up to speed and the team is very much looking forward to um, having him uh, work with us to develop this new business unit. Next slide, please. The regional utilities services business unit will manage the regional services intergovernmental agreements as well as our relationships and the administration of those relationships. We're going to really do a good job of integrating our regional community and economic development planning and services because that's going to help drive um, the decisions in the district as it relates to our capacity management as well as integrating the systems planning and integrated planning. And Mike McKillop, if um, you recall early in the meeting, he asked, how are we going to make sure that we maintain the relationships and the connections that we have? So with Damon and with um, Andy Braun and with Joe Gall, um, it's really going to create that continuity of work and they're going to continue to work with Ryan Sandu um, as part of our operations and maintenance group. And, and um, so I hope, uh, Mike, you can uh, have your heart know well that we're um, continuing that continuity that we have been so well known for. Next slide, please. So with the Regional Utility Services Group, it's an aggregation of staffing that comes from the utility operations program um, that you saw earlier from Nate, that it's being um, 
um, integrated into this group, as well as bringing the work from Carol Murdoch that was in um, incubation in the CEO's office. She's now going to be working in this regional utilities services group. So when you look on the next slide as to what their drivers are, um, Oh, I guess in, in this case, it's talking about the actual units themselves and then we'll go into the drivers. So um, maybe if you can flip to the next slide for me before we do this one, there we go. So with the regional services, um, they're very much at the front end of um, the impacts of growth and how we articulate um, compliance um, in the district. So as it relates to growth, it's uh, coordinating with our co-implementers on development services, as well as the long range planning. But really it's about integrating our watershed based permit requirements um, through development with our design and construction standards and through permitting across the region. Our infrastructure planning coordination uh, with our co-implementers is really key to economic um, development in the region. And the team's gonna share with you uh, a major um, expansion project that supports the uh, North Hillsboro development with a pump station. And local improvement districts and reimbursement districts continue to be um, part of the work that we do with the community who's currently unsewered. So in our next slide, if you go back one, there we go. So it is, um, there are three groups. Um, within administration, um, it also includes um, Joe and the work that um, Carol is doing um, on our integrated planning, as well as the actions to define our long range um, climate adaptation strategies, as well as our roadmap development and policy development and integrated planning and the integrant governmental agreements. Then the next two areas are development services with Damon and um, systems planning with Andy and they're working broadly um, as an integrated team to deliver those services. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Carol Murdoch, um, our business practice leader, Damon Reishi, our planning and development services um, ma uh, division manager, and Andy Braun, our systems planning division manager, to talk specifically about some highlights for their programs. And I believe we're going to start with Damon first. Uh, Diane, uh, Commissioner Rogers, did you have a question? Yes. So that we're all using terms uh, the same, you, you use regional in a number of, of bullets. Um, uh, is regional within the district? And if so, is that within the cities as well? Uh, tell me how you define regional. What does that mean? Yes, regional is from the context of the services that clean water services provide. So the regional services as it relates to this group is the intergovernmental agreements that we have um, with the large cities, um, as well as um, intergovernmental agreements with Portland is another example. We also have intergovernmental agreements to provide the local services as well as the regional services um, for the smaller cities. So when we use regional services, we're referring to those services that involve the large treatment capacity, the pump station, the large um, diameter pipelines, the uh, permitting as it relates to uh, compliance, regulatory compliance, all of those, um, those activities associated with running of the utilities. Then we have services that we provide directly to um, the smaller cities as it relates to planning, um, their uh, building of the um, infrastructure. So that's sort of the differential. And I, I talked about that a little bit earlier um, in my opening um, comments about really delineating between regional and local. But this group specifically is focused on those regional um, service deliveries. Is there any nexus, just to follow up, is there any nexus between the retail side, which is the provision of, of, of uh, sewer services uh, and, and what you call a regional approach, because uh, obviously if if the local guys put a 12 inch pipe and we have a 16 or 24 that hooks into it, that's a little bit of an adapter. So uh, what, what, what kind of activity is done to coordinate that? So as part of the um, service planning group that Andy Braun is um, 
the division manager of. That's where that coordination would occur, right? So we have the people who are um, delivering on the capital projects themselves. So that's within utility operations. And then you have that integration space with planning with um, Andy Braun, who's then coordinating with the rest of the groups. Um, so there are, there are two kinds of intergovernmental agreements that um, our board is aware of. There's the intergovernmental agreements for the large cities, and then there's the intergovernmental agreements for the smaller cities where we provide um, the full level of service. Okay. Thank you, Roy. Um, next step, I'm going to turn it over to Damon to talk to you about development services and um, we can probably elaborate more, uh, Roy, um, for Damon and um, Andy and uh, Carol on that theme. Thank Thanks. you, Damon. Yep. Thanks, Diane. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to, I'll, I'll just mention too, uh, if you're following along in your budget books that you can find the development services budget items uh, on page 192 and 193 of the budget book. And overall, the, the regional utility services business unit is included in pages 185 through 195. Um, the the development services group includes both regional elements, which are those district-wide services that we provide, as well as local elements for those services that are focused on that urban unincorporated part of the county, as well as the small cities. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go over all of the bullet items I have listed here, but I do want to highlight a few. And I want to provide some uh, statistics that may give some context for the work that development services does. Uh, at the regional level, development services supports our city partners by helping to coordinate infrastructure, planning, and service availability in support of new development. We also support development regionally by providing feedback on county and city land use reviews. Uh, this year, we've done about 160 of those reviews. We do the environmental vegetated corridor service provider letter reviews for the entire district, uh, including pre-screen reviews. All of those reviews this year were over 1,100. Uh, and of course, we provide support to um, our city partners uh, that also do plan review and inspection per our standards. So we provide them with training and, and back them up on technical issues. Development services staff also looks for opportunities to connect with developer or city projects at, um, with developer and city projects, as well as projects done by our partners, trying to find those connections. One way that we've, uh, institutionalize that is with our vegetated corridor enhancement fee. The fee allows developers with sites adjacent to CWS enhancement projects to meet their veg corridor enhancement requirements by paying a fee and combining their corridor with the larger clean water services enhancement project. It's been very popular with the development community as an option. And this year we collected over $230,000 uh, of that fee that will go directly towards uh, clean water services enhancement projects on the ground. Um, development services is also the group that's responsible for administering the design and construction standards. And of course, in the past few years, we've had a number of uh, updates to the standards. Um, Although ensuring these standards successfully result in functional, maintainable, and permit compliant infrastructure takes careful coordination with our other business units, as well as with our county and city partners, and of course, the development community. Next slide, please. Uh, Lori has her hand up if we want to ask oh, a question. Sure. sure. 
Just a quick question. It's nice to see you, Damon. Thanks for your service to this committee. Sure. Um, my question is, um, I just, the item on annual, let's see, the um, erosion control inspection for Tualatin and, and Tigard, um, given the um, new mercury TMDL and its association with erosion, I, I'm wondering whether you're seeing any um, role for clean water services uh, expanding that in the future. Well, I would have to refer that to Bob Baumgartner, most likely. Uh, that's not my area of expertise. I don't know if we want to promote Bob or maybe connect with Listen, him. We yet. can just move on and I can ask separately. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, so looking at the, the local elements, um, the majority of the district's public conveyance infrastructure is built by the development community. And that represented over four and a half million dollars worth of new infrastructure this year in those unincorporated urban unincorporated areas and small cities. And it's development services staff that does the, the permitting and inspection review for all of that infrastructure. And we processed over um, 500 limited development review and site development permit applications this year and did over 10,000 erosion control inspections. A big part of the local, or a big part of the local permitting function is providing support to our applicants as they work through the process. We've referred to this as our concierge service. Um, and it's, it's kind of distributed amongst our, our staff, all of our plan reviewers. Uh, it's, it makes up a significant portion of the time that goes into plan review in particular. Uh, and it includes things like pre-design meetings, taking those phone calls and, and corresponding with applicants on, on email about the particulars of their projects and how to be successful. Our goal in development services is really to work with applicants to figure out how their projects can be successful while also meeting the design and construction standards. Another local element within the development services division is the private water quality facility inspection program. This program is a requirement of our watershed based permit and follows up with property owners to ensure that their private facilities are being maintained. A big part of what we do here is education, making sure that they understand what these facilities are and how they can uh, maintain them in a way that will be cost effective and also provide that environmental benefit. Uh, we currently have over 900 private facilities in that unincorporated area and another 200 in the pipeline. Next slide, please. As mentioned before, an objective for the Regional Utility Services Business Unit is to help the district to provide services aligned with the goals of our public and private partners, as well to align as well as to align our policy and investments to support the economic health of the region and restore watershed health. One of the more challenging situations we have in trying to bring all of those different objectives into alignment is with stormwater management. And in particular, fitting stormwater solutions into development sites. So here I've got a couple of different pictures uh, that shows where uh, working with the development community and our other jurisdictional partners, this has been successfully done. On the left-hand side is Bethany Crest in North Bethany. And on the right-hand side is River Terrace West in Tigard. In both cases, we worked with the developer and in the case of River Terrace, the city of Tigard, um, to figure out how these facilities could be amenities of the development while still meeting our standards. 
In the Bethany Crest development, the stormwater management facility was made to look like a park setting along a drainage. But in fact, this area is actually created out of upland. It was never uh, a wetland or stream area. Um, this stormwater solution ends up serving as a trail and a park open space area for this community. In River Terrace, they blended the stormwater solution into the edge of an existing riparian corridor, and they actually used the detention area to create habitat for wildlife. In both cases, the development is oriented towards these stormwater solutions because they're a central focus point. They're an amenity of that development. Achieving solutions like this requires cooperation and creative thinking on the part of district staff, city and county staff, and the development team. Uh, we continue to be dedicated towards working towards these type of solutions in the future. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Andy Braun, the division manager for systems planning to tell you about that group. Great, thank you, Damon. Well, I'm back again, this time as a different division manager. I was uh, talking with Mark Jockers at lunchtime and he said, well, Andy, you're gonna have to switch ties at, at lunch. So uh, you're coming back as somebody different. And I kind of laughed and, and said, well, the board is very comfortable or familiar with wearing multiple hats. Uh, right now I'm wearing multiple ties or, or multiple hats. But the transition that we're going through is really reflecting uh, this change in the, in the importance of uh, emphasizing our relationships with our, our partners. Uh, right now, the work that is, is leading into regional utility services has been uh, coordinated out of conveyance engineering. But with this new renewed uh, look and, and relationship building, it's really something that, that needs two different positions uh, to, to be able to give that the proper amount of attention to it. So I'll talk a little bit uh, about this. Um, we will, in conveyance engineering, I, I talked about a couple of district led projects. And what we're gonna focus on here in regional utility relations is more of the city led projects or and or the district led projects that are serving at a regional level. So as we refer to systems planning, um, as Commissioner Rogers mentioned, and we talk about uh, regional, it's really looking at this regional system and it's doing that coordination between what are the projects do, or what are the cities doing at the local scale as well as we rely on the cities to help implement some of the regional program. As far as funding is concerned, we consider regional uh, to be pipe sizes larger than 12 inches in diameter. As far as functional application and implementation, the district takes the lead on all projects 24 inches and larger in diameter but the cities often implement the projects between 12 inches up to 24 inches. So all that work needs to be coordinated. So three different areas, and, and this is kind of focusing again on the strategic uh, initiatives that we're working on. The, the first is looking at um, some planning activities and the necessary work in association with growth. One example here is the coordination that we're doing with the city of Tigard and, the, and King City, as far as their new urban growth boundary areas and the planning activities in the coordination of both drainage as it's coming off of Bull Mountain and through King City, as well as how do you coordinate the sanitary sewer uh, uh, transition as it, as it flows downhill uh, from Bull Mountain and Tigard uh, into King City. The second area is talking about the economic growth part of it. And Rick uh, Shanley talked about our many meetings over the last number of years uh, with the city of Hillsboro and the North Hillsboro Industrial Pump Station. Um, that greatly exemplifies the strategy uh, part of this where 
if it was purely implementation, we would have responded quickly to Hillsborough's request for, oh, please, uh, please build a 10 million uh, gallon per day pump station. Working strategically with them over the period of time, just as Rick uh, explained, we, we were able to right size this and meet the, the demands as they are coming on with the industrial development. Third area gets back to the integrated water uh, management and resiliency. I think this is highlighted by our current work with the city of Sherwood in the planning and implementation of the uh, Brookman sewer uh, and stream enhancement project, which will serve the uh, Brookman area, uh, annexation area, as well as West Sherwood by extending a sewer up the Cedar Creek corridor. So all three of these uh, implement or identify that regional aspect of uh, service delivery. Just again, kind of referring to the budget, the systems planning budget in your books is on page 194 and 195. But again, really a lot of this work is associated with the capital projects, which are listed in your appendix. Those projects, you'll see actually uh, more than 15 projects representing over $16 million um, where they're either being implemented by the cities or uh, by our pump station crews, uh, which is, is part of the regional program. Next slide, please. So first I wanna mention some of the work with the uh, growth and expansion. I mentioned the North Hillsboro pump station project. There are actually uh, five projects going on, five pump station projects, anywhere from the planning level through construction. Some of those projects are very locally based and only serve a small part within one city. Others, uh, other parts of those projects serve, uh, have service areas that span multiple, uh, multiple cities and uh, really serves a, a regional piece of infrastructure. I mentioned the projects that the cities implement on a regional basis, that, that 12 to 24 inch. There are 77 uh, gravity conveyance projects where we're collaborating with our city partners uh, with the financial share of the project. You'll see uh, some, of those, some of those listed uh, in Tualatin, Beaverton, and Hillsborough. Uh, but we, are, we do work very closely with each of the cities. As a matter of fact, this morning, one of our committees, uh, it's called the Capital Improvement uh, Plan Prioritization Committee, which includes a representative from each of our seven large cities, as well as the district. We meet monthly and put together the annual capital improvement plan, which goes into the budget. Just this morning, we were finalizing that plan for this coming year. Next slide, please. Okay, we also, it's not only the growth and expansion aspects, but we've also talked about asset management. So the, the program also involves the rehabilitation and maintenance programs for those sewers larger than 12 inch up to 24 inch. And there are an additional eight projects that are being worked on either by the district or by the cities, uh, which are rehabilitation or inflow and infiltration abatement projects. Those represent about four and a half million dollars this coming year. The second bullet highlighted there in, in black, the urban planning area agreements really emphasizes another critical part of our relationships um, and the infrastructure. I think this really emphasizes this change from what Nate described as uh, strategy and implementation uh, under the direction of the chief operating officer to the policy and strategy in the departments under the chief executive officer. Previously, if we had a sewer request for an unsewered area, which was right on the border or right on the boundary line of unincorporated area and the, in one of our cities, we would jump to it and say, okay, it looks like it's an unincorporated area. How do we go about providing sewer here? Is it a local improvement district or a reimbursement district? 
with this kind of change focus and look at our urban planning area agreements and the policy level, one of our first questions here is going to be, what, is, what do our agreements say? And what is the policy for serving this area as far as uh, regional service provision and local service provision? Is this a regional function in, or is this some one that should be uh, provided by our cities per the urban planning agreement? So that's a kind of a focus area and one of the high priorities within the uh, new RUSD uh, department. Next slide. Chair Harrington, uh, she has a question for you, Andy. Sure. I, I'm amused to um, see the Weibel Creek uh, trunk project. Uh, years ago, I had a farmer out there insist that it wasn't a stream, it was a ditch. Um, and I don't really know what a trunk looks like. Does it disturb the stream? I can't imagine it not. So thank you for that question. We're actually uh, working. This is a good example of another part of our program where this was not actually a rehabilitation part, uh, part of the program. This was economic expansion where we worked with the, both the city and the developer. Um, a developer was building his industrial site and needed to build the trunk sewer that will eventually serve that site and convey flow down to the uh, North Hillsboro pump station. So the developer built this large diameter sewer. It's a, a 21 inch sewer. While it is close to the stream corridor, you can uh, reflect and think that our streams represent the low part of the system, which is actually where our large diameter sewers run just for that sake of gravity. So they were actually able to work closely with uh, the development services group in planning this area um, so that it was not actually built directly in the corridor, which could potentially have uh, some adverse environmental impacts, but build it just outside the corridor. We look closely at those type of projects to derive the most environmental benefit. Sometimes it's avoidance uh, of working within a, a healthy streams corridor, Sometimes it actually provides an opportunity to do enhancement like we're doing out in the Cedar Mill Creek uh, that I talked about before, where we're actually in that corridor and part of the restoration will also provide enhancement. Is that able to answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. And Chair Harrington. Thank you. Andy, could you uh, run it by me again? What distinguishes rehabilitation from expansion? So rehabilitation is generally looking at um, lines that are in need of repair. Sometimes that's exhibited by excessive inflow and infiltration through cracks in the pipe or uh, bad joints uh, where we have root infiltration uh, or infiltration through roots that have gotten into the system. Uh, sometimes those uh, create blockages in the system. And just like we, uh, we were describing with asset management, as our assets are reaching 50 and more years older um, in the conveyance system, we need to rehabilitate those lines. The expansion, some of these end up being combined projects where we will actually replace, say, an 18-inch line, and we upsize that with a, call it a 24-inch line. The old system was in bad shape. It's being rehabilitated while at the same time adding that expanded capacity. Okay. Another very important part of this, I uh, focused heavily on the capital improvement side of it, but that's not the only part of our uh, regional cooperation. As Bob uh, Baumgartner discussed this morning, uh, there's a big compliance part here. And compliance with our permit isn't only the work that the district does, it's work that the, what we sometimes refer to as the big D, the big district, which means us and our partners. And they operate the programs that uh, Damon was describing as well. So part of this program is that operational aspect and working closely with the cities to make sure that our, we, the big district, is in compliance with our permit and we're uh, exercising our, our operations uh, per, per the permit uh, together 
uh, under the, the broad programs that, that the, and guidelines that the district has, has established in, in working with the cities. So that's really being done. Um, really the key to that is communication. And we've listed four different groups there that work uh, together on a regular basis. Uh, we, we meet essentially quarterly. We're actually changing that a, a little bit to emphasize different parts of those meetings. Um, part of a, a new one that's been established is this data innovation group. So one of those quarterly meetings is now focused on how do we uh, collect and uh, assemble this data for our uh, compliance uh, permit reporting. We have monthly meetings of the, of the co-implementers. We also, Ryan helps lead an operations managers group that meets regularly. And finally, we have annual trainings. Uh, one of them coming up is our annual sanitary sewer overflow and erosion control annual training uh, that we engage all of our, our co-implementers and their operational groups in doing. So really, in addition to those four, it's really complemented by countless individual contacts. So it's both the broad picture meeting regularly but uh, just many, many one-on-one -on -one individual contacts dealing with individual questions that might be uh, pertinent for those individual cities. So it's really a, a program that we're really looking forward to um, adding a new emphasis and we're looking forward to uh, Joe Gall coming on board with us and really getting underway with these activities. Be happy to answer any questions. And also uh, ready to turn it over to Carol Murdoch if there are not any questions. And Carol, is, Lo is, is, is Lori's hand up for some reason? Sorry, up from the previous question. I'll take it down. Oh, okay, I just want to make sure. All right, thank you. Carol, it's all yours. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Andy. Um, I want to talk about the integrated planning program that's underneath uh, Regional Utility Services. In the integrated planning program at CWS was created in order to better prepare the organization for what will be probably an uncertain future. As Diane mentioned this morning, CWS is indeed an organization of overachievers. So in the spirit of continuous improvement, the focus of integrated planning program is on increasing the existing level of integration in the flow of communication between strategic planning initiatives, the development of policy innovations, and project and program implementation with our community partners. One of the ways we're working towards closer integration is an emphasis on utilizing cross-functional interdisciplinary teams that will incorporate these strategic initiatives and policy innovations into the project planning and program implementation. Next slide, please. So in accordance with our watershed-wide regulatory permit that was secured through the good work of our regulatory affairs department, CWS currently conducts strategic planning activities in collaboration with our community partners that span the entire Tualatin Basin. Focusing on the integration of these strategic planning activities is intended to create greater efficiencies, reduce duplication of effort, ensure alignment across program areas and amplify the environmental and economic and community benefits um, that these projects would provide. But it's also about continuing to expand our thinking around existing policy that might present either a barrier or an opportunity to develop innovative approaches to, for working more closely with our community partners to create climate resiliency and to address social inequity. Essentially, this is about building on what we already do well, while recognizing that what we're doing now may not be enough to address the challenges that are coming. Next slide, please. In order to address these challenges, we need, to, we need a nimble workforce that can play multiple roles across the organization and is encouraged and empowered to follow their passion embrace innovative thinking and take on the role of a team leader, facilitator, community relationship builder, or subject matter expert. 
We're currently developing a training program that will be focused on individual growth and development, as well as team-based training that will strengthen cross-functional participation on integrated teams and emphasize the planning and delivery of multiple objective, multi-outcome-based projects and programs that provide value to the community. We intend to follow that up with training, that training with opportunities for employees to work collaboratively with others from different program areas and with our community partners who bring different viewpoints, perspectives, and opportunities that add to our ability to create innovative solutions to the wicked problems we're all facing. Next slide, please. So are there any questions for any of us, any three of us? I don't see any hands, Carol, thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Diane. We did, I think, promote um, Bob into the meeting room here so that he could address the mercury question as it related to erosion control. So Mark, do you know if Bob's here yet? I see him, the space form. Yes, Bob, can you hear us? Well, I guess we'll cycle back to him. So I'm sorry about that, Lori. We were trying to get you the broader answer, but I could provide an overview. Mercury is certainly a priority that needs to be um, managed on a basin-wide approach. So the pretreatment folks are focusing on um, sources like dentists and others that can help with good um, recycling of their materials. But as it relates to the watershed itself, um, mercury um, comes from the soil. So you're absolutely right. Um, erosion control, particularly the issues that we're facing in the basin that we don't quite yet have solutions for. And, and some of the environmental folks would call that mass wasting. You know, so large um, swaths of land that are um, currently um, eroding into the river. I think that's one of the future challenges to figure out um, solutions, but certainly the work that um, NSES is doing to stabilize the banks is a very important strategy, but there's certainly other places that uh, the Watershed Council, the Tualatin River Keepers, as well as all of our community partners and ourselves can work on. But mercury is a, a significant um, uh, challenge that we will all need to work on together. But you're right, it starts with um, erosion control. Thank you so Diane, much. Diane, this is Bob and I just, was able to unmute and get in. Is there anything I can help with? Bob, uh, I think Diane covered it, but thank you. Very good. My work here is done. <laughs> I, this is Catherine. I just want to add, I'm really glad that Lori asked that question because I had no idea that part of our mercury situation was coming from the soil. I had assumed it was from, you know, more of the human uses, as you say, like dentists, but also as a result of the acid rainfall or, or just the rainfall that we've been experiencing through our atmosphere uh, as it is one shared atmosphere across the planet. So thank you very much, Lori, for asking about that. Uh, because while I'd seen mercury in the document, I hadn't made the connection. So my, my science learning has continued through Clean Water Services. Thank you. And we'll go on to the um, home stretch here. Um, we're going to be looking at the business services business unit. So, um, it's comprised of all of the programs that support district-wide operations and services. And the full budget detail is found under the business services tabs. And it's pages 119 to 151 of the budget document. So next slide, please. Within the business services unit, um, there were a, with the realignment of programs, and you'll see it on the next slide, that there's a shift of six FTEs from transfers from other department as part of realigning programs. And there's a show of six new FTEs. But of the six F new FTEs, five of them are really conversions of temporary positions because the workload is well-defined and it's sustained for the long-term. And we do believe 
for the, the resiliency of clean water services, we need to do the conversion of these temporary positions into full-time positions. And we're very fortunate to um, be able to do that. Um, next slide, please. So within this business unit, there's the um, 12 different divisions. So it's the office of the CEO, it's our legal services team, our finance and accounting, our financial strategy and performance management, uh, government affairs, communications and community engagement, our human resources, our risk and insurance, our research and innovation program with digital solutions and business strategy and performance systems, and a group that is coming over from um, WRRD um, to us, which is the business opportunities and operations, and we'll be able to talk about why we did that shift. So on slide, uh, the next slide, uh, the Office of the CEO Program can be found on pages 126 and 127. So this is the team that's responsible to develop the district-wide strategy, strategic initiatives, and district-wide performance measurements um, with our board, as well as implementing the policy direction that comes from the board and our advisory input and recommendations from the Clean Water Services Advisory Commission. So we're responsible for the overall management of the district's operations, intergovernmental coordination, as well as the strategic administration of integrated planning and performance excellence. So within this budget, we have budgeted the CEO, the chief operating officer, the chief of staff, the chief of utility relations, and the program support specialist that's housed within the office of the CEO. But clearly, Kathy Lee here is our CFO, and uh, Jerry Linder is our general counsel. Um, they're, while they're budgeted um, within their uh, teams, um, they are certainly part of the office of the CEO. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Jockers, our chief of staff, to talk about the programs that are within his portfolio. Good, thank you, Diane. And if I could have the next slide, please. So broadly writ, the Government and Public Affairs Program includes these two budget items. These are uh, items that are on pages 130 through 133. It includes the Government Affairs Program as well as the Communications and Community Engagement Program. Um, these two programs are really spread over a number of services. There's obviously government, uh, state and federal government affairs work. There's also the work we do to, uh, for the board administration for board memos, coordinating all the work that comes to the board for uh, the Clean Water Services Advisory Commission administration as well. But we also have uh, communication, outreach, education. We support the capital program closely and then have a new uh, program that's really uh, emerged over the last year and a half or so as we take on a greater role in uh, equity, and culture and organizational development about how we provide the tools and the training district-wide to, to, to bring that one CWS approach that Diane spoke about earlier. And go to the next slide, please. So the government affairs program includes the state and federal legislative strategies, policy development and support, board communication administration, as well as CWAC. Our priorities here, as many of you know, is we are really focused on a federal basis on the Toilet and Joint Project and the funding elements associated with that, particularly with the WIFIA program and the WIN Act, which is part of the Title 16 uh, Bureau of Reclamation section. Um, also paying very close attention to the stimulus bills. Uh, the stimulus bill that was passed in late December, as well as the ARPA bill, both included for the first time ever uh, funding low in, for low income water and drinking water and sewer ratepayer assistance. Programs like that have been put in place for uh, um, energy, for heat and electricity for many, many years, but a program like that has never been stood up nationally or even locally uh, before. And as that, we've been acting both on a national basis to advocate for that for many, many years. But then as that funding comes into the state, where that, how that's going to be prioritized and distributed. We were fortunate last year to work closely with the CARES Act funding that we secured through uh, the Washington County Commissioners, thank you very much for here today, as our Board of Directors, to put together a low income rate payer assistance program and really stand that up. We stood that up in about six weeks. We worked with a community action organization 
to qualify and, and support people that have been impacted by the pandemic. Those are important pieces there. Um, on the state basis, um, we are active down in Salem, largely through our uh, organization with the Association of Clean Water Agencies, as well as through our relationship with the Washington County Government of Relations staff. I would say the highest and most immediate piece that we've got in the state right now is over the last two years, we've been working very, very hard to get a bill passed to address the disposal of wipes in the sanitary sewer system, and particularly their impact on our collection system. And more specifically, I don't have any of the graphic photos for you, I'm sorry, on our pump stations. As these clog these pump stations, and we've had that problem for many, many years, but it was just exaggerated in the pandemic as more and more people use these disposable wipes, put them down the drain, and we saw an increased frequency in terms of cleaning of those pump stations. So over the last couple of years, we've been working on a wipes bill. It's a labeling bill. Um, it passed the, the House 52 to 1, I think, and is uh, has a hearing in the, uh, the state Senate on Tuesday, which I will be uh, there testifying on behalf of both Clean Water Services as well as the Association of Clean Water Agencies. So if we can go to the next slide, I want to talk about the other element before I hand it over to our communication folks. The other piece that I mentioned before that we've stood up is this equity culture and organizational development about how do we nurture our workforce of the future through that learn, grow, and thrive piece that Diane talked about. And that's everything from promoting employee safety and resilience through engagement and learning and communication. It's about connecting remote and field and office workers um, the chair, the chair will recognize that we use this photo on the right a lot because it meant so much to us. This is part of what we call organizational culture is the chair came out and met with field operations. This was, boy, this seems like it was five years ago. I think it was last April, maybe, um, and met with field staff. To, so our staff can understand who our board is. And as part of that, we also have something called CEO engagements where Diane is out talking to staff. Now we're doing those things virtually. We also have Passport Experience, which is a peer-to-peer -peer learning program. We're just starting to bring that back again now with project tours and demonstrations and conversation circles to bring people around a number of different issues that are pandemic driven and, and in other ways, in other issues. So if we go to the next slide, uh, a lot of the reason that this program is really coming together to fruition is really to move our equity program forward. This is a program that we launched last year, really following in the footsteps in a lot of ways of, of the leadership that the county had about how we go through an equity journey. And I do call it a journey. Um, I think some people thought it was um, a statement that we adopted. And we said, no, this is, this is meaningful learning. It's a journey about how we walk through that. We have been in the data gathering and consultation phase this year and starting to work into more of the, the leadership and employee learning phase in, in the coming year, starting to really have those uh, uh, conversations with employees about what they want to see, what they understand, and pieces like that. So with that, I want to hand it over to my communications and marketing manager, Karen DeBaker, who will talk about the other elements of this program. Thanks, Mark. You know, our whole government and public affairs program is about solving problems and providing value. And we do that through listening and through research. Um, our biggest thing is we really want to get to the heart of folks' values and motivations and the barriers um, that they're currently experiencing. And in doing so, that builds credibility and support for our role in protecting public health and the environment. And, you know, the pandemic has really, really, really put a hyper focus on public health, nature, sustainability, looking towards the future, and meaningful human connections. And 
all of that isn't surprising to us. I mean, that's what we're all about. It's the lens through which we've been operating for 50 plus years. So starting with our education program, we, we really haven't skipped a beat. Um, even while our students were socially distanced and you know doing their schoolwork at home or in the classroom, um, we were keeping up with all of that. Um, we delivered, you know, asynchronous and synchronous programs through partnerships. Um, one especially you'll see right there, uh, a partnership with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron. That was a story walk that we did at Fern Hill. Um, we, we, we have now a virtual treatment facility tour. Of course, we'd love folks to take that in person, but we do have that now available that will take us through the future. Um, and as especially as we've learned you know, through this pandemic, uh, nature is a healer, and that's what Fernhill Wetlands has provided. Um, yes, it's a it's a showcase of natural treatment, um, but it's also a key uh, recreation source and its folks' key connection to nature. So, in fact, over the past seven months, we've done tracking in the parking lot. We have tracked an average of roughly, oh, you know, 765 people a day, and that resulted from 280 vehicles that have come through the parking lot. On January 23rd, that was our biggest day, so to speak. So there, there was definitely a need for respite that day. Uh, we counted 722 vehicles, which translates into roughly 1,949 people. So it's it's been a busy place. Um, and you'll see in there from that photo, that's our education station and our volunteer station. They're not open yet, the bathrooms aren't open yet, but all of that still, you know, doesn't mean people aren't coming out to Fern Hill, which is, again, a respite for many, many folks. Okay, next slide, please. So through our communications and marketing program, um, we meet customers where they are and we provide and solve their problems. Uh, one of that was through the utility assistance program through the CARES funding that Washington County received. Um, we created a marketing campaign with other water utilities around the region. It was a great opportunity to partner and we called that our water utilities care campaign. And then of course the five letter word wipes. So for the pandemic, wipes has been a good thing. And again, Bob used his uh, show and tell. I have my show and tell. These can be considered things that shouldn't be flushed as well, facial tissues. So really, really educating folks that while wipes have has had their shining moment this past year during the pandemic, very clean, that good five letter word clean, it, 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 they've been a four letter word for us and that's been clog. So really, really educating folks not to dump that stuff in the toilet, to throw it in the trash instead. And finally highlighting our heroes, that's been huge. Um, our essential workforce, like we've been saying 24 um, seven, that's been going on for 50 plus years, not just during the pandemic, it will continue to go on past the pandemic and hopefully um, will help us survive through a future challenge or crisis. Um, and again, all of that, you know, it helps build credi credibility and support for our role. And all of this is very helpful in nurturing our future workforce and attracting future workforce heroes, whether they're a fourth grader attending a Tualatin Basin school right now, or they're in the middle of their 40 year career across the country. So with that, speaking of attracting new and taking care of our current hero-laden workforce, I'd like to introduce our uh, Human Resources and Risk Management Director, Holly Dober. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Mark, for um, taking us through this journey. Um, so good afternoon. Um, I do manage the Human Resources and the Risk Insurance Management Programs. Um, budget information for our programs can be found on pages 134 to 137. Um, there are 10 employees within the two programs, six in human resources and four in risk and insurance management. Um, before I begin going through my slides, I'd like to first take a moment to acknowledge all the employees who work at Clean Water Services by saying thank you. Your hard work, dedication, Commitment and kindness is appreciated. Also, I want to thank each of our board members and budget committee members for being here today. Next slide, please. Creating a resilient, diverse and engaged workforce. So in order for the district to attain this, I'm going to highlight three areas. 
workforce resilience, workforce diversity, and an engaged workforce. So beginning with workforce resiliency, as the district continues to grow and change, managing workforce resiliency becomes ever so important. In order to help with resilience, we have worked to implement several processes and systems over the last year. Starting out, Human Resources implemented a new onboarding software program, which helps streamline and provide more efficiency within the hiring process. As a result of this new system, we're able to move through the onboarding process faster and provide flexibility to new hires in completing the required new hire forms. We have also been able to add more information about the district with the onboarding documentation and giving them a true introduction into the district's culture. Succession planning has continued to be a major focus for building district resiliency as we face upcoming retirements and employee turnover. To help with this, we have identified temporary positions for retirees, along with strategically managing the time of recruitments in order to assist with the knowledge transfer and training process. Human Resources is also working with management through the district to identify untapped talent, possible growth opportunities, and help articulate career development pathways for employees. With COVID-19, we've had to react quickly and learn to adapt as new laws and policies were introduced. We have worked with the incident command to create and implement physical distancing requirements, temporary leave policies, face covering policy, and Oregon OSHA documentation, training, and compliance. As this pandemic continues, employees' mental and physical well-being is a priority and is key in continuing business operations. We will continue to educate, provide resources, and ensure flexibility with employees in order to help sustain employee health. A strategic initiative in human resources is to continue our efforts with workforce diversity. In order to progress with this initiative, we've identified several opportunities to focus on this upcoming year. One area of focus is compensation equity. We're working on completing a classification and compensation study to help with market comparables and an internal equity alignment to ensure consistency. Over the last year, we have worked to modify the recruitment process. We've implemented the onboarding platform, as I've mentioned, and we have moved to conduct virtual interviews in order to reach a broader candidate pool place focus on ensuring a diverse interview panel and added non-binary as a gender selection for tracking in our human resources management system. Training continues to be a high priority within human resources. We've worked to train the workforce on changes in the district's principles of respect policy, creating a professional and respectful work environment free of discrimination and harassment, along with demonstrating inclusion and that all voices are important. We believe in practicing mutual respect for qualities and experiences that are different from our own and that allows us to be stronger together to eradicate all forms of harassment and discrimination. This is key in our strategic success and improves performance. The district reviews benefit offerings and determines plan changes to provide a safe and healthy environment for our employees so that they can take care of themselves and their families. With the stress of COVID-19 and our changing workforce, Maintaining employee engagement is critical. Having an engaged workforce covers three areas, including performance management, COVID-19, and communication. Changes in performance management includes an upcoming implementation of a new performance management system to ensure employees are receiving the feedback, coaching, and recognition that they deserve. We've off, we have also focused on COVID-19 workforce management which ensures employees are getting time off for COVID-19 related situations, flexibility, and communicating any available or new resources. Communications from the human resources team has been vital so employees remain aware and feel connected. When you commit to creating an engaged workforce, you gain a harmonious environment in which each team member is invested in the success of the organization. Um, next slide, please. Earlier today, you heard Diane speak about our workforce. Um, this slide represents the age diversity across the district. Um, the district has employees who are in the beginning, middle, and nearing the end of their careers. And as you can see, the district's median age is 46 years old. 13% uh, of our overall workforce, 40% um, of the senior leadership team, 
16% of the supervisory staff and 11% of all nine supervisory staff could retire today based on their age and PERS. For the district to remain vigilant and resilient, succession planning and professional development of our workforce is extremely important. Um, next slide, please. As I mentioned in the previous slide, 13% of the overall workforce could retire today. So when we look at this slide, it shows the district's employee turnover for the past nine years. For the current year, as of April 7th, the turnover percentage is at 4.1%. Of those, a majority of them are retirements. Currently, we also have an additional eight employees who have notified human resources of their intent to retire on or before June 30, which would increase the turnover percentage to 6.17%. This percentage is well below the turnover rate for state and local government, which is 23.5% and private sector utilities, which is at 60.5% in uh, 2020. Next slide, please. This slide represents the employee demographics at the district. As of April 7, the district has 399 regular full-time employees. Of those, 30% are female, and 69.75% are male, and 0.25% identify as non-binary. 49% of staff have been with the district for zero to five years, 28% six to 15 years, 15% 15 for 16 to 25 years, and 8% for over 26 years. The district staff is 4% Asian, 0.25% Black or African American, 1% American Indian or Alaskan Native, 4.75% Hispanic or Latino of any race, 1% Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, 2% two or more races, and 87% white. It's important to know the numbers and the diversity of the workforce. However, it's just as important to look at internal equity amongst all the employees at the district and ensuring our strategic goals are aligned with providing employees with a sense of belonging, equality, and a safe and healthy work environment for all. A large initiative Human Resources is engaged in is completing a class classification and compensation study and a pay equity review. As Mark mentioned, the district's EDI program has several initiatives. In support of these efforts, Human Resources will be gathering data assisting with creating strategy and building partnerships. For recruitment, human resources will continue to outreach and build partnerships in the community, attracting people to this industry. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we were unable to attend in-person community job fairs, and we look forward to beginning this effort again. When we can meet in person with community members and provide them with assistance on how to apply for jobs, displaying our equipment like the street sweeper and TV vans, and being able to answer their questions and assist them with setting up job alerts so they are well informed when a position is posted so that they can apply. Uh, next slide, please. This slide demonstrates the outreach to different platforms so that applicants are aware of the types of jobs in our industry. As you can see, we receive a large number of applicants from Indeed. We also post our jobs with Partners in Diversity, the U.S. Military Pipeline, and a variety of other job boards, including Women's in Trade, American Public Works Association, community colleges, and many professional organizations and listservs. Initiatives that the recruitment team will continue in is partnering with management on the recruitment process, outreach and partner to increase diverse candidate pools, and reduce unintentional bias with the interview process. Human Resources has recruitment strategies that include diverse interview panels and reviewing job descriptions to eliminate barriers for applicants and using more universal descriptions of the essential functions and competencies for our positions. We're also conducting virtual interviews through the pandemic and we implemented, as I mentioned, the new onboarding platform. Uh, next slide, please. Holly, before I advance the slide, Lori put her hand up last slide. I'm not sure if that had something to do with the slide previous or, or if she had a general question. I just wanted to thank you for doing this critical work and I'm really happy to see your small but uh, significant increases in diversity in the agency, so thank you. You're welcome, thank you for that comment. 
Um, so for this slide, we're gonna talk about sustaining employee health and safety. Um, so coronavirus has had many impacts on the district's employees and their family members' health and safety. We've learned new ways to protect ourselves and our family members, including wearing masks, physical distancing, washing our hands, and now vaccinations. In March, the district conducted an employee survey to identify the vaccination rate within the workforce. At that time, 70% of employees said they would get the vaccine that day if they could. 22% were, were waiting to see or they were undecided and needed more information. And 9% said they would never get vaccinated. The district's incident command and the emergency operations committee work closely together to educate, communicate and encourage staff to protect themselves, their peers and their family members by getting the vaccine. We will be conducting another survey in mid-May to identify the percentage of employees who are fully vaccinated at the district. Looking into the future and the new normal at the district, we'll be considering what does childcare look like, adult care resources and benefits, ways to maintain a positive work environment and evaluating a hybrid work model. I wanna say I'm so proud of our employees and how they've responded to the virus. They have a lot of heart and a deep commitment to the community they serve. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to our strategic risk manager, Chris Novotny from the Risk and Insurance Management Program. Sorry, I'm so emotional, the coronavirus and just, I care so much about our employees. So thank you. You've done great, Holly, really great work. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rogers, did you have a question? Yeah, we can take it offline though. It, it, uh, I, I'm curious what you are going to do uh, with those folks who decide not to be vaccinated. Uh, it, it's a serious issue because uh, you're going to be vendors who uh, you're going to deal with. They're going to be public you're going to deal with. There are other employees. I know our small company of about 37, 38 people today, as of today, uh, we're looking and saying, can you put unvaccinated people in the same space? And most of our employees say, no, I, I don't mind working with somebody vaccinated, but I don't want to with unvaccinated folks. So it's, it's, it's a liability, it's a huge issue. And uh, I, I'd just be curious, uh, just for me, nobody else probably, but I'd be curious, Holly, what you're ultimately going to, to do on those lines. And that's to you too, Diane. It's a big issue, it's come, come up fast. So, Chris, I think you can go ahead. Okay, great. I didn't know if there was going to be a response there. But thank you, Holly. It's been a pleasure to work with you. I was able to join the Clean Water Services team as a strategic risk manager in November of 2020. And I really appreciate this opportunity to discuss some of our risk management and safety accomplishments and initiatives. This is a really interesting and challenging time in the risk management and commercial insurance marketplace. Globally and across all lines of coverage, commercial insurance prices rose an average of 22% in the fourth quarter of 2020. This is the 13th consecutive quarter of price increases in the insurance marketplace. However, there's some evidence that there's some plateauing pricing across some lines of insurance. And we think that's gonna result in a more balanced insurance market by late 2021. Broadly speaking, while the commercial insurance marketplace still remains hard, it's certainly more orderly and predictable than it's been in the last couple of years. Insurer's focus remains on the reduction of volatility, and it's a strategy that not only impacts the rate, but raises the likelihood underwriters will implement coverage limits, restrictions, and policy exclusions for risk arising from catastrophic losses, communicable diseases, strikes, riots, and civil commotion, and cyber exposures. The property insurance marketplace has been really difficult. In 2020 alone, the U.S. suffered 22 separate billion-dollar-plus weather events. The 2021 severe storms in Texas and Louisiana are expected to result in approximately $18 billion in insured losses. The good news? 
is that property insurance rate increases, while they're still high, are starting to stabilize. And for catastrophic challenge risks like the Pacific Northwest, the anticipated rate increases are now around 20%. Anticipated cyber increases have jumped from 25 to 50%. The insurers continue to focus on mitigating the financial losses from significant increases in the frequency and severity of ransomware events over the past year, as well as the massive impacts of the solar wind and the Microsoft Exchange server breaches. In response to our increasingly difficult risk and insurance landscape, we are strategizing on how to best use our captive Clean Water Insurance Company, otherwise known as Quick for insurance protection and financial flexibility. We are refining our risk appetite statement and philosophy to ensure that we're identifying our risk and opportunities, and maintaining the optimal balance between risk transfer and risk retention. We're currently marketing our property, excess earthquake, workers' compensation, and cyber insurance programs to ensure these programs are both comprehensive and competitively priced. We are investing in an enterprise risk management information system for risk management, claims, leave management, and employee safety and health that will enable us to use our data to help us identify trends and enhance our programs. Incidents and claims will be reported, investigated, and managed through the system. And our managers will have access to performance dashboards, which will help them better manage their individual programs. We continuously evaluate our policies and procedures to ensure we have best-in-class risk management and employee health and safety programs. And we look forward to our continued partnership with Washington County and our other jurisdictional partners as we enhance our emergency response program. Next slide. The health and safety of our employees continues to be our top priority. As our last record attests to, we're doing a pretty good job of this. Last year, we had 12 OSHA reportable injuries, eight of which were for very minor first aid type injuries. The employee safety team expanded tremendous efforts this past year to implement and maintain COVID-19 precautions in the workplace and comply with OSHA standards. This included training, maintaining personal protective equipment, and updating the building environment to align with the social distancing requirements. Wellness kits were distributed to all employees, which included items to help them minimize their risk to COVID. Participation in overall employee health and safety programs has also grown. Our team is working closely with leaders and safety committees to analyze their loss trends and assist in developing loss prevention programs. These efforts will be expanded with the implementation of our risk management information system. Do you have any questions? Okay. I have, I have one. Oh, sure. Chris, and it's nice to meet you in person, but sort of in person with <laughs> television, <laughs> television people. Yeah, here. Um, and this, this is, again, an offline question, but um, business interruption insurance. I, yes. I'd like to understand your take on that at some point. So instead of asking for CARES money uh, to uh, assist with those who are unable to pay their bills, if we were to insure as much as a business would do with business interruption insurance, now we could do that as a self-insurance basis. Um, that, that might be a good alternative. So I'm just curious that in your portfolio of things you know, that you're looking at, you know, uh, if you would uh, somehow look at that one and then educate me a bit on what your take on that one is. So I'm you have happy, to do that right now. Okay, I'm happy to talk with you offline. But just for your background, we do have the business interruption coverage as well as extra expense coverage under our property insurance program. But but that's not that's not for uh, non-payment of bills, customer. That's correct. Yeah, and so it's much more narrow, and I'm thinking more broadly of insuring ourselves against okay. that sort of activity. So anyway, we can talk about that offline. Sounds great. Thanks. If there are no other questions, I'd like to turn it over to our general counsel, Gary Linder. Thank you, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for your continued attention. The legal services budget is on page 128 to 129 of your budget book. And if you look at page 128, you'll see something, this, this is a little curious. 
we're coming into this budget with three FTE and if approved, leaving with three FTE, but there is an important change. Our current contracts coordinator uh, who does all the complex procurements right now for us, as well as serving the legal department is going to be moving to another group that you're gonna hear about in a very few minutes. That's going to be a, a, a specific procurement group. It's a great change for the district and, and as you're gonna hear about it. So I'm not steal any thunder from that uh, presentation, uh, but that's gonna leave us a little uh, tough in a tough position, but uh, we are asking for a paralegal position to replace the contracts coordinator, which actually is a net gain because we'll still get the great procurement services and the wonderful people that do that work and be able to coordinate with them. And we'll get a person that then will be able to provide 100% uh, legal services for the, the two attorneys in the department. So I, I think it's, it's gonna be great uh, for the district as a whole. Next slide, please. <laughs> So speaking of, of supporting things, um, all these things you've heard about today, the programs and the projects, um, legal department supports everything you've heard about. There's engineering contracts and there's purchases of equipment and there's IGAs and those are things that the legal department does. Now, our board of directors sees a few of these if they're uh, over a certain dollar amount but uh, there's a lot more than the board sees. So our department is a little bit like the duck, you know, treading water, uh, trying to keep, keep afloat, but uh, it's a small but great group. And I wanted to highlight just a couple things in this slide. Uh, one is the reason I've, uh, oh no, no, not next slide, a, a couple of things in this slide. Um, I, I, I bracketed the and procurement because the, the complex part of that is gonna be moving out of legal, but we will continue to review those that we simply won't be as involved in the development stage other than providing legal advice. Um, I want to point out that probably between contracts and real property transactions, that's 70% of what we do. We're just cranking in those areas, easements and so on. Um, the other areas we provide uh, at general advice. Sometimes we get into extremely difficult uh, problems that are beyond our uh, knowledge. That's when we go out and get outside legal services, or, or if there's simply a, a, a something that's so big, like a large litigation, uh, we get help there. And I will say, as, as much as on the right-hand side, you see those boring looking books, uh, our job is not boring. Uh, I, the, whenever I do go out to ask, ask an outside uh, attorney for some help, I, I think every attorney we work with says, you know, your issues are so interesting. You're just like our favorite client because they're always so interesting. So uh, I know it's probably only interesting to a lawyer, but they're very interesting. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is uh, working with some of the other departments, uh, specifically regulatory. Uh, I'm uh, the legal uh, co-chair of the legal committee for this uh, Oregon uh, Association of clean water agencies that Mark Jockers has talked about earlier. And one of our uh, functions is to, to try to make sure DEQ is, is work giving us regulations that benefit the environment, but are also uh, make some sense in terms of, of budget and you're, you're really maximizing the benefit. And I work a lot with regulatory, along with DEQ and even the Department of Justice. Uh, Raj Kapoor and I just met with a group to talk about temperature standards and that frankly weren't gonna probably work for us. Uh, and they were not wanting to change things but agreed that they would relook at it with us together. So those are the kind of relationships that we've been able to build uh, between regulatory and legal and then working with outside agencies to try to get optimal results. Next slide, please. Uh, the King City Garden Villas litigation I mentioned uh, last budget period. I'll give you a, a quick update. It's an active case, so I, I'm not going to say a lot about it, but this is the one where I think there's four large buildings that the developer back in 1970 put right on top of a sewer. Uh, their, their lateral runs right down the middle of the property. 
Uh, some homeowners there asked us to work with them on a local improvement district. Uh, other homeowners became upset with that because they believe that the line is a, already a clean water services line and they shouldn't have to contribute uh, to any problems related to it. Um, our position is that without a doubt, it's a private line and not something that the district rate payers should have to uh, pay for. We would cooperate with the community, but uh, there is now a, a specific legal question that is on, uh, there's a summary judgment motion to be heard in, I think, July that a, a judge will determine the ownership of the line. And, and it's a big deal because it, if we were to uh, hear that the judge thinks it's a public line, which we don't think it is, uh, it's about a $4 million project. And, and the ratepayers shouldn't have to pay $4 million for, to fix a private line. Uh, so it, it's, uh, and, and we may, if we don't prevail on summary judgment, we would have a trial in the fall. Uh, purchasing rule updates, this is an annual exercise that we look at our rules to see if there's some opportunities for efficiencies that are consistent with state law and purchasing rules. And every year, the legislature makes some changes to prevailing wage rates or, or some other area of the purchasing rules, then we have to update to comply with, with state law. And then the audit process for contracts not reviewed by legal. We have a lot of templates uh, with all the, even all the contracts we see, there's a lot more uh, ones that, that we wanna hand off to users as long as the legal department has had some look at it in advance. So we come up with templates because a lot of the purchase are, purchases are similar to uh, the last purchase. So once we've approved a template, the group can take that and run with it. And if they don't change it, then legal doesn't need to see it again. But we really think we need to make sure that that whole process is going well. We think it is, we get smart people, but we're gonna to begin to audit uh, a percentage of that. It's part of a goal share to look at those, make sure they use the right form, make sure there wasn't a change that should have been looked at by legal. And then we'll work with the users if we see issues and, and provide training. So the similar things don't happen the next time. Next slide, please. So continuous improvement, that's a, a big, when, you, when you're a small group, you better keep improving because the district keeps growing and, and doing more projects and getting more complex. So we're always looking for opportunities to do better in this last period. Uh, we added some of those new templates I just talked about. We updated some, right? That we need to keep them uh, a, a good solid contract. So there's updates we occasionally do. And then training. For example, we just are in the process of finishing a three, two hour uh, sort of intense procurement background and training for our, our immediate users who are in the various departments. So that's important to us to that people are well trained. Uh, as far as the e-procurement e concept, uh, to be clear, we're pretty much 100% electronic already. But what we're talking about here is a contract management software uh, package that would be different than, than the pieces we have in place right now. We, we think there's tools out there that provide uh, more opportunity for data collection, more uh, opportunity to integrate some of the different tools. So we're gonna be, we, we've set out the requirements of what that package should look like and, and we may be purchasing it next year. Uh, uh, the EDI lens on procurement process, that, that's really important. We, we are looking at, at this as sort of a three-phase process. You, you saw Mark's uh, uh, continual progression on this journey. Uh, our piece in the journey at this point is in, in phase one, we've done data collection. We've looked at other jurisdictions and, and some of the programmatic ideas they have come up with. And we're looking at the legal sidebars on the program that, that we would be able to implement. Phase two will be to work with that uh, internal EDI team that Mark talked about, as well as internal users to make sure we understand any uh, uh, special uh, requirements they might have. And then finally move it over into phase three, which is the, the management look at it, the CEO getting board input, 
um, and beginning to look at how we might want to be able to actually bring purchasing rules to the board that, that would contain uh, the EDI procurement elements. And then finally, succession planning. The uh, entire legal team is pretty much, we could retire, we don't plan to, um, but it's something we need to take very seriously in terms of being prepared for the future. So as Dan has told me many times, uh, and I thank her for her advice. So next year, we probably will be looking at adding an attorney to provide some more services to our users, as well as provide greater resiliency to a, a small department, uh, perhaps the year after that, not to get too far into things, but uh, Diane and I have been talking about the a good idea of perhaps bringing an assistant general counsel on that, that so we could have a, a knowledge transfer in a reasoned manner versus just, you know, leaving one day and wishing someone good luck. So that's, that's in the works. And I wanted to introduce you to that. And with, I don't really have anything else unless you have some questions for me. Thank you, Jerry. I don't see any hands raised. Does anybody have a question? That's Thank you. Great. I will turn things over to Dr. Ken Williamson, who is our Director of Research and Innovation. Good afternoon. Uh, we're getting closer to the end here. I know it's been a long day. So uh, in this reorganization, um, there's been quite a few changes with uh, these three boxes that you see here. Uh, research and innovation was moved out of regulatory affairs uh, and now directly reports to the CEO. Uh, and there have been there's fuller, fuller expansion of the digital solutions team. And I'll talk a second about that. And then we're now incorporated in with business strategy and performance. Um, Innovation is a big thing at clean water services. If you ask somebody nationally about clean water services, what word would you use to describe it? They would tell you innovation. Uh, it's just part of our genetics. Uh, and it's almost like we shouldn't be clean water services, we should be clean water innovation and services. Uh, we try to do everything uh, as well as possible and to certainly try new techniques. We've tried to concentrate a lot of that innovation into these uh, three um, <clears throat> programs. And uh, we're gonna briefly describe them. Uh, first, there is the research and innovation program. Uh, this involves a variety of different projects across the district uh, of which we have about 30 now. Uh, and those are, conducted by uh, also people across the entire district. Uh, we also have concentrated in, in the, this research and innovation program, uh, the COVID monitoring, and I'm gonna talk more specifically about that. We also have responsibility for the Pure Water Wagon. Uh, much of the Pure Water Wagon work has, uh, <coughs> has ceased because of COVID, but we certainly will start this up in the future. Uh, we also have a sewer shed monitoring, which I'm going to talk more about it. And we also have the modeling program uh, for the entire district. Uh, <clears throat> within the digital solutions group, this is uh, our IT group, also with uh, the advanced uh, efforts to provide uh, these various new solutions using uh, uh, digital uh, equipment and software. A uh, variety of different programs here, and we'll describe those in more detail. Uh, King Lu will describe those in more detail. And then lastly, uh, Diane has developed this business strategy and performance system, um, which is led by Ryan LeCicero. Uh, this is a very common thing now across large organizations, uh, both private and public. Uh, of trying to organize the, uh, the systems to make them more efficient, more effective, uh, and to provide tactical and strategic approaches. Uh, and this uh, effort also includes the Clean Water Institute. Next slide, please. 
In the research and innovation program, um, again, I said we have about 30 programs. About half of those are directed by the eight people in research and innovation. Uh, the other half of the programs are spread across uh, wastewater, conveyance, a uh, variety of different programs. Uh, we also have taken on responsibility of trying to uh, lead the development of the new Ripple facility. Uh, this is, uh, will provide for both research, innovation, and the laboratories, and a variety of partnerships that we will develop. Uh, the Ripple facility will give us a state-of-the-art uh, center for innovation. Uh, and will uh, really be a beacon uh, for uh, the wastewater industry of how to lead innovative efforts. Uh, and then we also uh, have expanded the use of the pre pure water wagon. Uh, the initial effort was to make the pure water brew, which we used uh, for a variety of different uh, efforts with uh, outreach. Uh, we want to integrate this equipment into a pure research program outbreak of the food industry in Forest Grove uh, with the number of specific cases that they measured by the workers that were there with the concentration of the virus in the wastewater. Next slide. Another large project for us. Tony, you know it's what? hard to catch your sound, but I assume you're inviting me to ask. Well, <laughs> yeah, I realized I was holding the wrong key down, so then it was oscillating. It wasn't much fun. Sorry, Ken, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I saw Lori had her hand up, and it may be relevant to your slide you just finished. Um, it was. Thank you, and thanks for letting me be the big question answer today, and I apologize for that. Um, I am curious about whether you found anything about the community policies through that work yet. Um, we have tried to correlate the numbers that we measured uh, across Washington County with different uh, sort of uh, indicators uh, like uh, the percentage of minority populations, income, uh, that sort of thing. And that study is not done yet. We actually have a backlog of, uh, of a number of samples that we're waiting to get the numbers on. But yes, we are trying to correlate with specific community indicators uh, to the uh, concentration in the wastewater. Um, I wanted to add also, you know, uh, earlier uh, Commissioner Roger brought up the, the thing about uh, cost centers and uh, uh, Clean water services being paid for services. Uh, uh, this work, we, we funded a lot of it with about $200,000 worth of contracts and grants uh, that we had from various organizations for the uh, measurements. Uh, we also have a big project on continuous water quality monitoring. Uh, and this was largely driven by uh, a series of upsets we had at the Force Grove facility uh, over years. Uh, and these upsets were obviously coming from uh, discharges, industrial discharges into the facilities. Uh, and we could follow them, but the problem was by the time we measured them at the treatment plants, uh, you know, the upset was underway. And so uh, what we've tried to do is develop uh, continuous water quality monitors that we can put into the sewer shed uh, to determine when these spikes of chemicals come. And so we've worked on these low cost open source sensors um, and telemetry with the digital solutions group, made tremendous progress on these. And I know there was a question earlier about them. Uh, they're still in operation and we are testing them along with a number of other commercial probes. And the picture you see at the right is um, a project we have with the Water Research Foundation that we have a flume out at the Force Grove plant and we have a number of these uh, probes and we continuously monitor and see uh, how rapidly they foul, uh, how much the fouling affects the numbers uh, and compare the different available uh, probes with each other to see which ones are most reliable. A big one for us is trying to understand uh, how often that you have to maintain these things. Uh, we're looking uh, potentially at the future of 
having about 50 of these sensor systems uh, in the Force Grove watershed. So tremendous uh, maintenance issue if the maintenance is too high. Uh, that system is presently, uh, we're doing the test. We had another couple of months before we finished that research for the Water Research Foundation. I wanna tell you though that just last night, okay, uh, we had detected some spikes uh, of a chemical into the Force Grove system for the last several weeks. Uh, we have started and we deployed specific uh, samplers into the system. And last night for the first time, we coordinated those samples that we took inside the sewer shed with the continuous monitoring at the treatment plant and saw a significant spike in the middle of the night. Uh, and so that will be uh, really interesting to us when we get that data analyzed. So we have now demonstrated that this kind of a system of continuous monitoring and then taking samples in the sewer shed can work and hopefully can identify some of these spikes. Next slide. The other group we have is we have the modeling group. We have two people in our modeling group and they have done uh, a tremendous amount of work this last year uh, in sporting uh, various projects across the district. Uh, we worked on the water supply project doing the, the hydraulics related to the potential storage in reservoirs, what that would mean for uh, temperature uh, and water quality management in the river. And we now have a, a, a complete model in which you can do various scenarios to look at different ways that you can meet those requirements uh, along with diff different quantities of storage. Uh, we've also done predictive models uh, of these various changes on the Tuolan River, especially related around using reduced alum in the treatment plant, but also around uh, discharge from the natural tr treatment system and whether we would expand the tree planting program. Uh, we've also modeled the infrastructure and best management practices for a variety of different capital improvement projects. Uh, and this is a requirement for our permit. And this group also develops a variety of different storm model models uh, and relate those to the combination, these combination projects of piping and stream enhancement. And we're also involved in developing these uh, large scale models uh, uh, across the watershed. So a lot of modeling, a lot of quantity and quality modeling, and have provided us with a much improved uh, data and information source. Uh, to do our long-term planning. And with the next slide, I will introduce Ting Lu, who will talk about the Digital Solutions Program. Thank you, Ken. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to present some of the highlights from Digital Solutions, and it is at the budget book 140 to 141. Overall, um, uh, steal, uh, steal the next, uh, previous slides, please. Thank you. Overall, there are, uh, there are five service areas. For, uh, for digital solutions team, the first one is to continue to build and develop and maintain the modern, reliable, and resilient digital technology. And this is a foundation to support clean water services, achieve higher value business outcomes. We have also expanded data management best practices and business intelligence capabilities to support a data-driven um, culture. We have also advanced data analytics with the piloting a field project and artificial intelligence with the NATES group for real-time prediction and operational optimization um, at the large scale. We're also advancing cybersecurity and business continuity. As Chris mentioned earlier, as pandemic started, we see a lot of a more um, cyber attacks here. So digital solution team is safeguarding our systems here. As a technology partner, part of our work is to provide ongoing support to evaluate, to implement, and integrating new technology systems and provide trainings to empower end users. 
This year alone, we have resolved more than three times of the help desk tickets compared with the, prior, uh, the number prior to pandemic. So I would like to highlight uh, each of these components. Next slide, please. From a te uh, technology infrastructure standpoint, we leverage the cloud technologies such as the Office 365 cloud platform to improve collaboration, communication, productivity, and resiliency for district users. Like many IT projects, for end users, email migration only takes an hour or so, but it takes months of testing, validation, changing group policies, and developing communication plans, and working with the end users for a smooth migration and minimize business interruptions. Andy Brown also mentioned earlier about the geographic information system, the GIS system earlier. So this is a large foundational platform that digital solutions maintains. It supports visualization of assets, facilities, stream, and other information, and allows for data analysis on multiple scales. And this year, we started modernization of this platform to empower more users for self-service, to better support districts integrated planning, data-driven operation, asset management, and collaboration with other partner agencies. Partnering with the public affairs, we have expanded the Absorb Learning Management System, also known as the Clean Water Online Platform, to enhance training and learning experiences for both internal and external members. Some of you might have viewed the information from Absorb channel, and hopefully this channel provides you um, another opportunity to learn some of the work we are doing here at Clean Water Services. Next slide, please. And Ken mentioned about the value of a continual uh, monitoring devices. We are at the turn for a digital transformation. And the IoT sensor network is the foundation for this. Real-time sensors provide data into information to insights and support the holistic decision makings and better understanding for watershed health. Um, just want to add on to what Ken has mentioned. It's been a great collaboration with the research and innovation and other groups. We internalize the knowledge for this open source DIY approach. And it's low cost and it's um, the, the cost is uh, half of the commercial sensor cost. And this year we deployed 25 sensor stations to support water reuse, natural treatment, stream restoration, and the water quality, and a variety of other projects. Um, to answer Chair Harrington's question, it is a part of our plan to track all the parts and the um, systems with the asset management system. We're also in the process of testing the low power wide area network, Laura One network. And this a whole package of IoT sensor network is going to provide an opportunity to both clean water services as well as the regional smart city and smart utility initiatives in the future. Next slide, please. We are addressing cybersecurity at three levels to reduce our vulnerabilities. On an infrastructure level, this year, Digital Solutions team has impl implemented additional tertiary off-site off backup to improve backup uh, recovery and resiliency. And if you are curious, the backup server is at Dallas, Texas, and immutable against tempering. We are also working on expanding multi-factor authentication to add on the next level security for district-wide. Um, operational technologies such as automation and control system, often the target for cybercrime. We have collaborated with Jennifer Toast Group, and this year we developed a SCADA security action plan and is addressing both IT and OT risks together. At the district level, our employees are our most important defense against cybercrime. Collaborating with public affairs, HR, and the risk, we have started ongoing simulated phishing campaign and cybersecurity trainings to educate users stay vigilant and alert. And finally, I want to take a moment to thank the entire Digital Solutions team for their dedication and commitment. And Chair Harrington, Board of Directors and Budget Committee, thank you for your support. Um, we'll see if any questions before I hand it over to Ryan. I don't see any, and I don't see anybody waving, so I think you're okay. 
Oh, I, I would, there, Hill I Roy. Would, <laughs> I would say one thing, uh, Ting. Uh, we spend a lot of money in this firm on technology. In about the first five sentences, you started to lose me, and you. Uh, what a presentation! I mean, you certainly are a, uh, way ahead on your craft. <laughs> I was simply impressed, really blown away with what you're doing. So uh, as usual, I, I've, I've said it to you before, uh, not that everyone here doesn't do a great job, but you certainly hit them out of the ballpark in this technology area. So great job. Only talk to me more small terms. I, I, I thought I was smart, but I didn't, uh, <laughs> well, you, you really, uh, you really, <laughs> displayed a great amount of wisdom in technology. So congratulations. Well, well, thank you for your inspiration, Roy. It's always a drive the business value and a recover and how to um, provide the value to both clean water services and the regional and the global level. So thank you for your support. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Ryan LeCistro, business practice leader for strategy, performance, and innovation. Thanks, Ting. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. It's good to see you. Um, for your reference, the Business Strategy and Performance Systems Program Summary is located on page 138 and 139 of the budget document. Um, today, we'll look at two areas of performance excellence. We'll look at business strategy and results. We're going to highlight roadmap development, our goal sharing program, performance measures, and our community dashboard. Next slide, please. So our roadmaps define specific strategies that we will implement as an organization to reach our key strategic outcomes. And they are foundational for developing goal shares that align with our strategic priorities. Clean Water Services reuse strategy map shown here includes a mix of strategies to expand the role of reuse water for urban applications, including green space irrigation, farm irrigation, and to enhance and restore wetlands. These strategies are part of a broader thermal management strategy that will allow clean water services to meet thermal compliance today to 2025 and beyond. And they are critical to meeting our key strategic outcome of integrated water resource management and resilient watersheds. Next slide, please. The Water Reuse Roadmap defines a vision and path forward to expand the water reuse program from one MGD to five MGD of water by 2025 through partnerships across the region. In total, the water reuse team has identified 11 goal share objectives that describe what we are trying to achieve, as well as measures and targets to allow us to know if we're on track and if we're meeting our objectives. This plan will guide us to achieving our targets by 2025. Next slide, please. So the district hit its goal share target, meeting 78.6% of goal shares. Now this is up nearly 14% from previous year and paying out over $4,500 to all eligible employees. This year we have 65% more active goal shares than were audited in the previous year for a total of 114 goal share measures. We continue to see high rates of participation with 101 unique owners and coordinators, accounting for more than 25% of our workforce directly contributing to the program. We also saw the program focusing efforts across 29 application areas, which are presented here in the word cloud. Here you see the district's strategic priorities, such as workforce development and training, as well as drivers such as regulatory compliance and asset management showing up as key areas of emphasis. Next slide, please. From a performance excellence perspective, our goal is to bring light to indicators to, and performance measures that are the most important requirements for our region's success and measures that show how we are providing value to our customers. One of the key areas to include are comparisons, showing how our results compare with other organizations. This is also referred to as benchmarking. Since, since uh, 2019, Clean Water Services has participated in the American Water Works Association benchmarking program and is proud to say we are reporting performance levels on a meaningful measurement scale. 
We can show the directions of results and rates of change in areas of importance and are able to benchmark against other utilities in the water sector. A special thanks to the six coordinators who have made this effort possible and have provided and verified data for the last three years. Next slide, please. Now, as mentioned in previous budget meetings and WEFTEC Connect discussions, the district continues to develop our community dashboard and aims to have key measures across all strategic outcome areas within the next fiscal year. This dashboard will be used internally, shared with the board, and then made available to our community. So that's a quick look at the two areas of performance excellence, business strategy and results, highlighting roadmap development, our goal sharing program, performance measures, and our community dashboard. I thank you for your time and attention. I'll now hand it over to Kim Baylor, Clean Water Services Financial Strategist. Good afternoon, everyone. So my virtual background isn't working all of a sudden. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. But um, for your reference, the financial strategy and performance management um, budget is shown on pages 144 to 145 of the document if you want to follow along. Um, the financial strategy and performance management um, program is a new program for the district. Um, Currently, we have two FTEs in the program, which will be led by me and supported by our financial analyst, Jennifer Ortiz. In this next year, our focus will be on developing a financial plan, cost of service study, and rate and fee setting for the district. We will work on um, developing some best management practices related to rates and fees and developing dashboards for evaluating financial performance in the district. Next slide, please. Key initiatives for the for 2020 for the financial strategy program are shown on this slide. We are currently starting the financial plan and cost of service study. The slide here shows the various phases of the technical analysis we are working on, which include the financial plan, cost of service, rate design, and system development charge analyses. In the financial plan, we will, we will establish a long-term revenue requirement projection, which will include operating maintenance and capital improvement costs, and also our debt service requirements. We will evaluate current revenues from rates, fees, and system development charges, and develop a long-term financial plan and rate adjustment strategy for the district. The financial plan will be specific to both sanitary sewer and surface water management, There'll be a separate plan for each utility. I think we need to go back. There we go. Thank you. <clears throat> the cost of service analysis is where the revenue requirements will be allocated to customer classes. And in order to do this, we'll evaluate how costs are allocated to the regional and local services, the fixed and the variable charges, and evaluate customer characteristics and water usage data. In the rate design analysis, this phase, we will develop rate structure alternatives that will best collect the revenue requirements from each customer class. We will look at various um, structures of fixed and variable charges for um, consideration. Then we'll evaluate impacts on customer bills and present alternatives to the board for consideration. With the system development charges, these are our charges for new connections to our systems. The system development charges reflect the cost of capital infrastructure that can be allocated to new developments and reflect the capacity requirements for new connections to our systems. Charges will be evaluated for sanitary sewer and surface water management systems. So this sums up our key initiatives for this year in the financial strategy program. And I'll pass this off to Bruce Corden, our business opportunities manager to talk about business opportunities and operations. Thank you, Kim. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So with this budget, uh, we are establishing a new division called Business Opportunities and Operations. Uh, it will have eight FTE, including myself, and it will consist of three programs. The first of which uh, I will describe is procurement. 
So could I have the next slide? This is, uh, procurement consists basically of purchasing as well as contract support throughout the district. And in the past, this is a function that has been spread among several departments. Uh, as Jerry Linder mentioned, uh, legal was where our contracts coordinator was, uh, finance is where our purchasing uh, coordinator was, and then we had uh, various contract support people uh, in the larger departments, such as water resources, recovery, and utility operations. For the first time, these people will be centralized uh, in one management unit, and we're, uh, we're really optimistic and, and happy that uh, we're now going to have a chance to, uh, to really focus on procurement as a programmatic thing for the district and to also um, uh, make it easier to ensure compliance with purchasing rules and requirements and so forth, uh, as well as, uh, as, as adopt uniform uh, requirements throughout the district. So uh, this is something that's a long time coming, but, uh, but we think it's going to be really good for us. Next slide, please. The business opportunities function is one that I've had for the last several years within the Water Resource Recovery Department. Uh, is something that we're now going to expand to, to the rest of the district. And uh, as Commissioner Rogers suggested, the, um, the carbon credits opportunity uh, for uh, Bruce Roll's department uh, is one that I would gladly uh, sink my teeth into as a business opportunity. So I'm, I'm glad that has come up. Uh, basically though, uh, big picture wise with business opportunities, uh, they come in two, two forms. One is the internal opportunity which uh, is, is really all about improving the district's business processes using lean principles and other tools. And uh, I've been working on several of these projects over the years. Uh, the one currently that is, is definitely worth mentioning, uh, I think it's a very important one, is to convert our current paper-based invoice processing and archiving system to a paperless one. This involves purchasing new software and having it modified to meet our needs, and then, of course, implementing and, and training staff on its use. We expect this to be fully implemented later this year, and uh, it's going to make things much easier process-wise. We'll also have to. Uh, we'll also be able to stop looking for more space to store our uh, our paper uh, in. So that's going to help us in that respect as well. The other business opportunities are the external ones. Um, a good example is our fat soils and grease program, which uh, a lot of you have probably already heard about. Uh, you can see the fellow in the picture there with the truck. He is a fog hauler. We have 11 different companies under contract currently for fog. They drop off fog at our fog receiving station at our Durham facility, and we turn the fog into energy. Uh, this fog program basically doubles the amount of gas that is produced at the, the Durham facility and that means also doubling the amount of energy that we can produce as well. Not only does this program give us more energy, but we also charge tipping fees. And uh, just last year, uh, I believe we collected over $650,000 worth of tipping fees from our fog haulers. The, the cost uh, or the charge that we make is, is a, it varies per hauler, but it's around eight cents a gallon. So that's a lot of gallons of fog to be $650,000. Another example is the ongoing uh, renewable natural gas project where we're negotiating a deal to sell the biogas produced at our Rock Creek facility to Northwest Natural Gas. Uh, this will be uh, basically our biogas put into their utility pipeline uh, and used to serve their customers. And it uh, represents uh, you know, a nice change to a greener source of natural gas for their customers. So uh, that's going to be a really exciting project, and it'll be one of the first of its kind in, in uh, the Portland area. And lastly, I'll mention public-private partnerships. They're part of a bigger issue of how to finance projects. Uh, some of the work that we do, like the energy work, isn't central to our mission and involves risks, which we may not want to uh, uh, burden ourselves with. And the public-private partnerships business model allows for risk allocation in ways that we may find favorable. So that's something that we're re researching and that we would like to um, explore further. Uh, next slide, please. The third uh, program within the new division is performance audits. Uh, in some respects, this is going to be a natural extension of our internal business opportunity concept. Uh, what we'll be doing though is first 
looking at our programs to see how well they're doing in terms of meeting uh, their uh, performance metrics, uh, their uh, strategic goals and objectives and so forth. And then in association with that, we'll be looking at their business processes and finding ways to improve them uh, in order to allow them to better meet uh, their strategic goals and so forth. Uh, this is something that uh, we, uh, we will be implementing uh, this, this next uh, fiscal year. Uh, and so I hope that next year I'll be able to tell you about some successes that we've uh, achieved with it. And that's all I have. Questions? Uh, yeah, Jerry, I think I saw you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's uh, it's worth noting, uh, you know, the fats, oils, and greases thing. We've been down there. We've, we've heard some information about that. And if I heard you correctly, it's eight cents a gallon is the tipping fee. That's the average. It varies from about five and a half cents to 12 cents, depending on the hauler. So what we do or what we've done in the past is we've issued a request for proposals every three years and we've uh, asked them to tell us how much they'll pay us. Then we've started at the highest ones and then we've gone down the list and signed everybody up until we got to a point where um, you know we, we basically uh, reached uh, our capacity. So uh, yeah. last, well, last I think there that... were one or two who, were, who didn't make it. Well, I think the interesting thing, though, for me is just quickly doing the math at six hundred and fifty thousand dollars of tipping fees divided by the eight cents. It's eight million gallons. That's a significant number. And I, I tell you, that is um, that is something for us to be extremely proud of is uh, how we're being able to take that and convert that to a power source. And so um, that was that was impressive to me anyway. So thanks for that information. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I might have mentioned it doubles the amount of gas we produce at Durham. So um, it's, you know, you think about all the municipal wastewater that we, we take in at Durham and, and the solids that are in that. And, and just this fog that's being brought to the plant basically doubles that. So it's, yeah, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. it's, it, right in line with that comment was, I think in the past we'd heard about your cogeneration and just the value of that, because I, I know you have some solar installations, but I suspect the gas and the generators are the biggest chunk of your cogeneration. But um, do, do you have a, any clue about how much of your electricity use is coming out of your cogeneration side versus what you're uh, having to purchase? We have that data. I've put it in PowerPoints before. Um, I want to say it's um, for the Durham plant. It might be 40%. Um, uh, Mark Jockers, you might recall, we, 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 I know we've made presentations based on this in the past, and, uh, and I've helped public- Hence my question, because it was a familiar one. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I would actually defer to Nate. Um, Bruce, you're asking for public affairs math, probably, at this point, that was what I would have to recall. But. Um, Nate can probably answer that. It has just, in, as Bruce said, a considerable increase in our total output. It's just, I, I refer to it as octane booster, right? I mean, it's just. Yeah. Actually, now that I think about it, last year at Durham, I believe we produced between 13 and 14 million kilowatt hours of electricity with the cogen system. And the plant as a whole, gosh, um, my 40% number was probably low because I think the plant uses around 20 million. So it's more than half. Now, let me help out with that. It, you're right, Bruce. It is higher at Durham. It's about 60% at Durham. And overall, because we also have a cogen facility at Rock Creek, which is one megawatt. The facility at Durham is 1.7, so it does more. But overall, for the Water Resource Recovery Department, we produce 47% of our electricity we use is self-generated. That's, that's just a... What, what a great story. What a great story. There are more questions. And um, Andy, I'll just start from go from one side to the next. Sure. Hey, sorry. Oh. Andy, you're muted again. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. You've got a captive source of fog at this time, and and uh, they're having to pay a tipping fee, as you said. Do you see a time when uh, there might be competitors out there who buy that, and and we don't have that revenue off the tipping fees? 
Yes, that's always been a concern. Uh, and that's one reason why I've always allowed the fog haulers to submit bids uh, rather than just you know, levying a, a standard eight cents or 10 cents or whatever, um, because I want to I want to make sure that uh, our our um, our business is, is consistent with what the market is offering. Um, we've also been looking, though, at other feedstocks, potentially, uh, such as food waste. So the fog, uh, you know, it, fog is great. It's, it's like high octane gasoline, you know, when it comes to producing gas. But there are other organic feedstocks that uh, could be beneficial for us out there that, uh, you know, we haven't even reached the tip of the iceberg with, with yet when, when it comes to supply and, and food waste certainly is, is at the top of the list. Right. Thank you, uh, Roy. I thought, it was, I thought it was Michael next, but I'll go, okay, I'll go. Uh, two, couple of things, Bruce. Uh, one, congratulations on the performance audit. The way you are doing it is, is important. And I hope Diane holds your feet to the fire to say, Let's see what you do in terms of, uh, of adding value. I mean, are you coming up with things of that value? But look at blockchain technology as well. If you're going to do this and you're going to go paperless on your, uh, uh, that, that's one of your initiatives. Take a look at the blockchain. The whole world's moving to blockchain technology. It'll allow you to do this performance much easier because you'll have all the documents available to you. So take a peek at that. Thank you. We will. Mike, sure. I was wondering if you're, as you move to storing the documents electronically, how are you making sure you've got the programs to be able to access them in the past, in the future? As the, as the programs, you know, get updated all the time, eventually aren't your documents going to be created on a non, non-supported program? That's a very good question, uh, and it's one that I think our digital solutions people who are helping with this project could better answer than I can. Uh, as I understand it, uh, with the software we're dealing with now, the storage will be in the cloud. Um, that's about the extent of what I know about that part of it. I know we've we've looked at it and we've thought about it, uh, so there, there is an answer. <laughs> I just don't have it off the top of my head. Okay, at least you're thinking about it. Yes. I, I know it's a question others have asked and still decided to go to the cloud. So whether, uh, so I, I still think it's a good option. Uh, Lori, I saw your hand go up. So. Oh, you're muted, Lori. Sorry about that. I couldn't help but get a twinge of worry thinking about whether satellites go out someday. <laughs> That's why they're also hard lines, right? <laughs> um, all right. Uh, after Bruce, is that Kathy? Is that bring us? Yes, Kathy. Thank you, Bruce. Mm -hmm. So we're down to actually the final stretch. This is it. So the finest in accounting program is summaries located in one, pages 142 and 143 in the budget document. The Finance and Accounting Group provides accounting services, financial reporting, bond issue and issuance and debt management, budget development, capital improvement programming development, and project accounting, and utility billing and collections. This group has historically developed the district's financial forecast and financial management policies and handled portions of the procurement process. Our team will be working closely with Kim and Bruce's new programs as key resources for continued financial resilience in these areas. We have 14 FTE in our group. Next slide, please. Two large projects the group is working on include the customer information system utility billing software implementation with Open Smart Flex, which is a project in the district's capital improvement plan. This is a joint project with Walton Valley Water District the implementation phase began in November of 2020 with a planned go live in March of 2022. The system will provide a much improved customer facing portal, increase billing efficiencies and provide enhanced data analytics. The second project, which is one we've been working with with Bruce's business opportunities group is, the, is a project that includes the procurement and accounts payable teams that will be implementing an electronic invoice processing and AP Express, with AP Express 
this fiscal year, um, implementation was phased in starting with Water Research Recovery Group. Invoices will be scanned into the system and auto-populate portions of the Oracle Accounts Payable Entry Process. Invoice approvals will happen electronically inside software and invoice copies and payments will also be stored electronically. This system will increase efficiencies and productivity of invoice processing and eliminate paper storage of invoices and payments. So another, a good, another good efficiency for our group. I did, that, that's the final piece of my presentation, but I did wanna take a moment to recognize and thank Aaron Lowry, our budget and support services supervisor, who has been the key player in not only the development of our current year financial forecast, but the development of the budget document you have today and the capital improvement program. So, so thank you to her for all her efforts. And she's been doing this while also balancing the CIS implementation project. So, so thank you to her for that. And with that, I open it up for any questions you might have of the business services group. I see no hands waving or other hands raised <laughs> electronically or physically. So. I, I think we're good there. I don't, Diane, did you have anything you wanted to go to next? Or I guess I, we're rolling into the public comment period, aren't we? Do we have any members of the public that have signed up at this point? Uh, Chair Weller, I have not been made aware of anyone signing up to comment. Okay, I think then uh, that brings us to, to the decision point. Um, Diane, did you have anything you wanted to say before we get to that or just? I just wanted to thank um, the budget committee, our board of directors and our CWAC members for staying with us all the way to what it's almost uh, four o'clock now. And I really appreciate um, the team and the level of um, effort that they put into the presentation today. There's so much more they wanted to share with you. Uh, we had the the, the hard job of trying to truncate their slides. I mean, it, it's an amazing um, story um, that the team wants to be able to tell you. And uh, we're very proud of all of them. So with that, yeah, I'm awesome. gonna turn it over to Kathy Leader to help us walk through the financial summary and the action that um, we need to take today. Thank you, Diane. So um, you have here before you on the screen, the um, full budget, total resources, total requirements. And I can't see the total there because it's covered up by visuals. But if you go to the next slide, there is a motion related to this particular budget, if, if approved. So I will send that back to Tony Weller to uh, see if we have a motion on the floor. Well, considering I'm reading this screen off of my laptop, I appreciate the big print version, by the way. <laughs> uh, I guess we're open for a motion. And uh, thankfully, Kathy, is, in years past, has presented it and already written out for us. So if there's somebody that would either have a question or would like to move a motion forward, you can unmute. Hopefully, they can unmute themselves. I'd like to forward a motion that we approve the budget as, uh, as presented. I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, and Andy, thank you for the second, Andy. Um, is there any other discussion? Uh, all those in favor of forwarding that motion? Oh, what? I was going to say. Uh, Did I miss something? The, the, the motion should also include uh, recommending it for adoption by the Board of Directors, shouldn't it? it it's on there at the very bottom. Is that, is uh, why don't I read it? Why don't I read it out? So the motion to approve the proposed FY 2021 to 22 budget and the amount of $610,543,922 as presented in the FY 2021 to 22 proposed budget document and recommended it for adoption by the board of directors. Correct. Um, that is the motion that's been moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion? All right, all those in favor, I guess if you can wave hi or say, hi. say, say hi. yes, that would be great. Thank you. All right. That's perfect. Thank you. Uh, any opposed? That's great. I guess motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Was, Mark and I were kind of texting back and forth about squeezing a break in and that while we're close, we can just push to the end. And we, it got a little longer, but we're, we made it. So thank you for all of your um, effort to hang in there. And it was good to see everybody. Um, I do want to just say in general, I'm always impressed 
at the end of this of just the level of talent and dedication, uh, the staff and the team. Um, some of you may not get to enjoy the same thing. It sounds like Lori and I do at times that we get to work with staff directly. Um, but I, I've made a list. There's probably eight to 10 people I get to work with in the real world. And um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate their uh, willingness to listen and to work and today to listen to this, some of the sheer brilliance and ideas and uh, the innovation that goes on is, is really, uh, it's wonderful to be a part of it, even if it's in a, in a small part like this to support you all. I really appreciate what you do. And I, I know that's mutual to the rest of us that are on the CWAC. So. Yeah, I, I, I second that's... that. And Tony, thank you for uh, stepping up to chair. I'd like to thank Tony as well. And I think that uh, we should uh, really consider uh, a proposal for a name change to Clean Water Innovative Innovation. Services. <laughs> that was a great <laughs> idea. Nicely done, staff. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, everybody, and have a good weekend. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.